So last weekend, I went camping at Brownwood State Park in Texas. I had to shower that night, so I made my way to the camp showers. They were incredibly loud, but it wasn't a big deal. I showered like normal and had the shower off to dry off and leave. I heard a loud knocking on the door suddenly. It was perfectly rhythmic. One knock, two second pause. One knock, two second pause. For about ten knocks. I finally shouted, Occupied. It stopped for a beat, and then continued. I shouted, I'll be out soon. Assuming it was my boyfriend, I just let it go. A few knocks later, it finally stopped. Then I heard my boyfriend come to the door, knock softly, and ask, Sweetie, you almost done? I had immediately assumed that it was my boyfriend messing with me, but I noticed later I never heard whatever was knocking come or go, and I could hear my boyfriend walk up to the door from a distance. I had been accusing him of messing with me, but he's very no-nonsense and seemed as scared as I was. He had a flashlight and said that he didn't see anybody leaving. At the time the knocking stopped, there was about a 45 second gap from the knocking stopping and him walking up. It was really weird. I didn't shower at night after that, but I'm really glad I didn't open the door to whatever was knocking. Anyone had something weird happen like this while camping? My wife and I were camping last night in Blue River Reservoir in Oregon. We camp here often and decided to explore up FSR 520. FSR means Forest Service Road for those who don't know. We found a cool abandoned bridge far back in the woods over Cook Creek. The spot was beautiful and we were set up over the river on this long abandoned bridge over the creek. If you've ever been into the Oregon woods, you know that they can give off a creepy vibe, and this was no exception, but it really was a dream campsite. Being 40 feet directly over a river while on a bridge with limbs growing everywhere all over it isn't your everyday spot. I'll throw in for background that there was nobody within at least three miles of us. We had to hike in a little from our car, approximately a tenth of a mile. We explored around the area for quite a while and didn't come across anything out of the ordinary besides a pair of shoes and a name, Mona, written in ash on a rock of the fire ring. While we were sitting by the fire, I noticed a very bright flash of light over the river and I snapped my head up, but didn't see anything. A few moments later, I was paying closer attention and I watched a ball of light float, even with the bridge 40 feet in the air, from one side to the other in the woods, over 50 feet. The light was very blue. My thought the first time had been that somehow headlights had come through, but I would have heard a car, and no man-made light could get to us in this isolated area. This blue light was unlike anything I've ever seen. I mentioned it to my wife, but I didn't want to freak her out, so I dropped the subject soon after. Later that night, in the tent, we had the mesh lining up where we could see outside. My wife gasped and watched as the same blue light floated at the end of the bridge 30 feet away and hovered in the air. After a good bit of time, it shot into the woods. It being late at night, we were obviously scared of somebody's headlamp, but it shot away 40 times as fast as any human could go, and there was nothing attached to it. Our dog left the tent and stared at the spot for the next 10 minutes while peeking down the side of the bridge very seriously. Has anybody else had a similar experience on Forest Service Road 520 in Blue River Reservoir in Oregon? Or maybe in the Pacific Northwest at all? I'd be very curious to know. This story happened in my childhood, when I was about 12 years old. 
I thought about it ever since, and I still don't know what it actually was, or what I should think of it. It's not the most spectacular story, but it was creepy to me. I grew up in an apartment that was pretty much outside the city and close to a forest, so we had a lot of green around where we were, always playing in it and sometimes going camping outside with friends in the summer. So one night a couple of friends and I decided to build up my tent and sleep outside. We were always staying up for a really long time and telling each other ghost stories. While we did this, we suddenly heard noises from outside the tent. We all held our breath. Then we could hear steps. They came closer and closer. And then the steps even went around our tent. And then they stopped. We got really scared and we started saying things like, Whoever you are, go away, or we'll call the police. It seemed to work because the steps continued and headed away from our tent. After a minute or so, we then tried to be brave and went outside the tent to see who had come. But the only thing we could see was a woman in a really long dress, walking away in the dark. I still don't know who or what that was, but she had no business being out there still gives me chills to this day. My parents forced me into a church camping trip. I wasn't from any church, and I didn't really want to be friends with the people there. My female cousin went too, so we had nice conversations. The place was okay, but around it was a lake and a bridge to the forest on the other side of the lake. There was this weird air in the areas around the camping place that we were. I remember exploring it, and there was a very bad energy there. Ripped clothes, campfires that looked old, black trash bags hanged into trees all that in the forest around the camping area as well. I suppose it was kind of normal, but it just gave off a bad vibe. On one of the last nights there, they finally lighted a campfire for people to come around. My cousin and I were talking for a moment, and then we remained quiet for five minutes or so. I looked far away into the forest, to that little lake that was splitting off from there. I suddenly saw a man running around the lake in the forest area. He was wearing big, white, Jesus kind of clothes and no shoes. He ran fast, and while I watched him, I felt this really bad energy. I looked at my cousin, and then she looked at me. We were both pretty spooked. I asked her if she saw something there, and she described exactly what I saw. We got this really creepy feeling from it but nobody from the church would believe us. Even today, I remember clearly that the man, if that's what he was, looked tall, white robes, very pale, running on completely bare feet, giving off this really bad vibe. He looked human, but it was almost like he wasn't. I know it's not as much of an impressive story as others, but it was one of the realest things I've ever experienced. And I really don't think that guy was a human. The man disappeared within seconds after me spotting him and looking away, and we never saw him again after that. There was nowhere for him to go. I still can't explain it. This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. I always liked camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness, and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail I was going to take, packed my camping gear and my rifle for protection, and jumped in my truck. I get to this trail early in the morning and hike about 15 to 20 miles in until I find the right spot, and I head off the trail to find a place to put my tent up. I stumble upon this nice-sized clearing and decide that it's a nice, beautiful spot to settle down. I'm exhausted at this point, 
but I set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line, and I managed to get a fire going. I roast some hot dogs, and I start to hear a sound in the distance underneath all the forest noise. It sounded like an animal, most likely a deer, with a lame leg, as it sounded like the animal was making a walking and dragging noise. I felt bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away, and it was getting dark, so I couldn't really go find it to put it out of its misery. Thinking nothing of it, I go to bed after eating my food, douse the fire, and crawl into my tent and insert myself into my sleeping bag. I decided that even at my exhausted and relaxed state, I couldn't quite go to sleep. So I pulled out a book that I brought with me and started to read by the light of my lamp. Hours go by, and I hear that sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down, and I listen to this animal walk drag across the clearing toward my tent. It's really loud at this point, and it now sounds like the hooves are all being heavily planted with the dragging noise following seconds after. It's almost like the deer is dragging something along. It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing, and stops. I hear nothing. No breathing, I mean not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and look into the clearing. Nothing but trees and darkness. What the hell? Unnerved at this point, I zip the tent back up and sit there listening for other noises. Nothing. Just the crickets and the breeze. I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods, and I try not to let it bother me. Besides, I had my rifle. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right, and then women's laughter and stick snapping far off to my left. I'm up now, wondering if what I'm hearing is real, or just a product of being half asleep. I hear more faint laughter from a couple other different directions. All different kinds of people, old men, old women, even children, and I confirm that yes, this is real. The noises are closing in, and I grab my rifle, preparing to fire off a warning shot in the air in case they came too close. Something about this laughter, how far in I was, the noise earlier and the time of night, told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge enough already, but then I noticed that the nightlife was dead quiet. Not even the wind was making any noise. I decided that enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line and saw nothing. I listened intensely to my surroundings. No laughing. The forest sounds had returned. Relaxing just a bit and figuring that I scared off whoever it was, I sat down in my exhausted state and I fell asleep. I woke up later in a cold sweat, racked with anxiety. It was still dark out. I immediately hear two people whispering not too far from my tent. Alert, I grab my rifle and listen to what they're saying. I can't make out much, but I hear something about being lost, so I shout, Hey, who's there? The voices fall silent. I shout again, Are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly a huge burst of flame, like a flamethrower, erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people just standing around. In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I got up and sprinted out of my tent, making a hard left back to where the trail was. I hiked until sunrise back to my truck, with my head over my shoulder the whole way. I never heard anybody follow me. I never saw anyone or anything the whole way. But I still couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me, like I left all my gear in the woods that night. So about three years ago, I went camping with my now ex-girlfriend, as she had always expressed an interest but had never been. 
The spot we went to is in the Huron National Forest, and it's my go-to trail and camp spot. It's hidden deep in the forest, and the access to the trails is close and easy for ATVs, etc. My family's been going to this spot for about six years, and my friends that introduced me to it have been going for about ten years or so. We went for a weekend trip, and I'm glad we didn't go for any longer. When we got there, everything was going well, except we did notice a group of people that were hanging out next to the campsite, but they were just stargazing and they ended up leaving. Around midnight is when the weird stuff started to happen. At first, it sounded like somebody was laughing at us, but the laugh never ended. It got very high-pitched and sounded as it kept going. After a while, we both got kind of scared and went into the tent to try to sleep. And that's when the laugh noise moved up higher and started to circle the campsite. After a while of that happening, it just suddenly stopped. Then it started up again at about 3 a.m. When it started again, the fire was going out, so I went to stoke the fire with my shotgun in my hand, and I turned on my flashlight to see if maybe I could see coyotes or something like that around the campsite. I didn't see anything or hear any movements. This went on until about 6 a.m., and then it stopped. That's when we were finally able to get some rest. After we woke up, we checked around the campsite, but we didn't see anything out of the ordinary, so we packed up. Once we were packed up and good to go, I went to start my vehicle, and it was completely dead. That really freaked me out, as I am always paranoid about leaving things plugged in that kill the battery, and I made sure that everything was closed properly and unplugged the night before. Yet somehow, the battery still died. I was able to get a jump from AAA somehow. That phone call was hard to explain, and the lady who took the call didn't believe me, but at the end we both laughed. After that happened, I told my friend who had shown me the campsite and also had a cabin in the same forest about 25 miles away. When I told him what happened, he got freaked out. He told me about two incidents, which he's had, one at the campsite and one at his cabin. At the campsite, he stated that one night after we'd all returned from trail riding and went to bed, he stayed up to hang out by the fire and have a few drinks. While he was hanging out, he was just looking off into the distance and saw a pair of eyes up in the tree looking directly at him. He described them as bioluminescent. He flashed his high-powered flashlight up at them, but there was nothing there. And as soon as the flashlight turned off, there they were looking right back at him. So he packed up and went right to bed. He didn't tell us because he didn't want to scare us. At the cabin, he was hanging out with his brother and they were both just chilling by the fire outside when they both saw a pair of eyes looking at them from a trail that leads into the woods. They stated that the height of the eyes that were looking at them meant that whatever it was had to be at least seven feet tall. They started shooting at it with their rifles and the eyes had disappeared, but once they were done shooting, the eyes reappeared, this time closer. At that point, they were both freaked out and went back to the cabin, and they didn't leave until daylight. We have no idea what this could have been, but we all feel very scared. We especially felt fear at the time that the events were happening. After we all talked about it, one of the brothers thinks it might have been a Wendigo. I don't really know what it could have been but I have never felt that scared before or since. So my mom and I were camping in our sort of local national park in the Alps. I had a headache and had had a rough night, but nothing special. My mom, who thought that I had slept really well, really did not. The next morning, she told me about the dreams she had had, and that they were really realistic and they kind of scared her. She thought she heard men talking outside of our tent in a foreign language, and thought that we were going to be in trouble, being that we were two women alone in the middle of nowhere. Then she saw a woman walk slowly just next to our tent while looking in at us kind of wearing a farm outfit. The next thing she saw was a whole lot of people dressed in white in the trenches just standing there. 
Back in the day, this national park was the site of a world war event. There are still remnants standing around. That particular night, I didn't see anything particular, and I had no idea my mom was having such bad dreams. We thought it was maybe sleep paralysis, but the more we talk about it, it feels more like an encounter than a simple episode of sleep paralysis. Maybe they were just dreams, but she said it was nothing like any dream she'd ever had, that it was so vivid that she was sure it was real. We're okay, we're just wondering about the weirdness of it all, and we're curious if anything similar has happened to you. So I didn't realize this before yesterday, but I might have had a paranormal experience. I realized it because I was reading a story, and it was about a hunter who heard the voice of his brother calling for help in the middle of the woods when his brother was miles away. As I scrolled down the comments, I became familiar with some cultural stories about creatures that can lure us to basically our death by mimicking others. Last year, we went camping with some friends. It was early September, but still hot enough to sleep outside. We made ourselves a lovely camping spot with a big bonfire and some candles around it. I have some psychic abilities and can feel if a spirit is near or something. Usually I can feel if it's female or masculine or a child. Sometimes I thought I could feel something, but I didn't want to think too much about it or make a big deal out of it. I didn't want to get scared and fall into paranoia in the middle of the woods. The evening went fine and we stayed up until about 1 to 2 a.m. before going to bed. I woke an hour or two later in a full mode panic attack. I have a history with anxiety, but I've never felt this level of nausea before. It was like everything that I experienced before when I had my moments of high anxiety, but multiplied many times. I was sleeping with my boyfriend in the tent and he asked me if I was okay. I told him that I was feeling very bad and probably having a panic attack. I assumed it was because we were laying on the ground and it wasn't very comfortable, and maybe that made me uneasy during my sleep. I sat up and started to do some breathing exercises to calm me down. It didn't really work, and I got out of the tent to throw up. After that, it kind of got better, and I was able to fall back asleep a little while later. The next morning, we all woke up and started packing up our stuff. I told the others about my story, and my boyfriend and one of his friends started talking about how they had heard footsteps around our camp during the night. I didn't think much of it since I didn't hear it, but according to my boyfriend, it happened just before I woke up, which is why he asked me if I was okay, because he was already up at the time, panicking. Anyway, fast forward to today. I never thought much about it, because I thought that this episode of panic was due to the fact that I had pushed my body a little too hard the day before. We went on this really long walk before camping. But now that I've read all these stories about creatures in the woods, and given that I have some abilities to sense these things, I wonder today if I woke up that night feeling an intense sense of danger. Tell me what you think, and if you've ever had those kind of experiences out in the woods. This was when I was around 14, so about 2002. My cousin and I went camping behind my grandparents' house, about a half mile into the woods in northeastern Texas. We were just in our small tent, watching a movie on a portable DVD player. It was probably one in the morning, when suddenly something, or things, started rapidly running around our tent. Whatever it was kept pushing in at the top of the tent with their hands, and then running circles around the tent. It wasn't like they were trying to damage the tent, but like they were trying to scare us. We tried to rationalize what this could have been. It lasted about one or two minutes. We didn't hear any animal noises, 
but we did hear footsteps going around the tent. The height of the tent and the hands just made it seem like it was little kids doing it. We were scared shitless and made no noise the rest of the night. We went back home after sunrise. No children should have been out there. It wouldn't have been any of the family members. And it would just be a really odd thing to do if it was just random people. It's not really a place that people camp at either. If anyone can offer any thoughts on what this might be, I would really appreciate it. It's been a heavy weight on us, and we've racked our brains to figure out what it could have been ever since. I was nine years old and camping out with three families other than my own. I was sleeping in a small tent with one of my close friends when something woke me up. I listened and heard nothing from outside at first, so I opened the tent zipper enough to see the fire was out, so I knew the adults must be asleep. I closed the zipper and I laid back down. Shortly after I laid down, I heard a high-pitched voice from outside the tent. It kept saying, come out, come out and play with me. I would have thought that it was a person, but it was repeating itself over and over again and moving closer to the tent and then farther away, all the time circling. I opened the tent and looked out, but it was pitch black. At this point, I tried to wake the friend I was in the tent with, but he pushed me off. I tried again more violently this time and he woke up. I told him that I heard something outside, but he must not have been fully awake because he just mumbled something and laid back down. After I talked to my friend, I tried to go to sleep, but the voice kept me up, always beckoning me to come out and play, always circling the tent. I don't know when exactly, or how, but somehow, I drifted off to sleep. The next morning I told my friend who had been in the tent about it, and he said that he remembered being annoyed that I woke him up. So to me, that means that I wasn't dreaming. I'm certain that I was fully awake, so I doubt that I just hallucinated it. I know this didn't lead anywhere satisfactory, and I don't have any answers, but this is my true story about something that I can only assume is paranormal. I had an interesting experience while camping with my husband. It was a nice drive in a campsite, a corner spot next to one other campsite and woods on the other three sides. We had a nice day hiking and cooked some fajitas and s'mores over the fire, and then we settled into our tent to sleep. Later that night, I woke up and heard a weird noise. It sounded like an electronic tone, kind of like a sine wave. Then I heard what sounded like people talking right outside the tent. They better get out of that tent. I saw a possum go in there. Thinking that there must be other campers walking around, I turned over and tried to go back to sleep. A couple of minutes later, I heard the strange tone again, and then what sounded like a cat meowing and walking around the tent. It sounded like my cat when he wants to be let in the house but I'm not about to let strange animals into my tent, so I just lay there and it stopped after about a minute. A couple of minutes later, I heard the tone again. Then I heard a lower, gravelly voice talking outside the tent. They better get out of there before I get them. All of this happened over the course of maybe 10 minutes. I didn't react as strongly as I probably should have, but I was tired and thought at first that it might be some kind of dream. My husband got up and left the tent to use the bathroom a little while later. He hadn't heard anything, and I didn't hear anything else after that. The next morning, while eating breakfast, I could hear the neighboring campers talking. One of their children, who was about five to seven years old, was upset with his brother because they'd heard somebody telling them to get out of the camper last night. His brother was denying that he had heard anything. I'm not sure exactly what happened that night, 
but it was very interesting to say the least. When I was about six years old, I woke up during the night and made eye contact with a strange humanoid creature. It was looking at me through my bedroom window. My room was ground level and my bed was facing the window. Strangely, I remember choosing to leave my curtains open that night for the first time ever. So whatever this thing was, was in full view. When I initially saw it, I was completely dumbfounded and couldn't believe my eyes. I shook my head no, as I was thinking that this couldn't really be happening. I pinched myself to make sure that I wasn't dreaming. Then the creature frowned. I nodded my head yes, and the creature smiled. Again I shook my head no, and it frowned. So I nodded, and once again it smiled. I may have repeated this a few more times. Whatever it was seemed to be almost greenish in color and had a roundish face. Kind of like Yoda. I can't remember all of the details, but I distinctly remember telling myself that this was really happening and not to allow myself to chalk it up later to being a dream. I kept telling myself over and over, this was real. This was not a dream. This was real. I still have no idea what that thing was. So I moved into my grandparents' house around five months ago but I spent a lot of my childhood there as well. I smoke, so I find myself alone out on my back deck a lot at the evening and nighttime. The deck faces the garden portion of my backyard. To my left is the alley between our neighbor's fence, and to my right is a cemented area, including my garage and the rest of my house. And at night, even with a bright porch light, my backyard is dark dark to the point that you can't see a foot past the deck. We have three sets of small motion lights that are continuously set off throughout the night, as well as a camera facing the backyard that will send motion notifications. And when watching the footage, there's only ever bushes and trees moving. Those really shouldn't set off the detector. I've heard noises every single time I go out there at night. At first, as any person would do, I passed them off as animals. The noises included thumps and scratching on the rain guard above the deck, footstep-like sounds on the concrete, and gravel being scattered, which is visible from my deck, and I've seen gravel tossed around with no possible cause around the area, branches crack above and in front of me, and trees and bushes are rustled. I've seen a humanoid figure twice in the farthest part of my garden. Both times I instantly went inside the house. I constantly feel like I'm being watched. Depending on what I'm hearing, I've felt worse, and I absolutely hate going outside at night here by myself. Just tonight I heard something that I haven't heard before, and the only thing I can compare it to is the screeching noise that squirrels can make, but mixed with an inhuman yell. I freaked the hell out and went right inside. I know a lot about cryptids, specifically wendigos and skinwalkers, and I really can't imagine that being what this is. But I'm a very logical person, and I can't find any proof of it being any type of animal. So who knows? I just talked to my buddy tonight on the phone for a few minutes. While we were talking, I asked him where he was. He said he was in the desert of Arizona at that exact moment. 
Just for the heck of it, I asked him if he had seen any weird UFOs out on those open highways driving at night. And this was his reply. No, I haven't seen anything like that. But about three months ago, I was out here driving and it was late at night. I was in the desert. I noticed something on the side of the road. At first, I thought it was somebody wearing a raincoat. It was about five feet tall, shaped like a human, and was black. As I got closer to it, it spread out wings, and then went straight up into the air. It didn't flap its wings, or anything like that, it just went straight up and out of sight, very quickly. I was like, wow, no kidding. He said he thought about it, and then told me maybe it was a condor. But I was like, no man, those kinds of birds have to get a running start, and it takes them a few feet to even get off the ground. It's too bad he didn't get a better look at what he was actually seeing before it took off. As we were talking, his signal started to go in and out, so I let him go. I'm going to try to talk to him this weekend when he's back home, and see what else he's experienced. But, yeah, apparently he saw a humanoid. He's a trucker, so he gets to go all over, and I'm sure he's seen some other things as well. I can't wait to find out the rest of his story. A little background. My two closest friends and I were always trying to get creative with the games that we would play. One night when we were in the ninth grade, we were having a sleepover at T's house. T had a lot of toy weapons still in the garage that he never threw out. So in this game of hide and seek, the seeker used the lightsabers and nerf guns to tag the hiding players. We played outside at night in December which made it spooky and hard to find each other. So once a player was found, they too would become a seeker. After a few rounds, it was my turn to be seeker. I first found Jay, so we quietly started searching for T. In T's neighborhood, all of the houses are really tight and dark. So we would usually hide in between people's houses. As Jay and I were walking down the street, I thought I heard shuffling in the rocks behind an AC unit. Of course, we thought it was T, so we started telling him, All right, come on out, you've been found. But nobody answered. Seconds after, a white, hairless head with dark eyes popped up and looked at us and then ducked back down. It was obviously not T, and like the kids we were, we ran off yelling T's name to come back to the house. He ended up being on the other side of the neighborhood, and when we went back to investigate, we found nothing. Jay and I still remember, and T makes fun of us because he thought we were joking, but we know we saw the exact same thing. I have no clue what it could have been, but it definitely looked like a person, and not a person at the same time. I'm an adult now, but it still gives me chills. This story happened to my cousin, who was visiting our grandmother on the Navajo Nation Reservation. He was what you would call an urban Navajo, born and raised in Phoenix and rarely visited the res. He was raised in the church and was aware of certain Navajo taboos and folklore, but didn't heed or abide by any. He and his older brother used to stay at our grandmother's during the summer to help out with chores and the livestock. They call it sheep camp. However, sheep camp was a summer lodge or cabin in the mountains where you took the sheep during the summer months to graze. Being from the city, I guess they just liked the term sheep camp when in reality, it was just our grandmother's permanent residence. Like most rural residents on the reservation, old automobiles and appliances that no longer worked piled up in the front yard due to a lack of transportation or waste management options. There was an obsolete refrigerator from the 80s on the far left side of my grandma's porch and a broken down muscle car from decades earlier. 
The car was more of a skeleton, a forgotten remnant, that rested about 30 feet far off to the left in perfect eyeline sight from the porch. The model of the car I cannot remember, but the windows had all been busted out, and the upholstery was weathered and cracked. The desert sand had reclaimed most of it. The tires were shredded and half buried. If you grew up on the res, this served as a derelict jungle gym or playground. My mother and I had decided to visit my grandma one afternoon when I was 12 years old, the same age as my cousin. We greeted everyone upon our arrival and our grandma fed us. My cousin asked if I wanted to take a walk to the canyon and told me that he had something to tell me. He seemed urgent about it. As soon as we were out of earshot of any of the adults or his older brother, he told me that something had happened earlier that day at about 5.30 in the morning. Although it was summer, in the Arizona temperate desert, it is easily many degrees colder at night and early in the mornings. He told me that he was awoken by the urge to relieve himself. The sky was dark blue before dawn. He was half asleep and it was too cold to run all the way to the outhouse. There was no indoor plumbing. So he continued to say that he darted to the left to pee behind the old refrigerator and off the porch. His eyes were half closed and his mind was still a bit hazy from just waking up. Then he hears the distinct sound of something jagged and sharp scratching in long successions on metal accompanied by the heightened whimpering of a sheepdog. His eyes opened wide and he tried to scan the horizon to locate the origins of the hurt sheepdog. Initially he thought he saw the dog trapped in the car, but there were no windows or any glass obstructing the dog's escape from the wreckage. He witnessed the dog clawing and scratching to fight its way out of the window frame of the driver's side. Its front paws were clawing at the outer shell of the driver's door, making the sound of nails on a chalkboard. He finished urinating and dazedly took one step off the porch to help the dog out of the car. Suddenly, he freezes in his tracks. A cold, wicked laugh ripped through the early dawn air. His eyes immediately fixate on where the laugh originated from, also inside the car. He rubs his eyes and focuses his gaze on the dog, and his eyes follow along the dog's torso. Then he sees that something has its arms and claws wrapped around the waist of the dog, preventing it from escaping. At this point, the sun had inched and crept over the mesa and turned the sky from a pale blue to a pale yellow. The pale yellow light revealed that the driver's side of the car was completely covered in smeared blood. He jolts back inside and bolts the door behind him. He doesn't tell anybody because he was paralyzed with fear. Fear that if he talked about it, nothing would stop it from busting through the door and killing him, his brother, and our grandma. I inquired about what it looked like or if he even saw what had been holding the dog against its will. He said it looked like a werewolf, but a sickly one with mange. He noted that it was hairy, but you could see almost dry, cracked, gray skin underneath. He said before he ran, he slouched down to see what was holding the dog inside the car, and whatever it was, grinned. Its wicked smile was filled with sharp, jagged teeth beaming from side to side. In all honesty, I thought he was lying to me to try to scare me, thinking I was some dumb, uncivilized reser who would believe a werewolf tale. We spent some time in the canyon playing on boulders and throwing rocks into the small stream. I had all forgotten what he shared with me until we made it back to my grandma's house. That's when he asked if I wanted to see the scene of the crime, so to speak. I was skeptical at the time until we walked up to the car in question. I couldn't believe it. There were tufts of bloody multicolored dog fur caught in the window frame and bloody paw prints and smears on the outside of the driver's door. There were long scratch marks from the dog everywhere, not sharp enough to cut through the metal, but enough to make a slight indent. As if the nails were scratching down with so much pressure that the protein from the nails, or whatever they're made of, buckled and gave way, filed down on the metal. 
I stood there in amazement and fear. All we did was throw dirt on the blood markings, and I haven't spoken of it until right now. Side note, the dog is okay. We spent all late afternoon looking for her. We later found her under an abandoned manufactured home on the property. She was afraid to come out for nearly two weeks, so my cousin said he always brought her food and water for the remainder of summer break. She's okay now, though, fortunately. Somewhere around 2013 or 2014, I was leading my sister, who was then about 15 or 16, to a forest that I would sometimes go to with a friend. The way it was set up is there was this giant ditch or valley that had a bunch of water in the bottom. So if you fell, you could easily get injured or drown from the size of it. The ditch went in a straight line in front of the forest and there was this little concrete dam type thing that you could walk on to get across to the forest. It's nighttime, and I've never been there at night. My sister wanted a place to smoke cigarettes, so we walked there with one of her other friends who was like 17 or 18. As we got up to the dam, we all see this five to seven foot tall person type thing. And as soon as it sees us, it starts jumping towards us, about four feet in the air. Its movement was a little clumsy, if I can remember right. When it started jumping, we all ran as quickly as we could and went back home. It was shaped like a human, but its legs looked like a goat. It almost looked like it was wearing a light gray jacket, but maybe it was fur. There was very little light, so it was hard to see well. We never told anybody about it because we were all underage told our parents that we were going to church, didn't tell them we were going to wander around, so we didn't want to get in trouble. I don't think there was some Olympic jumper out there doing weird stuff in the forest either. The forest has signs all around it saying to stay out, so I don't think people would really do that. One time after my sister turned 18, I texted her about it. She said that she remembers the thing being all black, so either one of us might be right. I'm not really sure what we saw. I know that there have been Goatman sightings out in that area for decades, so maybe that was it. If you have any ideas, let me know. I'm an outdoorsman. I'm very experienced in hunting, camping, hiking, and general survival. I'm very familiar with and used to wildlife, and I was charged by what I believe was a cryptid called a dogman. It charged both my cousin and I. It was not a bear. A bear cannot move how this thing did. And it wasn't a normal wolf, as they can't comfortably run on two legs whereas what charged us seemed natural at doing that. This happened around June or July of 2007. I was around 17 years old, and a lot more cocky then, but I still was somewhat knowledgeable of the outdoors. My family used to own a cabin in northwest Wisconsin. I basically grew up there in the summer. I knew the woods well, but at night it was wise to stay in the cabin, or at least by the bonfire at the beach because of bears, wolves, and cougars. One of the creepiest things was if you were having a bonfire, the tree line was visible from the fire pit and the beach, and at night, you always felt like you were being watched from that tree line. But during the day, the woods always seemed normal, not so creepy at all. That is, until this incident. So this happened somewhere between noon and four o'clock. My cousin and I were having an airsoft battle. I was in full woodland camo. He was not. I retreated onto the ATV trail into the woods for a tactical advantage, and our battle took us about 200 meters in to about a third of the way up the trail. 
We had enough at this point, and were standing at the edge of a clearing on the trail, just talking. And he was maybe ten feet from me, when I decided to mess with him. I shushed him and said, We're being watched. He froze. But then I realized that the woods were dead quiet, and I got spooked. At that point, it wasn't so much of a joke. I started to scan the tree line and the other edge of the clearing from left to right when I saw it. Its teeth gave it away. It was panting and staring at my cousin. I don't expect you to believe me, but what I saw was a wolf-type creature as big as a black bear, at least 300 pounds, but it wasn't normal. This wolf was on two legs, crouching next to a tree with its arm grasping the tree, grasping with a clawed hand. It had reddish-brown fur. I told my cousin, we have to go, and the next thing I know, he's sprinting. I looked back at Wolfie, who had locked on and sprinted a few steps on two feet. Then I turned and ran as fast as I could. Right before I turned, it looked like Wolfie was dropping onto all fours. It charged us, and it sounded like it was right on our asses as we barreled through the brush. But for whatever reason, it let us go when we broke out of the tree line and headed for the cabin. What stuck with me the most was the sheer size of this thing. Wolfie appeared to be about seven feet tall when upright, and that where it should have had front paws, it appeared to have large, clawed hands. Now I'm not sure how to explain this away rationally. I've heard wolves will occasionally kind of walk upright, but as far as I know, they only go a couple of steps, and they certainly can't sprint on two legs. Nor do wolves get that big, and black bears sort of waddle on two legs so it couldn't have been either of those creatures. The closest description, as silly as it sounds, is a werewolf or a dogman. I live in the upper panhandle area of Oklahoma, and I've seen a lot of weird stuff in my day, some of which other family members can attest to. One such weird thing would be a shadow creature that I see whenever I'm with my uncle in the countryside. Oklahoma once housed Native American Indian tribes, and the remnants of these still remain. One of their legends tells about a shadow creature who will suck your soul from your body if you don't leave your shoes by the trees while camping. Personally, I've never been camping, so I wouldn't really know about that. But I have seen shadowy figures, and heard unexplained rustling and scurrying, and sometimes noises around me stop when I see these entities. I'm wondering if anybody else knows anything about this, whether this is exclusive to Oklahoma, or if anyone else has had these experiences in other areas. I don't really know what these figures or beings could be, but I do believe that sacred Indian ground has some pull when it comes to supernatural beings and occurrences, although I don't know where specifically the sacred ground would be. The other night, my mom and brother were outside taking the dog out. It was around 12.20 in the morning. She said that she saw something in the neighbor's yard, which is behind ours, walking in the yard. It was black and had a face like a gorilla, but slim. And it didn't look as big as the pictures of Bigfoot that supposedly people caught on camera. It was around six foot four to seven feet tall and walking very weirdly like it wasn't familiar with this area, or maybe even the planet. It was walking very sneaky-like, barely lifting its feet when it walked, kind of stretchy-like, and just looking forward. It didn't turn its head at all. She also said that she felt a very eerie feeling and that she's glad she trusted her intuition, because she doesn't know what this thing would have done to her. Also, 
Way before that, she was taking a walk around the block, which is close to the woods, and she heard weird grunting sounds that didn't sound like any animal in our area. So I don't know what this could be. I wish I had more of an explanation or a description, but have any of you ever seen anything like this? I'm just going off the explanation from my mom, but she's pretty sure that she spotted Bigfoot. This happened to myself, my little brother, and my cousin when I was about 14 years old. It was just around dusk. We all lived in Tampico, Tamaulipas, Mexico. We decided to go play basketball at the outside courts. It was still daylight when we first got there, and we usually start heading home at about dusk or when the court lights come on. It was only a few blocks away from our grandma's house. When the lights come on, that's usually when the bigger kids get to the court to play. But this time we were fortunate enough to have the whole court to ourselves. We were shooting hoops like normal, nothing out of the ordinary, and the lights came on. But since we had the place to ourselves and we were having so much fun, we kept playing. The game was 21, so two of us would stand to the side of the hoop, depending on which direction the ball would go, so that it wouldn't roll into the street. And on one of these shots that my cousin made, the ball just missed the hoop and bounced behind it. I managed to grab it before leaving the court when I saw a strange creature. It was like a little person, no bigger than two feet. It had the face of a very old man with a fairly large nose, old ragged clothes that looked like they were handmade, and a hat that, I swear, looks like something a garden gnome would wear. You know, it was one of those pointy hats, but it wasn't straight up, it sort of hang down to the side. It was crouched down, almost like it was in hiding, and when I got too close to it, that's when it stood up, looked at me, and then ran away from me. Believe me, my first thought was not to chase it. I was scared stiff, but my cousin and little brother saw it too, and they ran. When it ran, it was headed for the other side of the court. I couldn't believe the speed of this thing. I mean, for it to be so small, it made it to the other side in mere seconds, almost a blink of an eye. It ran behind the post and was gone. I snapped out of it and I started to run home as well. And as I ran past that same post that this thing ran behind, I turned to look to see if it was there, but it was gone. When I got home, my little brother and cousin had already told the adults there what had happened. They didn't tell us we were crazy. In fact, they told us that these little creatures are called duendes. Apparently, there are different types of them too. So, I guess they're sort of a widely known creature where I live. I had never heard about them growing up, but that was my experience. You can believe me or not, but... I hope you enjoyed the story either way. I had a rather odd encounter with some humanoid creature, or even a spirit possibly, just a few nights ago. I haven't been able to come up with a rational answer as to just what I saw. It happened just a few nights ago. I was biking home from work. I work the closing shifts for my local Walgreens, so I get off work around 10.30. I live only a half hour away by bike from my job, but most of the way home is by a heavily forested trail, which doesn't have very many street lights. It's always pitch black when I'm on my way home. I'm about five minutes into this bike ride, and I hit the beginning of where the street lights end and the darkness begins. As I always do, I pulled out my phone and turned on the flashlight option so I could see. Only a few seconds after I turned it on, I tilted it up more and froze. I saw this tall, skinny, pale-looking figure for just a brief second, 
before it fell onto all fours and, just like the wind, was gone into the woods. Shortly after, I started to pedal as fast as I could, because I had no clue what I had seen, and I didn't want to be in the same woods as it was. That's when I heard a low screech. Whatever it was was keeping pace with me, hidden in the woods out of sight. I managed to get out of that area very quickly, and I didn't see or hear anything after I left that heavily wooded area. But a while later on, I caught scent of what literally smelled like fresh blueberry pancakes or waffles. It was like somebody was standing out in the field with a hot plate of just the pan of blueberry pancakes, which it didn't make any sense to me. There are no buildings or shops in the area where that scent came from. I figured that perhaps whatever it was I had seen was using the scent to try to draw me back into the woods. Now, I do know a few areas around that trail are supposedly haunted. There's a dinner theater that's not too far from it, and a supposedly haunted water tower in the area as well, and a few other places. But still, no matter what I can think of, I can't rationalize it or debunk it as something else. It couldn't have been a deer, because I've talked to people around the area, and no one has seen a deer in the area ever. Besides, it was standing on two feet when I first saw it, like a human. It couldn't have been any other wildlife, because the only wildlife I've ever spotted there are squirrels and birds. But I figured I would share my experience and see if anybody else has had something similar happen, or see if anybody knows what it is I saw. This happened when I was about seven years old, to my uncle. He's no longer with us, and I wanted to share his story. Growing up, I lived in northern Michigan on 5,000 acres of farm and ranch land that backed up into state land. Nothing but miles of forest and pasture could be seen. Needless to say, it made us pretty tough, and it takes a lot to spook us. We're all avid hunters, fishermen, and outdoorsmen. Being the only girl, I was raised as a tomboy, and I'm just the same. My uncle went off to join the military, becoming a senior NCO in a prominent Special Forces division of the U.S. Navy. He was 6'4", built like a wrestler, obviously skilled in survival tactics, and nothing rattled him. He was home on leave and went out hunting as it was deer season. I remember him coming in the house, shaking and crying, saying that he saw something in the woods. My uncle never cried. He was tough as nails and would tear someone to shreds before he let them make him cry. My grandmother tried to get him to make sense, but he kept saying that he saw Bigfoot mixed with the wolf. My granny immediately got my grandfather and he rounded up the rest of the guys. The hunting squad went out, which was my dad a few male cousins, my uncle who was still terrified but didn't want to be labeled a chicken, and a couple of other guys. They all got their shotguns and ammunition and saddled the horses to go clear the woods. Apparently, they were aware of the dogman, but I was blissfully young and ignorant. They told me to stay inside, and said that for absolutely no reason was I to step outside of our house until they returned. I had never heard my dad or grandfather so serious so I hid in my room. Sunset comes, and they still aren't back. I'm really worried at this point, because they've never stayed in the woods after dark. Shortly, I heard the sound of the horses running to the barn, and their voices. I was so relieved. They looked troubled when they came into the house, but didn't say anything, probably not to spook me. At dinner, my dad laid down the law that I was no longer allowed to play outside or go to the barns alone. I had to have my grandfather with me at all times. Of course, I was pretty upset by this and felt that my independence was being taken away, but I obeyed. The next morning, my dad and grandfather taught me how to shoot. That's when I knew it was serious. I overheard the adults talking the next night. Apparently, there were tracks where my uncle had his sighting bigger than any wolf could make, but definitely not dog tracks. As I said before, 
We're all avid outdoorsmen, and we can definitely identify tracks. My family has identified the tracks of just about every animal in that area, and some outside of it, but these couldn't be identified. About eight feet up in a tree were claw marks. No Michigan bear could make those. We also found claw marks of about the same height on multiple trees throughout the property. There were cattle mutilated and not in any way that a coyote or bear would, and it lasted the whole winter. We lost about 30 to 40 cattle that winter, all of them mutilated, all with the same wolf dog tracks in the snow. I really feel like this experience changed my uncle. Who knows, he did multiple tours in the Middle East for Desert Storm and Operation Iraqi Freedom before unfortunately finally taking his own life. After that experience though, he was never the same. He never touched alcohol before this, but after this I never saw him without a bottle of Jack in his hand, and his eyes were always haunted. He changed his personality, he never even went out in the woods again, he quit hunting and he eventually just quit coming home to visit on leave. He didn't even come home for my dad's funeral two years later. It was heartbreaking to see him deteriorate the way he did. I truly believe that he saw something out there, and while he might have gotten away that day, it ultimately killed him. I wanted to tell this story, but I never tell it to anyone else because I know they won't believe me, and I don't want to be labeled a liar or a crazy, but here we go. So about five, maybe six years ago, my friend and I snuck out of my house late one night. My house had a river behind it and a forest across the road in front. So we go out and walk around, smoking a cigar I stole from my dad. We walked around for about an hour. By then, it would have been around 3 a.m. As we got closer to my house, walking along the forest line, I turned to my friend and looked past him into the forest. About 10 feet past the tree line, I see this big human-shaped thing with either no neck or a very muscular neck and big shoulders. It was looking out at us. I froze and said to my friend, do you see that? He looks over and starts running as fast as he can. So I did too. When we got back to my house, we called it an alien because we didn't know what else to call it. It didn't look human, although it was human shaped, but we didn't know what it was. It wasn't until about three years later that I told my brother and dad about it and I described it to them. It was big, about eight feet tall and had a black body with a gold color head. So my brother googles what I saw, and apparently something called Old Yellowtop comes up, described as a type of Bigfoot with a dark body and yellow head. What makes it even crazier is that all the sightings seem to be in Ontario, Canada, which is where I live. I think the first sighting is from the early 1900s. My friend and I are both about 20 years old now, and to this day, we swear that's what we saw in the forest. Two years ago, I went to visit my grandparents' place for the first time in years. It's a small town and the house is located on a hill which extends to an open landscape. Anyway, it was night and everyone was either in the kitchen or bedroom watching TV. I had to go to the bathroom. They only have one bathroom and it's outside. So I make my way over taking my phone. I saw the neighbor's black dog that comes during the day to play with us and my grandparents' dog. Except it was weird for it to be outside at night. The whole property is surrounded by a concrete wall that has a tall, pointy metal fence on top of it. The only two gates accessible close or are locked at sunset. 
So there's no way that it could have entered, since my grandparents and my visiting family all made sure to put all the animals in their place before locking the gates. The gates are always closed unless a visitor comes or to let my grandparents' dog go play on the open land outside the property with the neighbor's dog. But there were no visitors that day, and it was too late for them to be out playing. So I start making my way to the bathroom, and the dog appears from behind the bathroom building. It was wagging its tail and making these excited, low panting noises. You know, how dogs make when they're happy to see their owners. I start walking toward it, and I see it gets all excited. It comes toward me, and I'm petting it. Nothing was out of the ordinary. I just remember thinking how nice it was that this dog comes to play with my grandparents' dog. Then suddenly, it starts walking away from me, back to behind the bathroom. So I go after it, thinking I'll call the neighbors and tell them that if they want to come pick up their dog, they can, or if they'll come pick it up in the morning, that's fine too. I just wanted them to know we had it. Their house is close to the bottom of the hill, which is about a 15 minute walk. And I wasn't about to walk alone in this town I don't know at that time of night. Halfway going after it, I get this weird feeling, and I stop. I see it standing there, just staring at me. And being my dumb self, I take a few steps toward it, extending my hand and calling out its name. But the dog starts backing away slowly, not letting go of eye contact. That sends a red flag immediately, because the way it stepped back was weird, and the way that it wouldn't look away from my eyes creeped me out. It stepped back so slowly and into the dark. I turned my phone flashlight on, and scanned the light around. I couldn't see it. It was gone, so fast. Too fast. I was going after it because apparently I have no common sense, but just as I started walking forward, I hear this weird bark, followed by one long howl. It wasn't exactly dog-like. I know because I've grown up with all kinds of dogs, and that's not how dogs sound. It sounded wrong. I thought maybe it was hurt, so I ended up calling my dad to come search for it. We scanned every inch of the property, but no dog. Both gates were locked. I got really creeped out after that, and I couldn't sleep very well. And I kept hearing that weird howl all night. We checked in with the neighbors the next morning, and apparently their dog was with them the whole time. I seriously don't like my grandparents' place at night. It's creepy as heck. The whole town is surrounded by creepy stories. Even my dad has had some weird encounters with these weird cloaked people and strange lights where there shouldn't be any. I have to go back this year and I'm kind of terrified. We're from a small town in southern Ohio, about an hour east of Cincinnati. This town has been plagued with people dying young, and some in pretty gruesome ways. Google Cheryl Fossil as an example. Many believe that this is caused by activity around the area, or that it's the cause of the activity. There's a section of woods that seems to have concentrated activity, though. The woods in question are surrounded by two churches, a hospital, and an area of housing. Now, as full disclosure, things don't happen every time we go in. But when things do happen, they happen off the charts. The most common things that we've experienced are what we've dubbed the geeks. We call these things geeks because they're tall, sometimes 12 feet from toe to crown, and gangly. They move awkwardly, although they move between trees swiftly. They never present themselves outwardly, only glimpses of them as they move between trees. The scariest thing about them, however, is the sound right before they start moving. It's almost like a deep groan. The second that I want to talk about is Hydra. Only one of us have ever seen this thing, and so far has been the only one witnessed. It's like a small primate creature, with the face of a hideous woman. 
the body of a chimpanzee, and long greasy black hair with boils on its back, blood red boils. The member of our group who had encountered this thing refused to tell us what Hydra spoke to him about. These are some of the things that we've encountered. We're working on a documentary about what's going on in this area and the town itself. I'll keep everybody who's interested updated, but I really hope that somebody else has had similar experiences. We would love to find out what's going on in the woods. After she had surgery for her kidney stones, my grandma became more sensitive about things. Exactly after the surgery, while she was still in the hospital, we both met in our dreams. She's seen me in her dream, and I've seen her in my similar dream on the same night. There's a lot to say about that too, but that's a story for another day. About a half a year later, she kept mentioning the little ugly people coming out of this particular flower pot in her apartment. According to her, they would come out during the nighttime or very early in the morning, just rising from the flower pot, walking a little bit around the room, and then going back into the flower pot and decreasing in size until the flower pot would swallow them. Bear in mind, this happened around 10 years ago. She told the entire family, and even though my mom and I are believers of the paranormal, we thought it might be age that was speaking in this case. Maybe she was hallucinating. Maybe it was sleep paralysis. But no, she kept insisting and insisting that she sees them every night. Then she kept giving us details. We suggested she might be dreaming and she would respond that she would get up and turn on the lights every time. They seemed to wake her up almost every night. On some nights, she would go to my grandpa in his bedroom. They were sleeping separately because they enjoyed the solitude and comfort. And she would wake him up and say, they're back. By the time my grandpa would come into her room, nothing was there. One night, she called my mom to say that they've woken her up again. She gave us a lot of details about these creatures. That they were small, but quite ugly. That's why she named them the Little Ugly People. They were maximum one meter in height. They were weirdly dressed. Later on, she described them better, and I came to the conclusion that the fashion style would be around the 1800s. They also had hats. They were both male and female, and it was only one of them coming out per night. Never more of them even though I do refer to them as plural. It seemed that they were struggling a bit to get out of the flower pot, and by implication, the flower, which was just a normal apartment plant. She tried to communicate with them every time, but with no success. They never hurt her, and they weren't doing anything to the objects in the room. They walked around the room, sometimes going to a different flower pot and disappearing there. There were times when she lost it and started screaming at them and telling them to leave her alone. One time she said she woke up and looked around and there was a tiny creature staring at her. Most of the time they were staring at her. Also, some of them had beards. We've searched for a very long time for any kind of reasonable explanation. Then we started to believe her and we searched for a paranormal one. I posted on a paranormal forum many, many years ago, and the answer I received was that they were gnomes visiting my grandma, and that she should not interact with them, as they might get aggressive and dangerous. They suggested putting rocks in a circle around the flower pot, and we did. I don't recall any other suggestion. This went on for more than a year. After about six months of quiet after we put the stones out, she started to forget things. Soon after, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, which she bravely battled for another two to three years. She's no longer with us, and I miss her, but sometimes I still meet her in my dreams. We started to think that maybe, since she ultimately was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, 
she was hallucinating. But that doesn't explain why after we put the stones out, it stopped happening. Unless it was power of suggestion. Whether it was something medical or paranormal, it was still a really bizarre thing. And I'll never forget it. Last summer, a good friend and I embarked on a backpacking trip through the White Mountain National Forest in New Hampshire. As fairly experienced day hikers, we felt comfortable in the Whites for our inaugural overnight trip. While planning, my buddy Ellis figured that we could hike to a backcountry campsite to make our first wilderness night a little more fun. I wasn't going to disagree. Beautiful views, historic trails, and a protected night in the dry river wilderness. I was stoked, to say the least. Before any hiking trip, I do a little internet research on the trails or shelters that I'll be coming across. Throughout the mid to late 1900s, there were a series of these lean-tos up and down the dry river wilderness, meant for backpackers or through-hikers looking to escape the crowds in more popular areas of the forest. As time went on and the Forest Service had other, more pressing matters, many of these shelters were dismantled. Except for Dry River Shelter Number 3, the last remaining shelter in this wilderness zone. On the morning of our hike, I met Ellis at the trailhead and we set off. The sky was overcast, bringing with it a dense fog throughout the forest. The weather left us with nearly no visibility, so there went our stunning views. At least the trail consisted of prime, technical New England rock scrambling along the river. Ellis and I made it up to the presidential ridge, stopping by the lakes of the clouds. The hut was filled with day hikers, backpackers, and through hikers, all socializing together. We were even rewarded with some sun and a brief glimpse of the Dry River Valley on the summit of Mount Monroe before the fog rolled back in. With dwindling views and a stiff wind, Ellis and I hustled below the tree line down to the dry river shelter number three, our home for the night. Once we dropped off the ridge into the valley, we entered the wilderness zone where rangers patrolled sparingly. Time to really be alone in the wild. As we trekked into the wilderness, all signs of civilization disappeared, and the trail was densely overgrown. Although it had been raining all week, there were no footprints in the mud, either. At least we would have some relaxing isolation, I figured. After about an hour or so of descending, Ellis spotted the lean-to, just as our legs were asking for relief. A gorgeous old timber structure with a well-used fire pit alongside a cold mountain river, pristine camping. As we settled in and explored the site, I found a small, bound notebook nestled into the corner of the structure. On the cover, somebody wrote, Dry River Shelter Number 3. Out of curiosity, I opened it, but I found nothing more than a lone man's name scribbled onto the first page and a date. Just your standard camping log. Oddly enough, the man signed the book the previous day. We saw no footprints or signs of humans or even animals no disturbance on the trails or here at the shelter. Rain can wash away tracks, but not all signs of animal life. Something felt off to me. I showed it to Ellis, who found it curious, but thought nothing more of the single name. He convinced me that the man was probably a hiking veteran and a professional at LNT. I bought into Ellis's thoughts on the situation to ease my mind. As the sun set, we started a roaring fire along the riverbank. Ellis commented how quiet the location was, having not seen another soul beyond the chirp of birds since leaving the Crawford Path. The silence was eerie, but we figured that city life had desensitized us to the wild. The sun was setting and we grew tired with the darkness. Ellis took the lean-to and I spent the night in my tent. Sleep came quickly after hiking over eight miles with 20 pounds on my back, but this did not last long. 
A brutally sharp slapping noise woke me. The only thing I could compare the noise to would be someone swinging a two by four into a tree or snapping a thick branch. I figured it was a bear searching for our food bag hanging in a tree some 20 to 50 yards away. Nothing out of the ordinary for New Hampshire. Sleep overtook me once again, and I remember waking up to the sun rising over the peaks. I stumbled out of my tent to see Ellis also waking up slowly. As we made our morning oats and coffee, I wandered around the site again to see if I could find the marks that the bear left. Instead, I noticed something odd. The small notebook was open. I swear that I put it back where I found it closed and in the back corner of the shelter, not open on the floor. Hey, Ellis, I said, were you checking out this camp log last night? Nah, I passed out, man. It's not like there's anything to read in there anyway, he responded. You sure? I commented as I bent over to pick it up. The lone hiker's name was not so lonely anymore. At least 20 more names filled the pages. The lone traveler, whose name was originally on the first page, could now be found several pages deep into the notebook. I tossed it to Ellis, whose face instantly dropped the second his mind registered what he was looking at. Great. Now I knew it wasn't just some dehydration delusion of the previous day. Dude, we must have been seeing things last night. There's no way we missed all these names. How could we? Ellis said. This is when I began to tell Ellis about the slapping noise during the night. I received nothing other than instant denial. These sounds were not the result of some hooligans or backwoods crazies harassing us. Ellis was convinced. Rather sternly, he commented, It's a bear, Jack. It's just a bear. Let's go now. And, well, go we did. Ellis led us out of the sight and on to our way home not 10 minutes later. A year has passed and I'm still not quite sure what happened during our stay at the Dry River Shelter number three. The memory of seeing a single name written on the front page of the notebook is so crisp in my mind, I couldn't have mistaken it. Could I have mistaken the noises I heard and the new additions to the book? Ellis feels the same way about the whole scenario. What do you think? Could we have just been too dehydrated and delusional? Or were we not welcomed by the New Hampshire wilderness? One of the more curious paranormal incidents in Georgia is the Georgia werewolf. Emily Isabella Burt. Apparently, Miss Burt was a resident of Talbot County, a rural county in southwest Georgia, between Macon and Columbus. The Burt family, a wealthy and prominent family in the Talbot County community, had several children. Of all of her children, it appears that Emily Isabella was the one with the most problems. For one, she had inherited a lot of physical traits from her father, including dark hair and bushy eyebrows. However, she was said to have had sharp, white canine teeth that made her smile quite disturbing. In one report, Roberts claims that Emily Isabella's mother took her to a local dentist to see if the teeth could be altered in any way, but he could do nothing for her. Soon afterward, she felt ill and suffered from restless nights. Emily is said to have strangely wandered the country during her restless nights. Legend has it that the beau of one of Emily Isabella's sisters, a William Gorman, reported to the Burts that something was killing his sheep. Fearful that this may soon be happening to her animals, Mrs. Mildred Burt became quite concerned. On ensuing visits, Gorman would recount stories about more sheep killings and that some of his cattle were killed as well. He was concerned about the killings and decided to take action. He reported that he was going to be putting together what amounted to a posse. Their intentions were to shoot and kill whatever beast was doing the damage. 
Emily Isabella was unusually interested in what was going on, and what events had transgressed in the hunt for this animal. On the night of the big hunt, Mildred Burt, who had also inherited more than a few guns and was a great markswoman, went out with her pistol. She apparently suspected that Emily Isabella was somehow involved with the killings, and she wanted to be prepared for anything. As she was near the area, an animal lunged for her, and she fired. It ran away. Interestingly enough, the next morning it was reported that Emily Isabella had a bullet hole in her left hand. After being taken to a local physician, her mother decided to send her to Paris to be treated by a doctor who specialized in lycanthropy, a disorder that makes its victims think that they're werewolves. While she was in Paris, the attacks at home stopped, and once she returned, supposedly cured, the attacks fell to a minimum. Emily died in 1911 and is buried in a small cemetery out in the wilderness of Georgia. To this day, a number of paranormal incidents are reported in that area, with the grave itself generally believed to be haunted by the ghost of the werewolf. People report a strange stillness or a sense of unease around the cemetery, and the grave itself is strangely well kept even though the cemetery is overgrown and forgotten. Others have reported that when small tokens, like a chip of stone, are taken from the cemetery, bad things happen to those people not long afterward. There are even some people who note that even just speaking poorly of Emily or her family causes the same problems to happen, as if the werewolf does not want anybody to speak ill of her. I wanted to tell you about a unique experience I had when I was between 8 and 10 years old in a country of Central America, in the capital province. This stuff mostly happened to me, but my siblings believed me, since they had experienced this kind of thing before as well. Not as bad as I did, but in this house I had a lot of bad experiences with the paranormal. Let's start off with a little bit of background. At first, for me, everything was my own imagination or something else that felt very real. Basically, I lived in a beautiful house, which was huge. Three floors, ten rooms, five bathrooms, a huge garage for three cars, beautiful view, amazing kitchen, wonderful living room, and a very secured house. We even had cute pets. I really did love the house, but at the same time, it was horrible staying in there. It was almost impossible for me to sleep. Every single night I would hear chairs scratching, something hitting the doors, steps, or very bizarre shadows. This, of course, happened mostly at night, but everything that I've told you isn't the worst of it. It happened when I was between 5 and 10 years old. Siblings would go out with my friends, and my mom would go to work and return at a very late hour. It was already maybe 8 p.m., and I was already feeling scared, since I knew all the stuff I told you before would happen again. Let's say I was right and wrong at the same time. I'll tell you why. I had all the doors and windows shut, I activated the electric fences, and I had access to the cameras so I could finally know if all this stuff was really happening or not. I would cover the window so light couldn't come inside my room. I locked my door. I also put a bell in the door's corner so I could hear if somebody was extremely close to me. I was already feeling sleepy and tired. I tried to feel as comfortable as I could, but then something happened. My cats were scratching my door several times and trying to enter. For me, this was a signal that something was going on, and I didn't notice. I let my cats enter and I silently closed the door. My cats were in a corner trying to hide. I was very concerned about how they were acting. I knew something very bad had to be happening downstairs. My room was on the second floor, and there were a lot of stairs for each floor. But the stairs that went to my mother's room were the largest of all in the house. 
31 in total. I tried to calm my cats by giving them a soft blanket and covering them so they could feel more safe. I went to my bed and checked the cameras on my tablet. Everything seemed normal until I heard the sound of steps on the stairs. That house didn't have a place where you could escape from something. The only way to get out of my room with the door locked was going through a window and jumping 10 to 12 meters to the ground, but you didn't really go anywhere. I covered myself with two huge blankets. I could barely breathe, and it was super warm, but then there was a noise that I will never forget. Something was running up the stairs. I was scared as hell, and I was so confused since I couldn't figure out what was in this house. I couldn't call anybody since the only phone I had for me to call someone was the house phone, and that was down on the first floor. And then the sound of the scratching chairs began again. I was feeling super insecure in my room. I literally had no escape, nor did I have anywhere to hide. My last and worst option was to go to my mom's room on the third floor so I could hide in her closet, which was very big. I then, carefully, without any kind of noise, started to slightly open the door to my room. I got outside and slowly walked to my mom's room. Then, as soon as I do, I hear something walking on the stairs, the first and second floor stairs. I ran as fast as I could. I didn't even care what it was anymore. My only priority was hiding in my mom's closet. As soon as I got in there, though, I remembered something. I had a pretty bad experience in my mom's room before, which happened when I was looking in the mirror of my mom's room. A huge mirror. I had seen something crawling behind me. I committed a huge mistake. My only option was getting below the bed. That's when I started to see shadows all over the room. It was freaking hell for me. I was out of options and ideas. The only thing I did was faint from terror, and I slept underneath my mom's bed. In the morning, I was on my mom's bed. She was so confused and scared as to what happened and why I was sleeping under her bed. I told her everything as detailed as I could. She was impressed. She told me that next time I go to sleep, she'll cover all the mirrors and use a special light for the night. That's about as much as I can remember, and although we have a lot of beautiful memories there, I was always afraid at night, and this is probably the scariest thing that ever happened to me. So this is one of the many stories that my mother has passed down to my siblings and I when we were very young. I'm going to say I was about 9 to 10 years old. They all took place in Central America, El Salvador to be precise. My grandma one day was supposed to meet up with a friend to go to another friend's wake. Back then, people would stay all night mourning at the wake with the deceased. My grandma was waiting for her friend where they had agreed to meet which happened to be near a little river or creek. She sees this woman from far away, all in white, and my grandma said that it looked just like her friend. Her name was Mary. So she starts following this woman, calling out Mary and thinking that it's her friend. She followed her by the river and kept calling out for her, but never got an answer. It starts getting really creepy when this woman is going toward the trees away and away from my grandmother. My grandmother started catching up, but as soon as she got close to her, she started to feel what she says was a weight on her shoulder. She felt like her shoulders were as big as her head, and she couldn't move anymore. She was close enough to see this woman's face, and that it was covered by a veil. She said that the veil was transparent enough that she could see the woman's face was a skull. My grandma somehow came out of her shock and ran as fast as she could in the other direction. She said she felt as if she was running slowly, like through water, and wasn't getting away fast enough. These stories always gave me the chills, but I've always been fascinated by them as well. She believes that it was La Llorona, or the weeping woman, because she was walking by the river. 
They passed it and headed towards some trees. Please let me know. Oh, never mind. A couple of years ago, I was on a volunteer mission in Central America, and I was housed with some other people. One of the people I was housed with had insomnia, so he got up throughout the night and would just walk around. One night I was sleeping, and all of a sudden it felt as if somebody had turned on the light in my room, but it was really intense lighting. It was almost like I could tell the light was on, even though my eyes were closed. I thought it was the dude who couldn't sleep, but he's never done anything intrusive like turning on the lights where I was sleeping. Later on, I talked with other people who stayed at the same house with the same experience. I didn't open my eyes because I felt like I shouldn't and I had gone back to sleep after that. Other people said that they saw a ball or an orb of light. I've read similar stories elsewhere as well. I have no idea what it could have been though. For those who grew up in Spanish households, you might have heard of the Mano Peluda. For those who have no idea, translated it basically means the hairy hand. Growing up, Spanish children are threatened to go to sleep, or la Mano Peluda will get them. Behave well, or la Mano Peluda will come. I am far too familiar with this threat. Now, as an adult, I understand that it's a joke, and it's meant to scare kids into behaving and sleeping. A few years ago, I was having a few drinks with my mom. I was 23 at the time, and she was about 49 or 50. We talked about my childhood and her methods of scaring me, and she told me about a creepy experience that she had with La Mano Peluda. I will provide it below from her perspective. She says, I was 10 years old at the time, living with my tia Donna. I would never fall asleep alone. I simply never could. Living in Central America at the time meant no lights at night, and if you needed to use the bathroom, it's located outside of the house. We were renting a home that was attached to a circle of homes. Think of an apartment complex. In the middle of these ten separate apartments, there was a patio in the center, and this was the only source of light at night. The light would shine into my bedroom window lightly. My tia would fall asleep with me every night, but every morning she would be gone, which was fine by me because I wouldn't notice it until morning anyway. This specific night went as usual. We laid down and went to sleep. I woke up just a few minutes later though, only to find that my tia was gone. I tossed in bed and tried to get comfortable when something caught my eye. Whatever it was seemed like it was floating in the corner of my room. I thought a bug or a beetle had come in, and then it came closer to me. A bird? Then I saw the fingers. Fingers like any man would have. A human hand. I blinked several times, hoping that I was dreaming or hallucinating. As it came closer, I noticed how hairy it was. It wasn't crawling on the ground. It was hovering, and it was a hand, only a hand from the wrist down. It began slowly to make its way to me. I knew I wasn't imagining this. I remember how it separated the light from the darkness in the room as it came to me. I never yelled so loud in my life. Tia! Tia! I yelled and threw the blanket over my head. I heard footsteps down the hall and my aunt threw the door open. Mija, ¿qué? she asked. La mano peluda, I pointed. I looked up, but the hand was gone. I cried and I told her what happened, but obviously she didn't believe me. She searched our home with a bat in her hand, assuming that an actual man might have broken in. She never found anything, though, but she did let me sleep with her in her room that night. She never believed that I saw it, but I will never forget what I saw.
I've asked my mother about this story at least five different times. I asked her if now that she's an adult, she thinks maybe she was so scared that she formed this imaginary image out of fear, because as a child she was always told to sleep or La Mano Peluda would come get her. She denies this and says that it was 100% real, and that she gets goosebumps every time we talk about it. I wonder if anyone else has ever had something like this happen, if it appears the same way to everyone, or if it modifies to match the victim's imagination. There's always been folklore around black crows and their cawing in my culture. My mother has always believed in it. I've always been in love with anything creepy, so I bought into black crows aesthetically but never believed that they served as an omen of death. That was until I was told this story later in my life. My mother is from Central America and was born and raised there, only moving to the United States around the year 2000. She's always been superstitious. She would tell me when I was a kid to be careful around crows. Try not to let one fly in my path or disturb one, because they symbolize death and they can predict if someone in your life is going to die. I was just a kid, so I never really believed any of that and I just promised to follow the rules to appease her. It was still hot and sunny out when I was beginning elementary school and my mother and father were at home painting our back deck as we had just moved into a new house. This is the first house we lived in since my mother moved from Central America to the States. All of my mother's family were thousands of miles away from her. She was always worried that something would happen to someone in her family while she was gone. My father was on all fours painting the deck, and my mother had come outside to give him a drink, when a black crow swooped down right over my father's head. My mother immediately began to panic and cry. Before my father had a chance to ask her what was wrong, the home phone rang. My mother picked up the phone crying and burst into Spanish asking if it was dad and what happened. Before she even knew who was on the other side of the call, she was asking these questions. And indeed, it was my mother's family calling to tell her that her dad had just passed. I came home that evening and my father explained that my grandfather had passed away, but he didn't tell me about the crow. When I was a little older, my mother had told me the story, and my father confirmed the order of events. That story is so weird to me, and ever since then, I too have been weary of crows and their presence in my life. My mother said that she just knew her father had passed in that moment. When the phone rang, she knew she was getting the call. I found it interesting that the crow flew so low over my father perhaps directly symbolizing that a father figure in somebody's life had passed. Where I lived around that time of year, a crow should have been nowhere in sight. There hadn't been any around all day, or for months even. All of it was just a little too strange, and it creeps me out to this day. So, like a lot of people say, I'm pretty skeptical about paranormal things. I also don't really have any religious beliefs. You could fairly accurately say that I'm a skeptical atheist, but I have one story for which I literally have no logical explanation. In my junior year of high school, my family hosted an exchange student from Brazil. I live in central Arkansas and I graduated in 98 for what it's worth. We're still good friends, and social media allows us to keep in touch. We still call each other sis, because for several months she lived across the hall from me, much like a sibling. We got along great, and we spent a lot of time together. To this day, I say that was probably one of the best experiences I've ever had. Her flight from Sao Paulo into Little Rock via Miami came roughly a week before school started. Since she was going to be living here for almost a year, she naturally had quite a bit of clothing and various other items, including pictures and other things to help her feel a little more in touch with her family back home. 
As I recall, she had one huge piece of luggage, about three feet tall or so, and like one or two carry-on bags. I helped her unpack because it was honestly a lot of stuff, and I also figured it would be a good time to just chat and get to know each other. It was quite a bit of stuff, mostly clothing, but we had everything put up and arranged in about a couple of hours. As she was arranging photos and her other mementos of family, she mentioned that she couldn't find a ring she'd packed that her grandmother had given her. We both went back through her bags again, figuring we'd probably just overlooked it. It was nowhere to be found, however, so she made a mental note to ask her mom if she could send it next time she called home, because she really wanted to have this ring with her in America. A couple of days later, we hopped into my car to head over to the school so we could get her registered for classes, get our ID cards made, set up our locker, and claim my marching and concert horns for band. After we had our school stuff taken care of, we grabbed some lunch and headed home to the comfort of air conditioning. And that's when something I just can't rationally explain happened. Now, at this time, my mom worked the day shift, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., at the Human Development Center in our town. It's basically a residential home, run by the Department of Human Services, for people who have profound developmental disabilities, which would be far too expensive for most people to adequately provide round-the-clock care for. My dad had pretty much always worked in new home construction, usually from dawn until dusk, pretty much every day. This meant that both of my parents had left for work a couple of hours at least before we headed out, and neither would be home for a few hours yet. Neither of them ever really came home for lunch, either, and my older sister lived in Little Rock, about 30 miles away, and she never dropped by unannounced. She also had a job, and would have been at work in Little Rock anyway. Nobody would have been in that house for the few hours that we were out. I had walked into my friend's room before we left for school that morning, so I had seen for myself what state the room was in. She was a neat person. Things were put away, organized, bed made. Nothing was out of place when we left, and we both left the room and the house at the same time. Neither of us had gone back for anything. When we got home, we both walked into her room at essentially the same time. When we opened the door to her room, there, laying in the very center of her pillow, was the ring that we had searched so thoroughly for just a couple of days prior. We both looked at each other like, am I really seeing this? Aside from a quick call the night she arrived, before unpacking and not finding the ring, she hadn't called home, meaning she hadn't even had the chance yet to ask her mom to mail it. Nobody was home while we were out, like I said. She'd only been here about half a week at that point, so it's unlikely that it would have had time to arrive, even if her mom had found it and shipped it. And it's incredibly unlikely that anyone would have opened a package for her. If by some reason my mom had found it, she almost certainly would have left it in the kitchen, and definitely would have written a short note to leave with the ring. I just can't picture my dad even knowing whose it was, much less going into her room and leaving it. She and I were the only people who even knew it was missing. I know that it wasn't there when we left. Neither of my parents said that they'd been home while we were out. I did ask. To the very best of my knowledge, the house was empty, and I know she hadn't been in that room at all, when I also wasn't in the room. There was no single point, no matter how brief, that she was in the room and I was not, outside of first thing that morning before I'd knocked and gone in before we left, and the ring was absolutely not on her pillow when I walked in. She was also highly puzzled upon returning to find it, so I doubt she just found it and was pretending not to know how it got there. To this day, I can't tell you how it got there. She believes her grandmother's spirit likely brought it to her and left it, but I sincerely just cannot explain its appearance. These are experiences told to me by my mom. We live in Central America, by the way. This happened before I was born. 
Our house was placed at the back of our land, so we had a big front yard and a tall metal fence. One night, my dad was outside hanging the clothes, and he came running inside to tell my mom that somebody was coming in from the front fence. She scolded him and said that our fence was locked, so there was no way that anybody was breaking in, and that it was just his imagination. Around this time, one of my dad's friends said that she'd been seeing something standing behind my mom lately, but was skeptical and thought his friend was just trying to scare her. A few days later, around midnight, mom was about to lock the main door in our house when she started to feel as though the floor was shaking. Her first thought was that it was an earthquake, but then she saw how our living room tiles started to tear apart and the floor started to crack up into a dark abyss. She and dad ran outside quickly as soon as they could, and as soon as they got outside, they started to vomit. My dad didn't as much, but my mother did until blood came out, so my dad kind of knew that they were being hexed. They quickly went inside again and grabbed some holy water that my grandma had brought from Costa Rica not long ago. He poured the water onto my mom, and she immediately stopped vomiting. He poured some onto himself and onto the home. Then they saw the white smoke coming out of the house. The next morning, my aunt came and saw the mess, and she quickly contacted a shaman, or curandero. I'm not sure which. They bought lots of stuff for cleansing and performed a ritual at our home. One of my uncles also passed by and told my mom that the spirit was sent with the intention of killing her and that she's really lucky to be alive. Another interesting note is that my dad never saw the floor cracking open. That illusion was seen only by my mom. Fast forward to a few months after I was born. My half-sister has been telling my mom to never let said family member, let's call him A, take me anywhere. One morning, A came by and asked if he could take me out for a few photographs at a restaurant and that he'd be back in a few hours. My mom refused, but my dad insisted on letting me go because he was close with A. Mom told him what my sister had said, but he just brushed it off. So I was out all day until 5 p.m. Mom was really mad because he said we'd be back sooner. That night when the clock hit 1 a.m., I started crying nonstop. My dad immediately called A and asked him what was wrong with me, but he just told my dad to put a glass of water beneath my bed. That only worked the first night. The next night, I also cried again at the same time, so again my dad called A. This time, A said to put a knife under the bed, and again, it only worked once. The third night, my mom got mad and swung the knife around, but it also worked only that night. They couldn't bear it anymore, so they called for a family friend who's also a curandero. She came to our place and inspected my room and said there was something strong in there and that she needed to perform a ritual as soon as possible. So they went and bought all the stuff they needed. At that time, A used to hang around a lot with Santera, so we suspected that she used him to get to us. There was also this one time that my dad fought with a friend that practiced voodoo in Santeria. Dad was away for a few days and left mom and I alone. His friend passed by and gave us a big doll-shaped present and left. It was around dusk, and as soon as my mom unwrapped the present, I started crying. Might have been a coincidence. The doll was an old lady with lots of wrinkles that was quite tall and very creepy. Luckily, a cousin had just dropped by, so my mom asked him to dispose of the doll, and he quickly agreed and left with it. Nothing paranormal happened, but it's just plain weird to give somebody a creepy-ass old lady doll as a gift for no reason whatsoever. Dad had an awful lot of friends and family, by the way, and wasn't on good terms with some of them, so I think that's why some of them tried to hex us. I'm not a big believer in the paranormal because I haven't experienced anything firsthand, but I believe what my mom said. I'm also open to any possible suggestions that might have happened that has nothing to do with the paranormal. We don't have any mental issues, by the way. Nothing like that runs in our family and nobody was using anything. Is anyone a Santero or has gone through anything similar? I haven't heard of anyone dying to a hexing or a spirit, but who knows?
I was in Costa Rica staying for a few nights in this large house on the Caribbean coast that served as a hotel. Right next to the property, there was a natural rock tidal pool, and this place was truly something else. You could feel the air of serenity at that pool. One night, I went out to it alone, and, sitting in that pool, staring at the starry sky, something compelled me to call out to forces unknown. I'm pretty agnostic. I don't have any set belief systems, nor do I follow any dogma religiously. I don't really know what came over me. I said with the utmost earnestness, if there's anyone or anything out there beyond our comprehension, gods, spirits, anything at all that we don't know, reveal yourself, please. What happened next kind of spooks me to this day. The vibrations started to change a bit. And I don't know if it was my eyes playing tricks on me or not, but in the leaves about 20 feet away, this weird, ancient, mask-looking thing appeared and opened its mouth. It was vague enough to make me doubt my senses, but real enough to make me doubt my skepticism. At that moment, I just started getting swarmed by bugs, which I hadn't felt earlier that night. I got the message that I revealed myself, now it's time for you to go. And literally as I was getting out of the pool, my friend had come to check on me. When I got back to the house, my phone got a message from my ex, who rarely speaks to me. This was the only time she had messaged me first. It was asking for closure or whatever. To make matters even spookier, a few weeks later I asked her if she wanted to talk and she didn't want to anymore. It was just that one night, at that one moment, that she felt she needed to. There were just too many strange coincidences that night for me to chalk it up to my imagination. I don't know what I believe exactly, but I believe that there's something out there that we can't grasp yet. What I know is that I don't know. But I do know that this night spooks me out. I wonder if the sanctity of that area has anything to do with the fact that there's a large Rasta presence on the Caribbean side. Very strange country, for sure. Very beautiful, but very strange. It feels strange to even tell this story. I've only told my parents and my wife. This took place in the late 80s in Costa Rica. I was seven at the time. One night I was watching TV and the show was about a jockey. Needless to say, there were horses and their jockeys running the track. Suddenly one of the jockeys fell off his horse and landed on his behind in a sitting position. His arms were gone. He had no arms, and his sleeves were stitched into his silk uniform, as if intentionally. He was sitting there with just nothing. I mean, not even arm bones, including shoulders, sticking out. A Lego figurine without its arms can be the best description for this. He was rocking back and forth, sitting there and laughing maniacally, completely cracking up. At this point, I realized that I was watching, or whatever you want to call it, experiencing something that was not on the show on the TV. I got up to change the channel, and the show instantaneously switched to its normal cast and plot. I finished the show. They never mentioned an armless jockey. I have no idea what happened to me that night, but I have, and always will, remember that incident. The desert is a scary place for me now. It used to be a place filled with peace and serenity. But since living out there for almost 30 years, you see things. This occurrence took place in the high desert of California in the early 1990s. The whole town was once all military. There's a military plant there and a prison. 
and the streets to this day consist of numbers and letters. For example, Avenue O or 178th Street. You always heard stories of people missing and underground tunnels, confirmed. In fact, a friend of mine kept getting a draft coming from his closet in his childhood home. Later, after he grew up, he checked it out and found an opening to one of these tunnels. He called me over to check it out, but after I got there and we went through the opening, I was too freaked out to go more than 10 feet. I turned around and told him, you know, this is probably how people disappear. You always saw things late at night, off in the distance, far past the lights of that then small town. Strange, glowing, different colored lights that would move around low or zigzag, and then shoot straight up. We saw things in the sky, stuff you just don't talk about. But life was pretty carefree back then. If you wanted to visit friends, though, you would have to drive down long desert roads and sometimes end up coming home late at night in the pitch black because there were no street lights. I remember coming home late one night with my boyfriend at the time and another friend, and we pulled over for some reason. Something compelled me to get out of the car and look up to the stars. We were in the middle of nowhere, but we could hear what sounded like machinery and muffled clanks like metal. We all started looking around but didn't see anything. Just then, we felt a vibration under our feet. I crouched down on the street and put my ear to the ground. It was coming from beneath us. We all listened intently. We could hear voices far below us but couldn't make out what was being said. We stood up and were discussing what it might have been when we saw a small red light on the horizon. It was getting closer and closer. We piled into the car and got out of Dodge. We only told a few friends and they told us that they had experienced the same thing. A year later, I told a friend that I started a small hauling business. Still, there was a big job, so I needed to borrow a trailer. He said he had a few that I could use so that I should come out to his property to check them out. It was just getting dark when he pulled out his new toy, military grade night vision binoculars. He told me to wait until it got dark to leave because he wanted to show me something creepy and I was all in. Later, we walked toward the back of his property, looking out at nothing. No lights, no roads, nothing but a barren desert. He pointed the binoculars east, and oh my, there were people out there coming out of the ground and moving around. I said, what the hell am I looking at? He told me that his family called them the ground dwellers and that they're located in various parts of the desert. It gave me the heebie-jeebies. Needless to say, I never went to his house after dark again. At one point in my life, I lived in a mobile home park, a little past Avenue F. There was a massive treehouse in my yard, which was left by a former tenant. The only way to get up into it was through a hole cut in the floor, with a door on it, and under that was a rope ladder. One night, I was sitting on the porch drinking a cup of tea when I heard something move up in the treehouse. And then, a head popped up. It was a lady and her husband hiding. Clearly, I thought they were on drugs. I told them to come down from there, but they both refused. It wasn't until I threatened to call the authorities that they cautiously complied, looking all around like they didn't want to be seen. By now, there was a small group of my friends and nosy neighbors gathered around. I saw that the woman was terrified by something, so I invited them in. I made them something to eat and waited for her to calm down. Then the lady reached into her bag and pulled out some papers. They looked like legal documents with government letterhead. They were drawings and schematics, and some of them even had embossed seals. I couldn't help but notice that they had water and smoke damage, and a few of them were burnt on the edges. She told me they were checking out this place off Barrel Springs Road, where there were two or three cinder block structures. I knew them well. A few years back, I happened upon that place, 
and a black truck rushed down the street to greet me with guns drawn. She said the same thing happened to her, but she was in one of the structures, so she grabbed some things and she and her husband ran. I went over these pages and felt very uneasy reading them, like this was the kind of thing people get killed over if it got out, you know? Stupidly, I said, why don't you just give them back? She said they'd been running, and everywhere they stop, a black car or van with government or no plates show up with darkened windows and just sit there watching them. Well, I really didn't want to get too involved, especially after reading what I did. I thought it was too big of a lot for me. I will take what I saw to my death. I packed them lunch and told them that they could sleep in the treehouse for the night. They did, but they were gone early the next morning before I woke up. I was kind of glad. After that, we started seeing black vans parked on our lonely little road facing the house. At one point, I even walked up to one of them, but they took off as soon as I knocked on their blacked out driver's window. Lots of unexplained things happened out there in the desert. You don't really see much of it now. I think because there are more lights and people well-lit towns and camera phones pointing everywhere. There really weren't cell phones back then to call for help or to gather evidence. I remember one time a few years later, it was a fun day with some of my friends. We were in this stupid little red car called a Yugo that seemed to be on its last leg most of the time. My friend's uncle told him that there was a whole abandoned town far west of the Mojave, and there were these things that were just left all over the place. We were so dumb. It took us a long time to get out there, and if you asked me to try to find it now, I don't know if I could. I wasn't driving. Thinking we were lost a few times, we started seeing things. A carnival ticket booth on a trailer, broken tractors and furniture, little shacks here and there and empty water bottles everywhere. There wasn't a livable house or store or place of business for many, many miles. I wondered how anybody could even survive in a place like this. And then, we saw it. It was long, and looked like a single wide mobile home, if you could ever call it a home. It was between 50 and 60 feet long, and it was raised with the siding going all the way to the ground. It looked like something out of a horror movie. It had several windows down the length of the house. Some of the windows had old, frayed curtains still hung up and blowing in the desert breeze. There were open sections of missing siding, exposing the darkness underneath the structure, big enough to step or crawl through. There were old, dusty cars with their doors and trunks open, trash and open cans all over the place, and in the middle of all of this, a small fire pit. His girlfriend and I saw people that seemed to not be wearing any clothes that we could make out. Their bodies were skinny and didn't move like ours. They were inside that house, and they were watching us from the windows and from the open spaces underneath. They were following us as we slowly drove past. They went from window to window and open space to open space. The way they moved was almost inhuman, and so was their appearance. They had big eyes and pale skin, too pale for the desert. My friend, the driver, pulled up next to the fire pit. We started screaming, go, 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 we have to go. He turned off the engine. His girlfriend began crying out that we had to leave now. He didn't see what we saw. Stop, babe, this stuff is so cool. I wanted to punch him in the face. We both kept looking at the people watching us, or the things watching us, while begging him to get back in the car and drive. He picked up a long bone off the ground and started to push the soot around in the fire pit. He said, hey, it, it looks like somebody cooked a dog. Just then he looked up. His girlfriend leaned over to the driver's seat and grabbed his jacket in an attempt to pull him back in the car. That's when he finally saw what we were seeing. Oh shit, he said. That thing hiding under the house was on all fours, swaying back and forth. His hands were on both sides of the opening, and he was staring at us, almost with the intent to lunge. 
He tried to start the car, but it failed. I thought this was my end and that we were all going to be eaten in the desert by these things. I began to beat on the back of his seat, screaming, Please, God, start! After three tries, it did, and we tore out of there, leaving a cloud of dust behind us. We pulled over far from that location and tried to compose ourselves. Never, ever again. We didn't talk about what we saw after that. I think we were in disbelief that it even happened. There were so many crazy things that occurred in the desert back in those days. Too many to even come close to tell you. I know that there are things that we do not, and maybe never will, understand. I also know that there are more eyes now paying attention, so I don't think it'll be too much longer before we all know the truth. This story is not my own, but it's been told to me so many times that I'm pretty sure I can be accurate. When my mother was a little girl, she would move around the country a lot because my grandfather was a nuclear technician in the military during the 80s. He would move to different military bases across the United States. She has many stories from that time in her life, but this one in particular takes place in Panama. My mom was living on the outskirts of a military base in Panama. I'm not too sure of the name of the base. I'm sure with some research I could figure it out, though. Anyway, while my mother was living in this house, she would wake up almost every single night, screaming the same thing. My grandparents would rush into the room to find my mother pointing and screaming, The man is in my room. My grandparents would take her out to the living room and try to calm her down and ask what was going on. They said my mother would seem to be in some kind of trance and would look past them, almost, as if they weren't even there. And then she would just start laughing hysterically. My grandparents would check every room in the house night after night and always found nothing. But my mother continued to wake up screaming about a man being in her room. One night, my grandmother decided to allow my mother to sleep with my grandpa while she slept in my mom's room. My grandmother fell asleep and everything seemed normal until she awoke in the middle of the night to see a man standing at the foot of the bed. She described him as wearing a robe or a cloak of some kind, something that definitely did not fit the current time period. My grandmother says that he looked so real that she thought for sure somebody had broken into the house. She was confused as to why the man wasn't taking anything or looking for money. She says that he just stood there with this angry, hateful look on his face, and then he just faded away, like smoke in the wind. They asked to be moved to a different location the next day. I have a few more stories from other members of my family, but this is one of the strangest, and I wanted to share. So, I live in southern Arizona, right near the border. An hour to Tombstone, 40 minutes to Bisbee. We're talking classic Wild West type experiences that have happened out here. Now, my friends and I are driving between our house and Bisbee when we go and take a left at this dirt road trying to get to this place that some of them were talking about up the mountain. Everything's going chill. We're all joking and having a good time and whatnot. As we get more and more into rough dirt roads with farther separation of houses in between, we come across one with a bunch of cars outside. We can see people moving around. Just from the atmosphere and the tension, it felt like it was not a place you wanted to go. But it was real. It was viable fear, so we decided we would turn around. As we are going back, we missed a turn, and we go a little bit farther down the road than we're supposed to. At that point, we lose sight of any houses around, 
except we see something in front of us. The wall. It's odd for me to be so scared of such a thing. For some reason, we got out of the car. I don't know why. It just felt like we had to. I go and walk up, and you can tell that this is old brick. Old mortar. It's been here for ages, and it'll probably be there for years more. It's half burned and crumbled, like it was part of a house caught up in a fire. There is no other debris or signs of a standing structure, just the wall. As I touch it and I slowly walk around to the other side, I just get this feeling of vertigo, and I'm feeling nauseated. No one else goes as near the wall as I do, or walks around to the other side. There is nothing there that looks interesting, it's just more desert, but it's wrong. I don't know how to explain it, it's just wrong. As I turn to walk away, I have this strange, nagging sensation, like that side of the wall was trying to draw me back, dragging me, like it's got a hold of me and won't let go. I made it back to the car. We get in the car, turn around, and just drive off. No one mentions the wall. The second it's out of sight, the conversation just picks up, lighthearted again. I'm terrified to my bones. If I wasn't the only one who felt that way, it didn't show. It was like none of them even remembered being there. Fast forward about a month. I've nearly forgotten the entire experience, except the strange feeling that I could lift my finger and tell you exactly where that place is. I still feel like I can, straight as an arrow, go there. If you follow where I point, it would lead you to that place. It's like it's a geolocation, like I always know where it is. One night I fall asleep and there I am at that damned wall, and as I look toward it, the world just spirals. It's like death itself is there and I'm flat on my stomach, clawing at the ground as it slowly drags me in. Whatever that place is, it's just otherworldly, for lack of a better term. I haven't dared go back there, but maybe it's near time that I do. The only thing is, the thought that this time I might not get away has me terrified. My dad has some stories from his experiences living in California, so I recorded one of them over the break and thought I would share. Me and this guy, a friend of mine, were out drinking beer one night, driving around, running amok out in the middle of the desert by 29 Palms. We were miles from anywhere or anything, literally just bonsaiing out on these old, old roads way out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, we're 20 to 25 miles from the nearest telephone pole. We come across this Datsun B210 that was like brand new back in the 70s, and it was burned from the firewall back. But the front of the car, the paint was still on it and everything, so we were like, man, check out this car. We pulled up and got our lights on it. It's super dark, no moon in the middle of the desert. It's just completely black out there, except for his headlights and the KC lights on his truck. It had a good engine in it. We had a whole truck full of tools with a whole bunch of beer, so hell, we just started tearing at it. I was like, check it out, man. I can use this engine in my truck. This is perfect. So we started taking the engine apart and taking it out. We're drinking beer, and we have the speakers up on the hood of the car, and we're in there twisting wrenches and just having a time. He didn't have an auto-reverse cassette deck, so we had to go back and reverse or change the tape every time it ended. You had to go over there and physically take it out, turn it around, and put it back in. There were no radio stations, so that's all we were listening to. We're almost getting ready to get the engine out and the tape ends again. But we're in the middle of doing something that we couldn't just jump up to change it. So we're twisting wrenches in this unbelievable dead of night quiet. And then we could hear something running around. 
You know where the light from the headlights and KC lights stops being light and turns into darkness? That's where we heard it. We heard it running around. You'd hear it from over here, running to over there. A little pitter-patter through the sand across the desert and brushes. Stuff like that. We were all like, what the hell? At this point in the story, my dad literally stops and says he has goosebumps. He said that he could remember this like it was yesterday. Then he goes on. We look at each other and we're like, what was that? We stopped and we're completely silent. You could almost hear your own heartbeat. And then you'd hear it again, over there, over here. So we'd turn our heads and look over there, using gestures to point. We'd look over here on this side, and we would just look at each other with this WTF face. We take our flashlights and look again, still tracking this thing. We couldn't see anything, so we would go back to work, and then we'd hear it again. Finally, we were like, screw it, we're out of here. This is freaking us out. So we took off. We came back the next day, during the day, and finished pulling the engine out. Well, we went out to look around, just to see if maybe there was a remnant of what had happened the night before. I was kicking around out in the brush when we heard the tracks, and there were these little teeny tiny footprints, like a little kid, like barefoot kid footprints, all around the sand, all in the perimeter of where we were. It wasn't us. We had boots on, and we're big, like all of our feet are size 11 and 12, and we were miles from anything. But there was nothing else in sight. For miles and miles. No houses, no stores, not even a telephone pole. Nothing. Just these little children's footprints running around barefoot in the dark. Before I begin, let me tell you about myself. I am currently 22, but this happened when I was 18. I was born and raised in Toronto, but I'm ethnically a Somali from the northern Somali regions. In 2012, I traveled to Hargeisa on my own to visit my grandma and some extended family. During my stay there, I felt stronger in the faith because back in Tadat, I was an experiential teen. All I desired was experience. Experience in drinking, experience in drugs, etc. But in Argesa, I could wake up at 5 a.m. to the sound of the call to prayer, and it made me feel good. One month in, I had heard some folkloric stories about ancient Somalia and these monsters that take children, called Degadir. It literally means long ears, a cannibalistic creature that comes in the form of a woman. I laughed it off as folklore to scare kids from hanging around outside. Some time went by after that and almost every week there would be a man or a woman being taken at night to the sheikh to heal them from jinns. I hated this kind of talk because of conflicting thoughts on whether it was a mental issue or actual possession. One night it happened right after the last prayer that is due when the sky is plunged into darkness. I left the neighborhood mosque and followed the group that was taking this woman. I was kind of excited about what to expect. We entered the sheikh's home and he prepared some rukia materials, like a container of water that he recited the mansil upon. The mansil is a collection of verses in the Quran that the Prophet advised people to recite at dawn and dusk. Dawn and dusk in Islam are the two only times where the two angels prescribe to every human leave their assignees momentarily. This is because they travel to the echelons of the universe to report the actions and things that so-and-so did, both good and bad. In those moments, there is a sense of an absence of protection. So when the sheikh began reciting these verses as well as spraying the water on the woman, she began to react. At first she was crying, and then she fainted. It looked like she was asleep. 
I sat in the corner, and the seats there were basically cushions on the ground. After twenty minutes, she began whispering, and the sheikh was sure that it was the jinn speaking. He asked her questions like, why was it in here? And then it said, because I love her, and I've been with her for five years. I care for her. So the sheikh told me and three others that were there that this was a case of jinn-human interspecies love. I laughed for a bit, but the other ones beside me told me not to. The jinn inside her whispered, Who's laughing? And I gestured to the sheikh not to say my name. As soon as I made the gesture, it began to recite my abtirsi. Abtirsi, ab equals father and tiris equals count, is a tradition among most Somalis where children memorize the names of their father and grandfathers and then their ancestors, all the way up to their tribal father. I learned mine when I was nine. I was in shock when the jinn and this woman whispered this because nobody but me and my family members knew it. This was my first ever encounter with the gaib, or the unseen. I ran out of the sheikh's home, even though he advised me not to. A few weeks later, I went out into the countryside with my friends who I met there. They were from Europe. We had a 4x4 Toyota Surf. We reached a spot near a hill and decided to camp. We knew that there could be scorpions or horned vipers in the area, so we took protective measures. I was amazed at the night sky and couldn't sleep in my tent. Then I saw something twinkling at the top of the hill. I thought it could be someone with a flashlight, so I decided to walk there. I was an idiot, because everyone in Somalia says that jinns love high hills and high canopies. It was like 1am on my watch when I reached the top of the hill, but there was nothing there. Everything was visible, because it was the 14th and it was a full moon. It was at that moment that I began fearing the worst. But as a Muslim, I knew that fear excites the jinn, so I tried my best to convince myself to be strong. I knew that I had angels as company. Still, adrenaline kicked in, and it felt like fight or flight. I was full of so much confidence that I began talking out loud. I said, why should I fear you when Allah placed us on earth after you ruined it? You are weak. We have the authority, not you. After this, I was still in an adrenaline rush. Every slight movement would alert me in the landscape. All of a sudden, my feet felt extremely cold. I started walking back to camp. But then I saw a woman from the back. She had long, dry-looking hair and a black robe with red dots on it. I started reciting parts of the Quran, and my heart began racing. Then I thought of reading the call to prayer, because as I was in that moment of shock, I thought of a narration I read that said the call to prayer is something hated amongst the evil jinns. When I did this, her head and body turned around, but her feet were still backwards. She was just staring at me, and her face, I could still remember. The jinn took the form of an attractive face. It had high cheekbones, well-shaped brows, jet black pupils, and gorgeous eyes. Her jaw was defined and her lips were black. When I finished reading the call to prayer, I said Nadaf, which means go away. It said, I've been following you for your whole life. When will you wake up? and become one among us. We know your doubts, we know your secrets, and you will be great with us. I told it to go or I would kill it. This was arrogant of me because my intense fear had opened up a way for it to enter me. It laughed in a woman's voice and began walking sensually towards me, like it was trying to seduce me. I walked backwards continuously reading verses, but my fear nullified the effects. I tripped and fell on my back and the demonic transmuted jinn was now crawling on all fours, still laughing. It kept saying my name in a seductive way, so I placed my arms on my eyes and just hoped that I would sleep. A cold breath that smelt foul went over me, and then everything went silent, 
until I opened my eyes and saw it on top of the hill, just standing there with its arms on its head. I slept and had a violent dream, but since that day I was convinced that the thing was a demon or even a degadir. I don't know. Even now, I have dreams of it causing chaos in a random home, where I enter it intending to kill it, with it eventually entering me. In this dream, I feel like a wind piercing through me. Every time I have this dream, I wake up at 3.33 a.m. Then I usually go back to sleep and relive the experience again and again for the whole night. I don't know what I experienced that night in the desert, but it was definitely one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. I am an Arabian military officer, and what I witnessed defies belief. I have not yet found a good explanation for what happened to me, so I'd love any input if you know. I'm an ordinary man who didn't believe in ghosts and paranormal stuff. I never thought that one day I would be on a date with something that made me reconsider my whole belief system. First off, I'm a military officer in a big Middle Eastern country, and due to the sensitivity of my job, I can't go into specific details about the story I'm going to tell you. We had our orders to camp in a specific spot within the desert, and wait to execute our designated mission. The first couple of days went by and everything seemed normal, nothing out of the ordinary. Then we began to notice a strange man walking on nearby hills, wearing what looked to be women's clothing. His walk was steady, as if he was looking for something specific. The first time we saw him, we thought he might be one of the locals or nomads and didn't think much of it. But I sent two soldiers anyway to bring him down to me for questioning, and warned him to keep a distance, as it's considered a military area now. But he managed to disappear and vanish every single time before anybody could get near to him. It became a habit seeing this weird person, and we sort of got used to watching him every day. Finally, when our mission was about to finish up and we were getting ready to pack up our gear and leave, something different happened. It was on Wednesday, February 10th of 2010. I was in my tent, trying to get some sleep, when I heard the sound of gunshots coming from outside. I quickly pulled my gun and ran out of the tent to find one of the soldiers shouting, We got him! We finally got him, sir! I asked him nervously who it was, but deep down, I knew who he was talking about. He said, it's that strange man that we see every day. We saw him coming down from the hills, running toward us, as if he was floating above the ground. So we shot him twice in the chest. I don't know why, but I had this overwhelming feeling that something really bad was about to happen. Reluctantly, I asked him to show me the body. Once we got there, I swear, we both heard the sound of a man laughing loudly and giggling. When I looked at the dead body, it was a man in his mid-thirties, wearing white women's lingerie. He had a strange necklace that had an odd symbol around his neck. His face looked directly at me, smiling, as if somehow he knew what I felt and what I was thinking. Honestly, I was freaking out myself, but I didn't want to show it. I had this gut feeling that we made a huge mistake killing this being, whatever it was. At that point, I was almost convinced it wasn't human. It was downtime. The sun was about to rise, so I told the men to carry the body out and bury it. When they finished, one of the soldiers wrote a Quranic verse on a stone, which says, O oh satisfied soul, return to your Lord well pleased, well pleasing. Join my devotees and enter my heaven. And we placed it on top of the tomb. When we all gathered around the grave to recite some Quran in order to ease his soul, we didn't believe our eyes when we saw the hard stone above the grave crack in half. Then we all heard an angry roaring coming from inside the grave, while the dirt around it was violently shaking. This was it for me. 
I couldn't take it any longer, so I ordered the soldiers to grab their stuff in a hurry and get the hell out of there. After I got back, I went to this old wise man that I knew, like a shaman, to tell him about this freaky incident and find some answers. He asked me to describe the shape of the necklace the man was wearing, but refused to tell me anything further. All he said was, you should be thankful to God that you got out of there safely. Till this day, I still have no idea what this man was, and whether it was a djinn or a demon. All I know for sure is that he was not human. Okay, so backstory here. My mom is batshit crazy, like way out there, beyond rescue. She divorced my father when I was a kid and married a nut job that fit her brand of crazy. His family lives in a cult commune on the border of Utah and Nevada, kind of near Garrison, Utah. This commune follows something called the Church of Aaron and Levi. They're kind of like a mixture of Christian, Jewish, Catholic, and Mormon. They have this dairy that they sell milk from, which is how they fund their commune. No disrespect, I just think it's nuts. Now this place is friggin' weird. I used to have to go out there as a kid and stay with my stepdad's nutso family in their commune. The one good thing about this place, though, is that it's in the middle of the desert. As in, back then, you wouldn't find civilization in any direction you wanted to go. Delta, Utah was the nearest place, and it was pitifully small back then. It took an hour to get there anyway. Now, as a kid, I was lucky enough to have dirt bikes thanks to my biological dad. So, every so often, when I got dragged out to this commune, I would be allowed to bring my dirt bike. I'd get five gallons of gas, strap it on my back fender, and head off into the desert for the day. This was very dangerous for a kid my age, and I probably should have died more than once. But alas, here I am. Anyway, that's irrelevant. One of these times, I miscalculated the amount of daylight I had left, and I ended up with about a two-hour ride back in the pitch dark. Now, if you've ever been out in the middle of the desert at night, and nowhere near civilization, you know that it's really really dark. And depending on how bright the moon is, sometimes you can't even see your hand in front of your face. Unfortunately, this happened to be one of those nights. The particular dirt bike I was riding at the time was an old Honda Enduro with a decent headlight on it, so I could still see a bit. I managed to find an old dirt road leading to mines in the mountains from like the 40s, which led to the main road and then back to the commune. It was so dark that I had to stick my foot out and feel the edges of the road to make sure I stayed on it. I was cruising along, starting to shiver, and out of nowhere, this white light illuminated the whole valley. I could see for miles, but it wasn't like daylight. It was pure white light. Naturally, my head started spinning with ideas, trying to make heads from tails, trying to figure out where this light was coming from. It seemed like it was directly above me. I stopped my bike after almost crashing for the hundredth time to see where the light was coming from, and I looked up. I didn't see anything. There was no craft in the sky, there was no fireball, no meteor, no nothing. Just black sky and stars. But yet, I could see the whole valley around me. By the time I was able to gather myself, I kick-started the motorcycle and began riding again while somewhat enjoying this ridiculously illuminated landscape. And just as quickly as this light came, it disappeared. Like a light switch had been turned off. It was nothing but black. At this point, my eyes were used to the light, so the darkness slapped me across the face even harder. The light only lasted for about 15 to 18 minutes total, but it felt like a really long time, so the dark was that much more unsettling. I managed to make it back and get to sleep, but that experience has always stuck with me. My first guess is that there was some kind of military aircraft being tested in the desert, 
and they came across some random kid in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the night on a shitty dirt bike, and were probably just as surprised to see me as I was to see the light. I didn't hear a thing, and I didn't see a thing, but it was the brightest light I've ever seen in my life, and to this day, I have no idea what happened. This happened last year to my friends and I. Every summer, my friends and I go out to Phoenix and stay in a rental house for a week. One particular night, it was getting late and everyone was asleep except for the three of us. We were bored and so one of us came up with the idea to just go driving around the city. We were having a good time listening to music and talking. We stopped at a gas station at one point and got some snacks, and then we continued on. Not long after this, we started going outside the city limits. We were purposefully driving around sketchy areas in the desert because we thought it was fun. I'm not completely too sure where we were when this happened, but I know we left Mesa and were even outside Queen Creek. I just thought I would add that in case anyone is familiar with the area. Anyway, we were on this two-lane road in the middle of nowhere, and it was well past midnight. This is where we pulled over to the side of the road and turned the car off. We just sat there in the dark, eating our snacks and joking around. Just to paint the picture for you, we were just off the road in a little dirt area and there was what looked like a house on a large property to our right. From what we could see, the place looked really shitty and abandoned. After we sat there for a few minutes, we turned the car back on to leave. As we turned on the car, an incredibly bright spotlight shined into the passenger window of the car, my window. At that point, I was really confused about what was going on, but my friend hit the gas and we sped away. The light followed us for a few seconds, and it was right outside my window, probably within that property we were next to. We drove off, and we were all kind of laughing about it and talking about what it could have been. Probably some kind of security system, although it's weird that it didn't turn on right when we parked the car. Well, a few minutes later, we decided to drive back. Stupid idea, I know. Anyway, we drove back and parked on the other side of the road. As the car was coming to a stop, all three of us heard somebody whistling. Not a song. It was the kind of whistle someone does when they're using a signal. I thought it was my friend in the back seat messing around, but then he said, Who's whistling? Right after that, we all saw a flash of light coming from inside that house. Because of that flash of light, it was confirmed that the house was a super creepy Texas chainsaw looking place. Then we saw a shadow running away from the house and coming toward the road. The figure that was running was flailing around and running like a maniac. We all screamed and sped off. We had about a 20 minute drive back and the whole time we were going in between freaking out and laughing about the whole episode. I realized that this doesn't sound as intense as it probably felt to us when it happened. It may not even sound believable. It could very well have been some security system combined with our minds playing tricks on us, or it could have been a human playing tricks on us. But who knows? It could have also been insane cannibals who wanted to murder us, I also realized that my friends and I probably made some really stupid decisions that night. Either way, it was a terrifying experience. In March of 2015, I woke up one night at around 3 a.m. I have no idea why, but I usually wake up to drink water or use the bathroom. 
but I needed neither of those things. I was living in Southern California at the time, near Camp Pendleton. And where I lived, there was my neighborhood and then just wilderness. There was nothing beyond my neighborhood for miles, just land. As an FYI, I've always been into the supernatural, but I don't think I ever really believed it until this experience. Before I went to sleep, I opened my window because it was hot, and I had my curtains open and my shades open and pulled up just to make sure air was getting in. So at three o'clock in the morning, I woke up and just looked out my window, which was right next to my bed. I thought I saw someone standing at the crosswalk across the street. I was just thinking, that's so weird, because we usually didn't have any runners or early morning walkers until about 4.45. So I got up and went to my window so I could get a closer look, and what I saw, I will never forget. The thing was standing, but its legs were bent and it had some white fur covering the body. However, I could still see some skin. Its back was hunched over, and its face looked like some sort of dog's. If this creature was standing straight up, I'd say that it would be about seven or eight feet tall. Now, mind you, this was at 3 a.m., so I was just like, wow, okay, you're hallucinating, go back to sleep. However, I was literally paralyzed, and I could not take my eyes off this creature. Its nose and ears just looked so similar to dogs or some kind of wolf or coyote. Where I lived, coyotes were very prevalent, however, they never really came into the neighborhood. And for anyone that says it could have been a bear, there are no bears in the area that I live in because it was such a warm, desert-like climate. So, as you can tell, I was just completely shocked and nervous, and as I was about to shut my window, the thing turned its head and stared straight at me. It was standing directly under a streetlight, so I could see its features very clearly, and its eyes were so black. But somehow, they were shining to where you could really see them staring straight into your soul. That did it for me. I slammed my window shut, pulled down the blinds, closed the curtains, and jumped right into bed while pulling the covers over my face. I never went back to sleep that night. Flash forward two years later in June of 2017. I again woke up, but this time I was just hungry. So I went downstairs to get some food and sat at my kitchen table. In the chair that I sat, my back was facing the window on the side of the house. This window was about a foot off the ground, and it was open about 10 inches because my mom forgot to shut it. Now, that window had no screen because it got torn somehow, and we just didn't get around to replacing it. Anyway, I had my earbuds in, and I was watching a movie or a show I can't exactly remember, but I heard a noise. I couldn't tell if it was from the movie or from outside, so I paused it and listened. I then heard heavy breathing, but I have never heard this kind of breathing before, and it was coming from directly behind me, right outside the window. The breathing was rough, rigid, and sounded not anything like a human. I was too scared to turn around, but the hairs on the back of my neck were standing up, and I had goosebumps everywhere. The breathing lasted for about two minutes, and then I heard heavy footsteps, as if this thing was walking away. After about ten minutes passed, I shut the window, locked it, closed the curtains, and ran up to my room. I told my parents about my first encounter the next day after it happened. I was sixteen at the time and still living with them. They just kind of looked at me and laughed and said that I was seeing things and that it was probably just a coyote. It wasn't a coyote. After my second encounter, I told them the next day, and that time they really thought I was just tired and was hearing things. My question to everyone out there is this. 
Have any of you experienced something similar to this? Was it just a coyote that happened to be standing on two feet hunched? Do you think I was hallucinating? It's been bothering me for a while now, and I just had to get my story out there because I can't deal with not having answers. This happened in northern Mexico. The area is a place for tourists due to it being a forested area in the middle of a desert. My family and some of their friends had rented a cabin in the thick of the forest and we had spent all day walking around the area and unpacking. At night it was decided that we would stay there and stargaze because the sky looked pretty without the lights from the city. As such, we were about 30 kilometers from the nearest town, and this region is not particularly developed. As I was looking at the sky, I started seeing a light, about as bright as a star, moving and zigzagging among the stationary stars. It was kind of weird for me, and I asked a friend of my mom to record it, given that he was the only one with a camera at the time and was actively trying to take pictures of some stars. However, he was an amateur and spent a good 15 minutes preparing his camera, so by the time he was ready, the strange light was gone. Along with my mom, we were the only ones that saw this thing. It went on for about 30 seconds, and then we just dismissed it and lost track of it. I could describe the movement of this UFO as a light just cruising around. Sometimes it sped up and then slowed down and at times it started going in circles, as if it were writing in cursive in the sky. It was amazing how many people were ignoring the most interesting thing happening at the time in the forest. And yet almost everyone was looking directly at the sky. I dismissed it because all things considered, the event was underwhelming, and now that I remember it, I'm looking for an explanation of what I saw. After researching, I've almost come to the conclusion that it was a satellite, but I've never seen a satellite move in that pattern, nor have I ever heard of one doing so. Nevertheless, I'm open for any other explanations and similar UFO experiences that have happened to people in that area, or even in other areas of Mexico. As I write this, I am a 41-year-old man, married, and I have four children. My story is from when I was eight years old, but it was so vivid and real that I still feel like it was yesterday. This is my paranormal experience with something that I call the Demon Lady. This story really is about hearing if others have had a similar experience or insight. Here is some of the backstory of my life leading up to the Demon Lady. My parents got divorced when I was eight years old. I originally went to go live with my mom, my older brother, and my mom's boyfriend at the time. Everything appeared to be normal in our house. While living in this new house that we all moved into, I remember finding a book about how to perform black magic. I was fairly certain that this was my mother's book, and truthfully, being eight years old, I had no idea what I was looking at. It was soon after this time that I went to go and live with my dad. One weekend, when I was allowed to see my dad, my mom told me to pack up all my stuff and that I was going to go with my dad. I was under the impression that this was another weekend trip and nothing more. It turned out that my mom, brother, and my mom's boyfriend were moving to Colorado this weekend while I was at my dad's house. However, I didn't know any of this for three years. She didn't contact me for another three years about her whereabouts, but that's a story for another day. So now I'm living with my dad and he's in a small apartment. He decides to move into a house to give us more room. 
we moved into a house on Sullivan Road in northwest Huntsville, Alabama. The moment we moved into this house, I only had one word to describe how I felt living there. Dread. Everything about being in that house gave me this feeling. I was a latchkey kid growing up since my dad worked all day and I remember walking home from school and just dreading going home. I also remember as I was about to put the house key in the lock that I always checked the door. By checking the door, I mean that I was checking for scratch marks, as if something was trying to claw its way in, or I would check to see if the door was broken into. I always had this feeling that something was waiting for me on the other side. Once inside, I would run into every room except one and turn on all the lights. The one room light that I did not turn on was my own. I lived in this house for six months and not once did I ever sleep in my room. I had, up until that point, never had a problem sleeping by myself. I always slept in my dad's room. As a matter of fact, I was so scared to go into my room that I made my dad go in and pick out my clothes for me. Even thinking about going into that room, a total feeling of dread came over me. Actually, there was another place that I never went to as well, and that was my backyard. I hated it in the backyard. I don't know what it was, but it always felt off, darker. One day after school, I came home and did what I normally do. I made a snack, watched some TV, and waited until my dad came home. Today was different though. I'm not sure why, but I decided that I wanted to go into my room and jump on my bed. I don't recall what I was feeling before entering the room, but I remember being in there and jumping on my bed. Everything was fine, until I looked out of my bedroom door, through an open hallway, and into another room. That was the first time that I ever saw the demon lady. She was floating in the open doorway of the other room. I'll describe her as I remember her. Like I said, she was floating off the ground. Her skin, from head to fingertips, was completely pale in color, almost gray. Her hair was long and looked like it had never been combed. I remember her hands because they seemed tense, like when you're trying to palm a basketball but there was no ball there. I also remember that her fingernails were black. Her eyes were black too, but it felt like I knew she was staring at me. Her mouth was just there, on her face. There was no menacing smile or anything like that. I was just staring at her, and she was staring at me. I was terrified, beyond terrified. I ran out of the room as fast as I could, right past the demon lady and onto my front porch. I sat out on the porch for the next few hours, waiting for my dad to get home. Surprisingly, I never told my dad what I saw. I'm not sure why I didn't. Maybe because I didn't know what I saw. After seeing the demon lady, things got worse for me at that house. I ended up not sleeping well. I missed over 20 days of school for half a semester because I was so terrified to be away from my dad. I was getting to be too much for my dad to handle. He decided to send me to my grandparents in Arkansas to live for a while. I'm sure he thought I was just a kid struggling with a parent's divorce and my mother leaving me. So I was packed up and moved to Arkansas. But before I left, I did see the demon lady one last time. I was in our garage hanging out doing whatever kids do. There were two doors to the garage, one from the kitchen into the garage and one door to the backyard. I remember being in the garage and that feeling of dread coming over me. I turned toward the door from the kitchen and there she stood, the same as before. Same hair, gray skin, and most notably, her piercing black eyes. I ran to the backyard as fast as I could, but I hated the backyard and I couldn't get out of there fast enough. So again, I waited on my front porch for my dad. That was the last time that I would see her in that house. I moved to Arkansas, and I never once saw her while I was there. It was like she'd never been a part of my life. Everything seemed to go back to normal. I slept in my own room, 
My grades improved, I played baseball, and girls liked me. Even more awesome was that my dad moved from Alabama to Arkansas with me. Things were going great for us, but my dad ended up getting a job in Alabama again, so we were going to move back. Still, at this point, I never told him about what I saw in the house. Everything started out normal, but eventually, I started seeing this demon lady in my dreams. I would wake up completely terrified, and I would expect to see her standing at the door. On another occasion, I remember experiencing a form of sleep paralysis twice with the demon lady being present. In these instances, I was on my stomach, my head laying on its side. Above me was the demon lady hovering. She was so close that her hair was gently grazing my face. This was the most terrified I have ever been in my life. I couldn't move, and I felt trapped. All I remember is that eventually it was over. What eventually happened was that I started going to church when I was 11, and would mention the demon lady to a youth pastor from time to time. I don't think he knew it was such a serious thing for me in my life at the time. Who really would, though? One time he joked that the demon lady was standing behind me, and my first reaction was to cower in terror. It was at that moment that he knew that this was serious. He ended up praying for me, and that this demon would leave me alone. And truthfully, it worked. I never had another issue with it since that time. Now, did the prayers really work? Maybe. Or maybe I just grew out of it over time. I do know and feel that the times I saw her outside of my dreams, she was as real as another human standing in another room. And the terror, that was real too. I did end up telling my dad about her when I was 18, and surprisingly, he seemed to listen well. I'm not sure if anybody has a similar story or insight as to what this could have been. Part of me thinks that this is somehow connected to the black magic book my mother had. I never lived with my mom again and saw her from time to time from my young age until now, but there are some other stories that I have heard from her that make me think she had something to do with it. There was a 20 year gap where we never spoke to one another. When we did connect later in life, she mentioned that she and my brother used to perform seances together when he was older. She even admitted one time that they did this with my brother and a friend of his. Apparently, the friend had gotten possessed and ran out of the house. They didn't see him for two days, until he was found at the bottom of a cliff, dead. She also mentioned the reason she left me and never contacted me was to protect me from my brother. She said that she was afraid he was going to kill me. She also mentioned that she was visited by, in her words, a witch at her front door. All the witch said to her was that her family was going to die. Her husband ran the woman off, and she was never seen again. I still don't know what to make of all of this, and any feedback or experiences would be appreciated. So I was talking to my uncle about old beliefs and stories that my mom told me about our family, and he told me this one about my granddad that I wanted to share. There are two beliefs that I'll explain before I continue with the story, just so you can understand it a little better. The first was that you shouldn't play cards or poker, anything like that, after 2am, as it's the devil's game, and he follows the cards in those you play. The second belief was that the devil cannot cross water. Now that I've said that, I'll start the story. In my town, there is an old hall. This hall held dances, and women from my granddad's time were known to go there and play bingo. In the night, the men were known to meet up and play gambling card games such as poker. So one night, my granddad and a few of his friends met up and played poker. The night went well. And as 2 a.m. came closer, some of the men started to leave, but a few continued on after that time. It was around 3 a.m. when they all decided to call it a night and head home. They all went their separate ways. My granddad's road home was through the grounds of my old school, 
which before it was a school, used to be the hanging grounds by the court back when hanging was legal punishment. He started to hear footsteps behind him. He just turned around and no one was there. He continued on and heard them again, but this time he realized that it wasn't the sound of footsteps, it was the sound of hooves. He checked behind him and again there was nothing. He started to walk onwards again, this time faster. But the faster he walked, the faster the hoofsteps were. And when he stopped, they stopped. Wanting to get home as soon as he could, he decided to just keep going, to not stop and to not look back. He suddenly got a cold chill all over his back and arms and his head felt weird. His hair was literally standing up straight as if a gust of wind had blown it up. He ran his hands through his hair and placed it back flat on his head and started to run. The stomp of the hoofsteps got louder and closer until it reached a stream of water. He crossed the water and suddenly there was nothing. No hoofsteps, no chill. All was calm. Safe to say he didn't play cards after 2 a.m. again. My husband saw a demon. He doesn't like to talk about it at all. Over the past five years, I've only heard parts of it, and I've had to put it together by the snippets that he's told me. He lived in an old apartment, one of the oldest buildings in a very old town with his ex, and he would wake up with feelings of being choked and just strange experiences. It was the middle of the night, and he got up, turned on all the lights in the house. He woke up feeling like he was being choked, so he was nervous. He went to use the bathroom, and this thing was just standing in the bathroom when he walked in. The only way to describe what he saw, he says, is that it looked a little bit like Mewtwo from Pokemon, but constantly morphing and changing form, with something like static around it, with shifting and changing color. This creature, which he calls a demon, looked at him, and in that instant he was in bed again, with all of the lights still on. It was almost as though he was teleported back into bed, like the creature was trying to make it seem like a dream, although it wasn't. I don't know if anybody else has experienced anything like this, but it definitely scarred my husband. These are my encounters with the creatures known as dogmen while living in Kentucky. They still haunt me to this day, so I thought I would share them. Story number one. I was eight years old, living in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. It was the summer of 2012, and it was a hot one. One summer night, I awoke at about 11.30 to 12 o'clock. I was sweating like hell, so I walked over to the window to crack it open. That's when I saw something in the tree line by our stock pond. We owned no animals other than a small terrier, but the previous owners had been commercial farmers. I watched for about five minutes before it emerged, and when it did, I was horrified. It was a wolf-like creature, about six to seven feet tall, and partially covered in dark gray hair that shone in the light of the full moon. It walked out on two legs, and then very quickly dropped on all fours and ran the hundred or so yards to the stock pond in mere seconds. It drank for a while, and then stood up on two legs again, and I got a really good look at it. The thing was horrid looking. The fur was all patchy, very skinny, and it looked like it was covered in some kind of injuries. Years later, when I saw the third Harry Potter movie for the first time, I saw the werewolf, and that's almost exactly what it looked like. It then took off across the old cornfield and into the woods on the other side. I'd heard stories of the creature, but I never really believed them. Not until that night. 
About a week later, I was around town with my folks, and I heard that there had been an attack at a nearby farm. Three hogs and a horse had been eaten and ripped to shreds. That was my first, but not my last, encounter with a dogman. I caught glimpses of the things constantly, ever since that first sighting, but I never got another good look at one of them until fall of 2015, a month before we moved to Maine. It was dusk, and I was outside with some of my friends, playing with our Nerf guns, as young boys do. And, man, those were the good days. Anyway, after a while we got bored and started a fire. We told dirty jokes and laughed for a while, but then we started hearing noises in the woods and the laughter died down. We all retreated to the woodshed and armed ourselves with axes, pitchforks, and the like before returning to the fire. About ten minutes later, something rustled in the woods about twenty yards behind us, but no one dared to look to see what the hell it was. Finally, my friend Jeremy slowly turned around to look, and then screamed. He let out a scream so loud it could have brought down the barn roof. That's when we all turned around and saw one of them. Except this one was much taller. I'd say eight and a half to nine feet. It was pure muscle and gray hair. It was on all fours sniffing around the barn. But when Jeremy screamed, the thing looked at us stood up on two legs, and snarled. That's when my dad came out of the house with a shotgun and screamed, What in God's name is going on? We all just pointed and screamed, and then he looked at it and yelled, Go on, get, and shot at it twice. It ran into the woods, yelping. I'm pretty sure it was hit. And we all went inside and locked the doors. My dad sat in his chair with that shotgun the whole night, and I swore that I heard scratching along the side of the house until daylight. Turns out when we went outside the next morning, there were claw marks all over our house on the outside. After that, everything was quiet until we moved. Unfortunately, I have never seen anything like that since. My wife and I were trying to go see the Moonbow at Cumberland Falls, out in Corbin, Kentucky. We got a late start heading out there and became lost on one of those shortcuts that Google Maps found us. And then we lost service. Just for reference, she drives a compact four-door car. I've lived in Western Virginia and Tennessee and I've opened a dumpster on a black bear eating spaghetti and I've also had one stand up in front of me while riding my motorcycle through the mountains so I'm familiar with wildlife. We were traveling probably 30 to 40 miles per hour on those sea roan taillights roads. No street lights, but there were houses scattered along the road and it had a line. We got to a curve that you could see from the top of the hill and I slowed way down. It was then that we spotted a black mass in the road, and I was excited to show my wife a black bear out in the wild. I came to an almost complete stop, and this black mass turned toward the car like it was surprised by us. My wife screamed because we were probably only 15 yards from the thing. I got tunnel vision, I guess, because all I can tell you is that the eye shine from the headlights was golden, and one of the bottom canines gleamed. I didn't see shapes of ears or anything, but I can tell you that the face was canine, and it was turning gray around the muzzle, like a lab will do. It looked as if it was trying to see in the car, but within two to three seconds it walked away, on all fours, mind you, over the guardrail. I don't mean that it hopped over it, I'm saying it stepped in stride over the guardrail. I've never seen anything like that. Its size was incredible and my wife told me in not-so-nice terms to get her away from that thing. It's not as epic as some of the other encounters I've read, but I figured I would share it, in case anybody else has seen anything in that area. On May 9th of this year, I went to a flea market to browse. 
I passed by a clear cabinet that held an assortment of old antique dolls, and I was particularly drawn to an old cracked doll wearing a hat with feathers. As I examined her closer, I noticed that she had a cloth body, but her arms, head, and legs were made of some type of plastic or possibly porcelain. I felt very drawn to her and was surprised by her price, only $35. She wasn't in very good condition and is clearly rather old based on the cracks in her body and the way her face is painted on. I returned to the cashier with the doll and immediately the workers who had been deep in conversation halted and fell quiet. They proceeded to tell me a little more about the doll who supposedly hexes anyone who inconveniences her. This only made me feel more inclined to purchase her. As someone who is very interested in the paranormal and it being part of my faith as a Wiccan, I wanted to see more, so I ended up buying her. My younger sister, who's 11, wasn't very happy that I had bought the doll, whose name was Madame Leonora. She felt very thrown off by the doll's presence, and requested that the doll be placed in the trunk on the ride home. I didn't want to upset the doll just in case I did get hexed, but my parents insisted that I put the doll in the trunk, so I did. That same day, I almost went to the hospital after an accident at my home. Similar disturbing events happened around the home whenever someone insulted Madam or did something she didn't like. These events pose a possible trauma trigger for some people, so I won't specify what they are. Just know that they were very serious and very awful. I began giving Madam gifts and saying good morning and good night to her every day. On the first day that I gave her a gift, a package I hadn't been expecting for another two weeks came in the mail. Every time I give her a gift, she gives me good luck. Madame and I had formed a friendship, but toward late June, I began having strange, very specific dreams. In these dreams, Madame would climb down off the shelf she lives on and escort me outside. We would light candles and perform a ritual, and then I would bury Madame in a box with the gifts that I had given her over the months. As soon as the dream ends, I wake up. So, with the knowledge I have because of my wicking faith, I decided to hold a seance of sorts in order to communicate with the spirit hosting my doll. I lit a candle and used a pendulum with a board to communicate. The candle flame responded to everything I said, and I've never seen such clear responses through my pendulum before. Based on what I got out of the session, Madame was able to tell me that she would like to be buried, but won't reveal to me why. I've never sensed any negative energy around Madame before, but with each passing day, the air in my room feels heavier, if that makes any sense. I'd like to fulfill her wish and bury her, because I think she might be a Victorian mourning doll, but the vendors who sold her have no information on her, only that she makes bad things happen. If she is indeed a Victorian mourning doll, it would make sense why she wants to be buried. The only problem is, she won't tell me why I have to do it. If anyone can tell me if there are any dangers in burying her, if there's anything I should know about this, or if there's anything I can do to identify what time period she's from, I would really appreciate the help. Update I woke up this morning and was pleasantly surprised by the amount of attention and responses that I had received. I want to go through some more information on my experience with the paranormal, some events that have occurred while Madame has been in my home, and what I'll be doing with Madame based on research and the advice from the community, as well as trusted psychic mediums. To begin, I have been working with the paranormal for 10 years now. When my mother introduced it to me after she noticed my sensitivity to haunted places and objects, it became a part of my life. The first experience I ever had was very young, in the first home I ever lived in. It began when I started noticing shadowy figures around my home, 
and items would fall off the shelves or get lost. My mother came home one night with her sister after a ghost hunt in an abandoned buffalo jail, I believe. I didn't know where they had been, only that I had noticed a shadow enter our home behind them. I explained what I had seen, and that is when my journey into Wicca began. Not long after this experience, my mother decided to take me on a ghost hunt in St. Augustine. We went to the famed haunted lighthouse there. Throughout my journey, I felt a tugging toward a specific window, and was later told that a woman was often seen in that very window. I felt hands on my back and shoulders the entire time I was there, and my shoes kept coming untied. I was little then, so that first experience scared me for a long while, until I felt a pull toward a shop in Gettysburg while we were visiting on vacation. We bought some equipment to communicate with spirits near the Saks Covered Bridge, and while I was there, three spirits came into contact with me. A Confederate soldier, a Union soldier, and a little girl who had died in the house on the property. Each one connected with me through my emotions, and they expressed to me the pain they felt when they died. All of them didn't want to pass on, either for fear of the afterlife or the unwillingness to let their past life go. I returned to Gettysburg three times, and each time the spirits would connect with me and talk to me about their lives. After my first experience in Gettysburg, I decided to speak with two psychics, and both told me they believed that I was an empath. I embraced this after some research, and ever since, spirits have been twice as drawn to me. They come to me with their problems, and I do the best I can to resolve them. I never wanted to conform to a specific faith because of my many different beliefs about the afterlife, the paranormal, and anything spiritual until I found Wicca. Most of what I believe aligns well with the faith. So I began my practice with it and found that I love every part of it. The reason for my brief stories on my experiences is just to ease the minds of some people who believe me to be inexperienced. I do appreciate the concern though. It's lovely to know that people have my back and are urging me to be careful because I wholeheartedly agree that safety is 100% necessary when communicating with any spirit. To add on to that, I noticed that many people were denouncing Madam, calling her a demon. I would like to ease the minds of people who believe Madam to be a demon. Madam has never physically harmed anyone in this household. Let me explain jinxes, hexes, and curses. A jinx is like a practical joke. It's really just a nuisance of a spell that's gone very quickly. They're practically a mosquito in your life. A hex is a mildly inconveniencing spell meant to dissuade the hexed person from engaging in acts that the spellcaster does not condone. In Madame's case, she only hexes people who disrespect her, and the hex is gone within a day. They take up a lot of her energy. Hexes are moderately complex, and I've never had any issues lifting them before. A curse is a harmful spell, meant to damage the person it's directed at. Curses are difficult to lift and often cause physical harm to the person they're directed at. So, with that in mind, know that Madame has never done anything physically harmful, and I don't believe she ever will. Her hexes consist of mild loss of money, misplaced important objects, emotional disturbances, dizziness, irritation, and items falling. Many of you were concerned about my younger sister. I would like to let you know that Madame has never harmed her in any way. Madame and my sister get along quite well, and my sister is no longer wary of her. My parents had hexes placed on them after they disrespected Madame, but after they apologized, they were lifted. No one has been hexed in over a month now. Let me put this into perspective for you. You're a confused person who's just been brought into a new home with people who are continuously disrespecting you. You're angry, yes? No one enjoys being disrespected. So, since this was Madame's situation, she lashed out and caused some disturbances to get our attention and let us know that she does not want to be disrespected or ignored. Madame hadn't received much kindness until she came into my home, and after a couple of weeks, 
She was very much at ease. She doesn't expect to be given gifts, but if she receives them, she reciprocates kindness in the form of good luck. So with that in mind, you can also make note that I don't believe Madame to be a demon. Demons often, but not always, please do your research on demonology, have malicious intent toward the residents of a home. Demons also are less likely to attach themselves to an object, and would rather attach themselves to a person. There's a difference between a demon and an angry spirit. An angry spirit needs an issue to be resolved, while a demon preys on people simply for the reason of being negative, to feed off of the harm that it causes. I've also received the comment that I don't need to know the reason Madame would like to be buried, and to an extent, I agree. Madame suffered a painful, tragic death at a young age, and because of this, her reasons for burial could be very personal. I'm glad she trusted me enough to come to me about her request. I won't push her for a response on why she'd like to be buried. I'd rather just follow through with the request. So, with all of this said, I am going to bury Madame. I will not be burying her at my home, so in case something goes wrong, she doesn't attach herself to my home. Tonight is a full moon, so I'll be working with Madame in my dreams tonight to find out if there is anywhere specific she would like to be buried. I'll be salting the ground where I bury her, and I'm going to make potions to seal off the area. I have enough flowers, herbs, and crystals for protections, along with some oils, incense, candles, and pentagrams. And please don't tell me that pentagrams are demonic, because they're not. I'll be working with a sister witch during the burial as well, as an extra safety measure. I cannot verbally express how happy I am that so many people were willing to help Madame, and believe me, she's even more pleased than I am. The whole house feels very light today, and the animals have been extra happy. I'm in awe of the kindness that we've both received, and I'm glad you all decided to help. So, it's 6am right now. I couldn't really sleep after this. I first woke up at midnight, raised my head a bit, looked toward the door, and then realized that what had woken me was the really creepy voice of someone singing. Just by the sound of it, I could definitely tell that it was a doll and not a human. I was so tired that I didn't really realize what had just happened. The TV was on in the other room, so in my head I thought it might have been coming from that. In my really tired state, I just told myself, hell, if I had to own a doll I'd shit myself right now, and went back to sleep. Then at 2am, I heard the same creepy singing. This time, the TV was off. Honestly, the more awake I was getting, the more I was questioning what was actually going on. I realized that I wasn't imagining it. So I've been sat here for four hours now, thinking about how fucking real this is. I even googled it in the hope that it happened to someone else before. I'm so creeped out. Just thinking about that moment. I know that it was there, just in the other room. I feel like I even know what this doll looks like even though I don't have dolls, and I've never seen it. I have no idea what's going on. I'll start by saying that I did not personally witness or experience this. But the story comes from a close family friend whom I consider reputable and honest. Personally, I'm rather skeptical when it comes to most paranormal activity, but I believe this story because of the man who told it. So as a little bit of background, my father was a police officer for 25 years through the 80s and 90s. His best friends were mostly officers growing up. I always met and was around cops. 
some of my father's cop friends were annoying and rude, and some were really squared away nice guys. One in particular was my favorite. I won't use his real name, so I'll just refer to him as Bob. Bob was one of my father's closest friends and beat partner for a long time. He was an older African-American man from New Orleans. He was polite, had great mannerisms, and carried himself confidently. My father used to say he was the most honest cop he ever worked with and had solid integrity and bravery. One night, he and my father worked an off-duty job at a local event, some sort of carnival or fair. I can't remember exactly, but there was a clown there. My father told me the entire night Bob was acting strangely, acting uncomfortable, quiet, and shy. When my father asked him what was wrong, Bob just said, I hate clowns. I always have. My father started poking fun at him for being scared of the clown, and he said that Bob just stared at him with this look that he'd never seen him have before, like he was genuinely afraid. So my father asks why, and this is Bob's story. Bob grew up in New Orleans. When he was a child, his mom took him to stay at his aunt's house for a few weeks. Bob said that he didn't care much for his aunt. She wasn't mean to him, but he always got a strange vibe when he was around her, as though she carried an evil aura with her. His family used to joke that his aunt was involved in voodoo and black magic, but they mostly just said these things in jest. His time at his aunt's was largely uneventful, with the exception of a strange rule she had. He was not allowed into the kitchen. Bob didn't understand why, but he followed it. On some nights, Bob claimed to hear his aunt talking to people in the kitchen at odd hours. In the mornings, he would question his aunt if she had friends over, and she would say that she didn't. His aunt had a thing for dolls. She had them all around the house. He hated them. He said whenever he passed by the cabinets displaying them, he always felt like he was being watched. But she had one doll that she always carried around and protected like it was some kind of treasure. You guessed it, a clown doll. He said his aunt loved this thing, always took it around the house, caring for it like it was a child. He didn't understand why. He said it was ugly and horrible looking and was the most frightening one that she owned. One night, he said that he smelled his aunt baking something sweet and conversing with someone. He got excited and ran into the kitchen without thinking about his aunt's single rule. When he ran in, he saw on the counter the clown doll moving its mouth and speaking to his aunt in a man's voice. The clown turned its head and looked at Bob. His aunt turned around frantically and scolded him out of the kitchen. He said that as his aunt rushed him out of the kitchen, he heard the clown doll laughing. After that night, he never left his room and barely slept. His aunt claimed that he was imagining seeing the clown talk. He never went back after the incident. My father, who's a big time paranormal skeptic, believes Bob. He said that he had never seen Bob's eyes or body language display so much discomfort and fear as he did when he was telling that story and when he looked at the clowns. He looked my dad square in the eyes and said, I know what I saw and I know how it sounds, but I'm telling you that it happened. That doll was alive. Recently, I've been reading some other stories and I was reminded of something that happened to me a while ago. Once a year, my parents go on vacation together somewhere in the United States, usually to the Bahamas or to Florida. 
They leave me in charge of the house with my dog, and they like for me to check in on my Nana, who lives in our basement. Normal, right? There's another important bit of background information. My dad takes part in this weird golfing competition with his friends, where if somebody wins a certain amount of holes, they get to take home this creepy doll as a sort of trophy. I don't know why, but I'm guessing it's some running gag. Well, my dad won the competition, and he brought it home before he left. I'm not at all scared of dolls. In fact, before he left, I slept with it beside me as a joke. It was basically an old baby doll with a missing eye and a brown dress. I don't know the origin of it, and I didn't really bother to ask. November rolls around, and my parents leave for their vacation. Everything goes normal for a little while, but then things start to get really weird. Because I'm the stereotypical little brother, I put the doll on my sister's bed, who's in university, and I took a picture to send it to her, as a joke. She hates dolls. So I leave the room with the doll still in there and head into my room just to send the photo and move on with my life. A few minutes later, I hear a massive bang. I jump, startled, and I go to look into the hallway. The door to my sister's room has slammed shut. Now, our hallway has no opening windows and there wasn't any kind of draft. Even if there had been, that bang sounded forceful. A little on edge, I open her door, and I see that the doll has fallen, face forward, even though I left it sitting upright and slightly back. I thought it was weird, but I brought the doll back into my room and moved on. That night, I'm sleeping normally in my parents' room. I have to sleep in there while my parents are away, because I have to keep an eye on the dog, and she refuses to sleep anywhere else. I wake up suddenly in the night, which is odd for me. I usually sleep all the way through the night. I check the time and I see that it's around 3 a.m. This immediately freaks me out because I read that this is the witching hour, as it were. I glanced over at my dog and she's awake too with her head up, also strange. I put on my little puppy voice and ask the dog if she needs to pee, but she just stares back at me and then looks to the closet. I look to the closet too, and I see that it's open, even though I very much remember shutting it before going to bed. I quickly turn on the lamp and get out of bed to close the door. I don't even bother looking inside. My teenage brain still thinks it's a ghost and that that's far more likely than an intruder. So I get back in bed, scroll on my phone a little bit and finally fall back asleep. I wake up the next morning, as usual, to feed my dog, but when I go into the hallway, I see that my bedroom door is open. I always close my door when I'm not in my room. Now it's still dark out, because I have to feed my dog at around 6am or she throws a fit. I look inside my room, turn on the light, and that doll is on the floor. I left it on my bed. I remembered the last night and now I'm feeling paranoid, but again, I just put the doll back on my bed and left, deciding to just have my door open. After feeding my dog, I went back to sleep an extra couple of hours, and that's when the most frightening thing happened. I was woken up by a loud banging sound, loud enough to wake me, the heaviest sleeper in my family. I quickly got up and ran downstairs, my first thought being that maybe my Nana had fallen in the basement and was banging for me to help her. But when I got downstairs, I realized the banging was coming from the balcony door. I saw the glass shaking as if something was hitting it from outside. The banging was so loud that it was shaking the counters. The strangest part is that my dog was just standing in front of the door, staring at it. And she's the type of dog who will start barking if a mouse farts. I'm really shaken up at this point. It's completely still outside. No wind at all. I text my parents and tell them what's going on. And as soon as I do, 
the banging stops. They tell me it's probably nothing and not to worry about it. I went downstairs to see my Nana, but she had no idea what I was talking about. Then again, she's almost completely deaf, so it didn't surprise me that she couldn't hear it. She can't even walk up the stairs, so there's no way that she was causing any of this. That was the last weird incident that happened. The next week, my parents got back. I didn't tell them everything that happened, because I didn't want them to think I was a chicken or something. Needless to say, I moved the doll out of my room until my dad brought it back to his golf team. Nothing strange happened after that. I still have no idea what went on during those couple of days, but it certainly was strange. I sort of wonder what the story behind that doll is now, but I don't think I really want to know. I don't remember a lot of my childhood, but what I do remember will forever be ingrained in my memory. I was a wee little kid, around five to six years old, and I used to live in a three-story blue house with my mom and dad. We had some birds and black cats as pets, and the house was down the street from the infamous Mummy Museum. I can't remember the name of it since I haven't gone back ever since my mom and I left. I remember on the weekends, if I was asleep early in the morning, my mom would go to the farmer's market and try to make it back before I woke up. This one time, I remember I woke up after she left, and I noticed there was a clown doll standing on its own, looking out the window toward the street. I got up out of bed, put it away in a toy chest-like dresser thing, went to the bathroom, and as I was walking back to bed to turn on the TV, the doll was in the middle of the floor, sitting facing the hallway that leads to the bathroom I had just come out of. That same night, I remember we had one of the nastiest rainstorms, with hail and thunder and lightning. I was able to fall asleep pretty early, even with the sound of thunder rumbling every inch of our house. I can't remember the exact dream I was having, but I remember trying to scream for help and running away from something, and no matter how loud I felt I was screaming in my dream, nobody could hear me. I remember waking up panting, crying, and trying to scream for my mom, but nothing came out. My heart dropped. I cried even more, and as lightning lit up the house, I got a glimpse of the creepy clown doll sitting upright on the living room table with a menacing grin on its face, a grin that it didn't have before. I believe the doll was possessed. I have no recollection of how I got it. I told my cousins, and they said that they had similar experiences with objects in their house. They lived a few houses away from mine, on the same street. I still don't have any explanation for what I encountered with that doll as a kid, but all of us seem to think that it might be connected to that museum. When I was about eight or nine, my entire family went to a quinceanera. I guess we were good enough friends with the birthday girl that we received the quince doll, which is basically meant to look like the birthday girl. To give you an image of what it looked like, imagine a doll with a white dress and curly hair. We kept it in the living room where I slept on the floor, which is another story. And my brothers and I always had some weird feeling about it, like it was watching us. I'd say around three to four months of it being in the living room is when I started to notice weird things happen in not only the living room, but also in both of my brother's rooms. I'll start with my experiences first. Like I mentioned before, I used to sleep in the living room. I would lay down near my parents' door, and I would start to hear the strangest noises coming from near the TV. 
or near the small cabinet that we put the doll on display. From hearing things in the kitchen fall on the floor to hearing a little girl laugh on the couch, a lot of weird things started to happen. I pretty much tried to ignore all of this with tears in my eyes, doing what kids do when they're scared. I covered myself with a blanket. But one experience will forever haunt me, and I still get chills thinking about it. I was crying one night for Lord knows what. My brother tells me it's because I was claiming I heard voices near my ear. My parents didn't believe me and told me that I was delusional. He invited me into his room to sleep, and I jumped at the opportunity. Just before entering his room, I went to the restroom. It's literally right next to my brother's room. While I was in there, I felt someone's hand right on my shoulder. I immediately turn around and get freaked out. I hurried up and got out of there, but that wasn't the worst thing. I entered his room and slept on his bed while he just played on the PS3. I slept from maybe around 20-ish minutes to 30 before waking up to him coming in the room with food. I kid you not, the moment he sat down, the closet door swung open with enough force to hit the wall. We looked at each other in disbelief about what we just saw. My dad bursts in to ask what the hell was going on. We tried explaining it to him, but he just shook it off and told us to go back to sleep. He walked out of the room and my brother continued to play. We were trying our best not to talk about it, when we hear the toilet just flush on its own, along with the shower curtain moving. Mind you, nobody was in there. We would have known, since the door always creaks open and shut with a pretty distinct sound. That room, I'd like to say, is where most of the activity always happened. The guy that we let rent out that room always said he was scared of it, but because he needed a place to stay, he just dealt with it. That was my experience when I was younger. But now, let me tell you about my older brothers. I'll start with the youngest of my older brothers. We'll call him Dave. Dave slept in the room on the other side of the house, completely away from the doll, but with a massive window that had a hole within the curtains. He had things happen in the afternoon, like tools being thrown from one side of the room to the other, the TV falling, and unexplainable scratches on his chest. But the one thing that scared the heck out of me was that he had this dream. In the dream was the girl in the white dress. Let me clarify, not the doll, but a girl. This happened to both of my brothers. The dream started off normally, until he noticed the white-dressed girl at his school and went near her. She turned around and, as he remembers, she didn't have eyes. It was just black holes and she had a sad expression on her face. He woke up to my parents trying to calm him down. I remember being right outside his room, peeking in. He was legit crying his eyes out and I've never seen him act that way before. I have another older brother, we'll call him Mark. I believe that he had the worst of it since he slept not even five feet away from the doll. He also had a dream about the girl in the dress and the doll as well. But his dream wasn't scary, just anxiety inducing in my opinion. All he remembers is sitting at the dinner table. The doll was not too far away from the table. It was right in front of the table if I remember correctly. The girl with the white dress was sitting across from him, with the doll next to her. Apparently the doll was blinking, and the girl was emotionless, not blinking whatsoever. This is when he started to hear a clock tick. It ticked and ticked and ticked, until he suddenly woke up in a cold sweat. But the problem was, when he woke up, the doll wasn't in the cabinet. Instead, it was right in front of him. He screamed and threw it toward the closet, breaking the head of the thing. My mom came in and thought somebody had broke in. She saw the doll with the broken head on the floor. And the creepiest thing was that the doll was upright, with the head right behind it. While she was extremely angry, she was just glad that he was safe, and she threw the doll out. 
That was the end of it, really. A few more things did happen, but nothing as bad as what I just told you about. Needless to say, we're glad the doll is gone. I bought a little porcelain doll at the Salvation Army this past weekend. I used to collect them as a little girl, and it was cheap, so why not? I wanted something to scare the trick-or-treaters that came into work. Since I've had the doll, I've had a horrible time sleeping. My house feels strange, and when I'm up at night and alone, I feel uneasy. I'm sleeping with the covers over my head. Any small sound makes my heart flip, and I can't sleep very well. It reminds me of the terrible nights I had sleeping as a child and being afraid. Even during the day, when I'm alone and getting ready for work, I feel so off in the house. It's been the past few days since I've bought that doll and kept her in the house. Today I brought her into work, and I'm hoping that the strange feelings I have at home will subside. Maybe I'm just being jumpy, since it's Halloween, but I'm 26 and I haven't had these feelings since I was a child. Has anybody else had a similar experience? About a week or so ago, I received an Elmo doll. I was on vacation, visiting a few relatives, and my 90-year-old great-aunt gave me this red Elmo plush. At first, everything was normal about it, nothing out of the ordinary. However, the activity began when I returned back home. I placed the doll on my bed and lied down to sleep for the night. During the night, I began to see shadows moving across my room, and a feeling that I was being watched. Of course, I at first thought I was just imagining things, so I brushed it off. The next night, however, things started to get weird. The number of shadows moving around my room increased, and I felt like there was something standing over me, watching me. I put two and two together and grabbed the doll, my stomach began to feel nauseous. A sense of anxiety filled me when I held the doll, and I felt like a negative energy was being transferred into my body. I immediately removed the doll from my room and placed it in a different area of the house. I told my parents, but they just joke about it and think I'm crazy. But I swear there's something wrong with this doll, and I have no idea how to go about investigating it. I bought a haunted doll on a whim, and it's been an interesting week. Esther, which is what the previous owner said her name was, has been here since Wednesday, and we've already had little things happen. Most notably, if we leave the lights on as we leave the house, they're off by the time we get home. Doors that were closed open just slightly, as though somebody's peeking inside. Doors that were open are closed. Also, I've watched a doorknob turn and a door open twice, when I'm fully awake, standing at my desk at the time. My wife and I will have a lot of conversations along the lines of, Did you come home during the day? Nope, I've been at work all day. Okay, because I know I left the bathroom light on and the door closed, but I came home to the light off and the door open. The bedroom door is open too. This is notable because we always keep our bedroom door closed. We have an old cat that likes to sneak in and do their business under the bed. In my office during the winter, I run a space heater to keep it warmer for the reptiles. I do keep the door ajar so that the cats and dogs can come in and out. 
This morning, I most certainly left the door open as there were three cats and a dog in here sleeping. When I got up, I was asked if I knew that I had trapped three cats and a dog in my office by shutting the door. I said I left the door open before I went back to sleep because I knew they were in there. Oh, well, the door was open when I got up. There's been one instance of, are you humming? What? No. Well, someone's humming. We've also had numerous incidents of a light being turned off that we had left on. And this morning, I woke up to the bedroom ceiling fan being on when it had most certainly been off when I went to sleep. It takes the wall switch and pulling the light chain to have it on, and, well, no lights. And I'm 100% sure that I didn't do that before I went to sleep. Nothing scary, can't say I've ever felt unsettled by any of the above, because I grew up in a house with the ghost of my great-grandmother, and I'm sort of used to things like that. I'm not worried about anything actually scary happening. The woman that we got the doll from was very clear that the spirit attached was pretty much nice, very motherly, which I suppose explains turning off the lights that we leave on. Apparently, it's a middle-aged woman who's really more interested in plants and pets than in causing problems for or scaring or playing tricks on people. The worse she does, according to the lady who sold her, is hum a little random tune and occasionally manifest physically. Or if you have plants in one area of your house, the doll might move to sit near them, which I haven't seen, but like I said, we have heard the humming. That's partially why I settled on that one. Just to err on the side of, I don't want a doll moving around the house, we have dogs that might mistake it for a toy, I put a small succulent garden next to her, and I set her near a window where she can see the garden we have in the yard. Not that it's much of a garden in the middle of winter, but, you know. The most surprising part is that I am completely not creeped out by the doll, and dolls usually leave me feeling very unsettled in general, haunted or not. So far, I think we'll keep her. I grew up in England in what my family referred to as an upside-down house. Basically, the row of houses were built on a hill. So you entered into the upstairs, your hall, living room, dining room, kitchen, and toilet, and then went downstairs for the bedrooms, which opened out onto the garden. The house itself was never comfortable. For context, I would have birthday parties where kids would line up to use the upstairs bathroom instead of daring to use the downstairs one. My mom found a cross necklace in her wardrobe one time. Another time, her work shirt disappeared and she tore about the whole house, only for it to show up at the very front of her wardrobe, all pressed and clean. Another time, I was in the downstairs bathroom and I was just singing nonsense lyrics that I was making up in my head. A male voice sang the next line that I had in my head. I ran to the stairs, sat down halfway up, and all I could hear was his laughter. So yeah, fun house. The doll story, though, still remains the single most terrifying thing that has ever happened to me, paranormal-wise. I honestly can't recall my age, but it was before 10. I had one of those bunk beds with storage underneath. The night before, I had set up a stuffed toy sleepover in my bed. Not relevant, but there you go. I woke up that morning and I didn't immediately open my eyes. I could sense somebody watching me. I finally opened my eyes and I noticed that something felt really off about the line of dolls and toys on the shelf over my wardrobe. It's a long, thin room and this is exactly opposite my bed. One doll's eyes felt different still doll eyes but not not blinking or moving just different i could feel its eyes on me as if it were a human looking at me that's the only way i can describe it i closed my eyes and reopened them 
Nothing changed. I counted to ten mentally. I threw off my covers and practically jumped down the ladder and I just bailed out of there. No matter what I did, I just felt that that one doll was watching me. I turn back to the door as I'm going, and I swear by all things holy, this thing is leaning out over the edge of the shelf to watch me go. I hid in my mom's bed with her, terrified that it would somehow follow me. I cautiously went back in later and stared at it, but it was just a doll again. I took it down and hid it in the back of the wardrobe for who knows how long. I've never been comfortable around dolls since. Whatever was in that house, at least whatever the masculine presence was, really liked to scare me. I visited the street about eight years ago, after having moved out over a decade ago, and that house still gives me the creeps. My mother's friend still lives down the street. She signed up for permanent night shift at her job because she said dark shadows would peer into her windows at night and she'd rather just be gone. She also says that she senses people coming up behind her when she's home alone. So yeah, fun house and fun street. This is an experience that I had almost an entire year ago. My mother is a traveling nurse and she often gets assignments in Alaska and other less populated states. So I usually travel three to four times a year to go see her. This was my first time going to see her in Alaska. She was staying in Fairbanks for three months. While she was at work, I would take her rental car and explore Fairbanks and the neighboring areas and towns. Side note, Alaska is very sparsely populated and towns of just a thousand or more are considered somewhat large. One particular day, I decided to make the long day trip to Denali State Park via Alaska Highway 3, or Parks Highway as it is often called. It's a long, windy stretch of road connecting Fairbanks to the outskirts of Anchorage, Alaska's largest city. Along the highway from Fairbanks to Denali State Park, you pass through three to four towns, the largest of those being Nanana, which only has a population of 365. Once you get out of Fairbanks, it gets really lonely. I remember driving 40 to 50 miles without passing another car you can kind of get mesmerized by the beauty of the landscape and the snowy, icy mountains surrounding you and forget that you're in the middle of nowhere. Quality phone signal is few and far between when you're driving through this area. It was a weekday and off tourist season in Alaska, so most of the vehicles I passed were log trucks or semis and the occasional regular motorist. It was early April, and there was still heavy packed snow on the sides of the roads and in the forest and valley, but the roads were completely clear. From Fairbanks to Denali National Park, it's a four to five hour drive, depending on road conditions. My main goal was to see Mount McKinley, the tallest mountain in North America. I hadn't really researched much of how to see it, and it was harder to see it in April than the summer months. There's a road that leads into the national park where you can see a view of Mount McKinley, but I had passed it not knowing whether the road conditions were good. I had looked on Google Maps and it showed that there was something like a scenic view or overlook that you see on American interstates sometimes. I assumed that you may be able to see Mount McKinley from there. If you go on Google Maps, it is across from Byers Lake Campground. The campground appeared to be closed or desolate, but there were no gates or anything stopping me from entering the area. It was at this point that I completely lost cell reception, and the GPS on my phone wasn't working. As I pulled into the campground area, there was probably 16 to 24 inches of snow on some of the roads there. Some of the roads had been plowed, so I assumed that there had to be people visiting but there wasn't a single car or person in sight. There are a bunch of winding roads that almost resemble a maze, 
and lead to dead ends at this campground. Now, for the entire four plus hours I had been driving, not once did I have any uneasy or bad feelings. When I am usually in desolate areas, especially the desert, I have really bad vibes. But it wasn't like this in Alaska for some reason. That changed about 30 seconds into entering the campground area. Maybe it was the fact that I was turning into some abandoned campground, or the fact that I completely lost cell reception, but something just didn't sit right with me. Nevertheless, I was determined to see Mount McKinley, and I was trying to focus on that and find a good place to take some cool pictures. I drove down these winding roads and hit dead ends, and then suddenly it started to get really cloudy. I was getting more frustrated at not finding an area to take some pictures. And then, I realized that I was lost. It's not far at all from the main highway, but nonetheless, I was lost. I started to get really confused on where exactly I was, and my GPS wasn't working. I started to panic a little. I made my way down this dirt road to the lake, and there was a large opening. My bad feelings went away temporarily, because the view was beautiful. The lake was completely frozen, and behind it in the background was a small snowy mountain. The scene was just something straight out of a National Geographic magazine, so I stepped out to take some pictures. I stood there for a few minutes, just admiring the beauty of the Alaskan wilderness, and I was looking at my pictures to see if they were any good, when I heard this scream in the distance. It was a close scream, but yet it sounded muffled, almost like something was able to control the volume of their voice to make it seem far away, when in reality it was close. My heart started racing as I looked around to try to figure out what it was. Everything in my body was telling me to book it for the car and find a way out, but I just stood there, confused and kind of scared. I felt like I was being watched and all the hairs stood up on my arm. I was wondering if it was a bobcat or a mountain lion, because they are often mistaken for women screaming. I'm aware of this. I looked out on the far side of the lake, and I see this person wearing a light orange jacket and jeans. They had a green beanie on their head. I waved at them, and they waved back immediately. At first I was super relieved, there was somebody else out here with me. But then, this overwhelming feeling of dread and terror entered my body. I was wearing a light orange jacket, jeans, and a green beanie. The person had brown skin like me. I'm half Filipino and half white. I couldn't make out facial features, but I felt like I could see the black hair sticking out from under their beanie, which is the color of my hair. I just stood there for a couple of seconds, frozen in shock and fear. I raised my arm, and the person raised theirs. I waved with my other hand, and they did. I noped right out of there. I hightailed it up to the hill to my car, and basically did a donut in the snow, spinning my tires trying to get out of there. I started panicking, and I was trying to find the exit. I saw a sign that was almost completely covered to the top in snow, but it had an arrow pointing to the left and that was good enough for me. I came out to the first part of the campground. It was a bathroom facility and office and had a veterans memorial statue. There was this white owl just perched on top of it staring at me, with its head just sideways like bending over. I found the way out and sped the entire way back to Fairbanks checking my rearview mirror every 10 seconds. I really don't know what to make of the situation. As I entered civilization, I calmed back down, and I didn't really have any other weird experiences in Alaska or anywhere else since then. I've considered the thought of it being a skinwalker, or an aswang, which is a Filipino shapeshifter in folklore. One of my friends said I probably survived a 411 case, which wouldn't be surprising to me, because there have been many of those in Alaska.
When I was a kid, there was this kid who looked exactly like me. Not just witnessed by me, but by my grandmother as well. My first sighting of her was when I was little, and I was sitting in the car, just staring out the window. I looked up and thought I saw my reflection, so I just shrugged back down in my seat. But then I looked down and noticed that she was wearing a different shirt than I was. My grandmother also told me that she spotted a girl that looks just like me when she's been out. And just as she's about to call my name, she notices that the woman with the girl doesn't look anything like my mom. This didn't happen once I got a little older, but it always gave me the creeps. Maybe I have a doppelganger or something like that. Any thoughts as to what this was, or has this happened to anybody else? This happened to my fiancé, but I was in the other room, and I heard the events unfold. So, he was sleeping on the couch. I was sleeping in our bed off the living room. He passed out out there, so I turned off the lights and let him be. At around 2 to 4 a.m., somewhere in there, I heard him say, What are you doing? What did you say? And then a bang. He was wide awake and claimed that I walked into the living room, across the kitchen, in the nude, and then I walked back across and I was mumbling something weird. He got up to push me a little to see if I was sleepwalking, and that's when I disappeared and he fell into the table, which was the bang I heard. I was in my bed the entire time and I didn't hear anything except for him falling. Also, I was not in the nude. Does anyone know what that could be? I thought maybe he was dreaming, but I heard him talking coherently and then get up and fall, and he claims he was wide awake. I'm definitely freaked out, so if anyone has any answers, let me know. So, when I was about 13 or 14, I went camping with my father, my uncle, and my cousin. It was in a faraway place from home, and it was near a small fall that turned into a little river. Note that this was in Brazil, so we were camping in the deep depths of the rainforest. Very dark. After we had dinner, we put down the fire and went to sleep. It was my first time camping, so I was uncomfortable with all the forest noises and everything. After a good 30 or 40 minutes of trying to get to sleep, I realized that I wasn't hearing any noises anymore. It was completely silent, and my dad and relatives were sleeping. I was frightened because of the silence, so I stepped outside the tent to take a look outside with my flashlight, and then something kind of reflected the light. I was so scared that I went inside the tent again to find my dad and my relatives all wake up and ask if I saw something. I said that something reflected the light, and everyone stepped outside to see. When everybody was outside, we saw three gigantic figures, about seven feet high, fully covered in white clothes, gloves, and boots, and their faces were covered with something that looked like black nets. They had very long arms to the point of almost reaching the ground, and had a strange blue aura all over them that looked like fog. They made weird sounds as they were speaking with each other, at least I assume that's what they were doing, and then proceeded to just walk into the woods again. Everybody was so afraid that we just packed up and left that same night. I remember this like it was yesterday, and even now I am afraid to go camping again, I never want to have the possibility of encountering those things again. Also, I'm 25 years old now, so no, it wasn't drones. My house was being renovated to be sold and in the meantime, my mother rented a house nearby my high school. The house was a white weatherboard house, had terrible carpet, 
seemed to always have slugs and just felt old. I'm not certain if the house was haunted, but I had some experiences that I didn't otherwise experience prior moving into this rental. Before proceeding, I should mention that I do sporadically experience sleep paralysis, and I have sleptwalked once that I know of. But for now, I want to tell you about the doppelganger at the rental. One evening, I was in the bathroom straightening my hair. I left the bathroom to make my way down the hallway to the lounge room. Between the lounge room and the bathroom is a kitchen on the right-hand side. When I passed the kitchen, I saw my sister, about 10 years old, standing just behind the boundary of where the kitchen meets the hallway. She was standing in the dark and looked a bit off-color, almost gray, and her face wasn't even visible even though she was standing immediately in front of me. I asked her what she was doing just standing in the dark. I got no response, even after calling out her name. I didn't think much of it, but I do recall seeing her blue dress as extra vibrant and the kitchen as impossibly dark. I shrugged my shoulders and thought it was weird and walked down the hall into the lounge room. As I was walking into the brightly lit lounge room, my sister was on the couch, jumping up and down. It took me a whole five seconds to realize what just happened. I was not talking to my sister in the kitchen. There's no way that my sister was just in the kitchen, ran past me down the hall without me seeing her in ten seconds, and then proceeded to jump on the couch all before I entered the room. I was in shock, but I asked my sister how she got to the couch so quickly. She seemed genuinely confused, and said she'd been on the couch the whole time. The other experience was the girl by the door. This experience may possibly have been sleep paralysis. I'm not certain why, but I was sleeping next to my mom this evening, on the left-hand side. I guess I always felt uneasy in the rental. Anyway, on this evening I was fast asleep, and I had an unusual dream. In the dream, the bedroom door was open, and standing in the dark of the hallway was a girl with dark shoulder-length hair and a white dress. The girl met my gaze and stared at me with an expressionless face. She took a step toward the bedroom door, and as she took a step, ended back where she started. Imagine a scene replaying of a person walking toward you, but it's like they're on a treadmill. That scene just starts over and keeps replaying but on every single replay, the person gets closer. It's like the looped video gets closer to you. I was paralyzed with fear, and I could only watch as each time she took a step, she would end up back where she started, yet with each step, she got closer to the bedroom. This continued until she was in the room, and then her movement changed. She started to move toward me, and she appeared to be darting back and forth, frantically inching closer. Her expression changed with her eyes wide, and she stood beside me. She glared at me and abruptly grabbed me. That's when I woke up. It had been a dream. I looked over to the bedroom door in relief. It was closed. But not too soon after, fully awake this time, the door opens and the girl is there again. There in the hallway. She immediately starts darting back and forward and lunges at me. I wake up again? I look at the door and this time she's in the room already and darts straight toward me and lunges at me again. I wake up yet again and straight away she darts and lunges. This happens about six times, each time moving closer, each time being more frantic and aggressive. The last time I finally woke up for real and I sat up in the position as if I was grabbed and woke up during the attack. My breathing was heavy, and my mom, who woke up, said that I was having a nightmare. These two experiences make me believe that the rental had something freaky going on. And, possibly, the girl by the door and the doppelganger are the same entity. Anyone else experienced something similar to that? Do we think it's sleep paralysis? I reckon the dream of the girl was, but the doppelganger is harder to rationalize. I consider myself neutral on the topic of the paranormal, 
I think most encounters could probably be explained logically, whether it be uncommon occurrences, mental health disorders, or something of the sort. But I had an experience as a child that has opened me to the idea that there are paranormal events that are real. I remember it vividly because the event shook me up so much. It's not that intense of an experience, but it was very real, and I remember it clearly, despite it happening well over a decade ago. I was sleeping in my room, and I awoke to find a figure in my door. My room had a street light right outside the window, and the curtains didn't block out all the light. It was lit enough to clearly see the silhouette of someone in my doorway, but not lit enough to see the details. I figured it was my mom. At least the silhouette looked like her. Being confused as to why she would just be standing there, I called out to her. There was no response. But before I could call out again, the figure turned and started to walk down the hall. Again, it's light enough for me to see that a figure is turning and walking naturally down the hall, just not enough to see details of clothing, face, skin, etc. I got up and ran after her. No reason for it, probably, just a groggy, panicky reaction. As I reached the figure in the hallway, I went to put my hands on its shoulders, and it vanished. Like, literally vanished before my eyes. I only froze for about a second before I bolted to my mom's room and slept in her bed with her the rest of the night. We've gone over the event. A common explanation is that I was dreaming, but I remember clearly being in the hallway, lucid as everything happened. I also did wake up in my mom's bed, and she confirmed that she remembers me entering, panicked. My mom has a ton of stories that give me goosebumps and are crazy scary. In one of her recurring nightmares, she has a doppelganger that haunts her, and I'm wondering if that's who I saw. About three weeks ago now, I got this doll from this antique store that I was at with my boyfriend. The doll was sitting in a rocking chair, and it caught my eye. I brought the doll to my best friend's house, and his girlfriend refused to look at the doll. She hated being in the same room as it. My best friend and I started playing with the spirit box, and nothing that creepy spawned out of it. The past week or so has been slightly weird, though. The doll's legs seem to cross on their own. I uncross them, and they always end up crossed again. Now, paintings keep falling down near the doll. My paintings are canvas paintings, and not on paper, so I hang them up over pushpins. The pushpins themselves completely fall out of the wall. Today, an extremely small painting was just off one pushpin, and it was just crooked. My paintings have been hung up on my wall for a year now, and not once have they ever behaved like this. It could all be a coincidence, sure, but I don't know. It's kind of creeping me out. I'm starting to wonder if that doll really is haunted. When I was around 13 or 14 years old, my great-grandmother used to collect dolls. One of the dolls I took a particular liking to, because of how creepy it was. She picked up on it and actually gave it to me not too long before she passed away. Fast forward to the story at hand. My two stepbrothers and I were sitting in the living room, chatting late at night, around 1am or so. For context, this is a cookie-cutter house. So when you walk in, you basically have to choose between going upstairs or downstairs. The living room is directly upstairs from the front door. There's a fireplace on the left-hand wall, but not much else to note since it was an open concept. Adjacent to the wall, there was the railing overlooking the doorway area, and in front of the railing is a couch. There's also a television sitting on the ground on the wall opposite the couch. During our conversation, we got on the topic of childhood paranormal experiences. Joking around, I went and grabbed the doll from my bedroom, 
and leaned it up on the shelf above the fireplace. I made sure that when I put the doll up there, it was leaning securely so as not to slip off. Some things that are important to note. The television was on, but just in the no signal screen. And because we were preparing to move, there were boxes and trash bags piled up in front of the fireplace, at least three to five feet out. We were all sitting on the couch at this time. In the middle of a story that my younger stepbrother was telling about an experience he'd had in the basement of a childhood home, the doll was flung forward from the shelf, landing a good few feet away from the boxes, meaning that it had to fly a good six to eight feet from the fireplace. At the exact time that the doll made contact with the ground, the television shut itself off and then turned back on. We have never had any electrical issues in that house or with that TV. I know people are going to say that it's possible the doll just fell, but the doll didn't fall. It flew forward off the shelf, even though it had been leaning backwards. And things that fall don't typically fall seven feet to eight feet out. They fall down. So, I don't know but I think we might have a haunted doll on our hands. A few years ago, I was part of a local paranormal investigation team. On one investigation, the client had several dolls among her possessions, many of which were in a display case in the living room. Upon arrival, we were doing a walkthrough to determine the hot spots for us to check out, decide camera placement, and get some basic background information. While in the living room, the client invited us to check out a few specific dolls from the case that held particular interest to her. Three dolls were taken out of the case and looked at by a few of our team members. The one that caught my attention the most was wearing a dress and a cape, had beautiful curly hair, and was about six inches tall. When I was done checking the doll out, I handed it back to the client to be returned to the case. After the normal settling that takes place after the doll was back in its spot, the case was closed. I started to turn away from it. Two other team members and the client witnessed the next thing that happened. The doll reached out toward me, as though it wanted me to pick it back up. I almost ran out of the house, but I reminded myself that I was there to help determine what was going on in the house. Some things were debunked as normal. Other things were determined to be paranormal or unexplained. But that doll freaked me out. I've had a haunted doll ever since I was a kid, and I just found out. I'm writing this as she's sitting next to me, so that I can make sure she's okay with the post. But when I was little, like six or seven, my great grandma died. I hadn't known, but she had willed me a vintage doll that she owned. It was a pretty doll with brown hair and bright blue eyes that she had crocheted a beautiful dress for. But as a little girl, she scared me, and she was put in a keepsake dresser with other things that reminded me of her. Go forward to just after my birthday this year. It's been quite a while since the doll came into my possession, and I have come into contact with a family of ghosts. I have also converted to Wicca and specialize in divination. I felt a pull toward the keepsake chest, but my altar was on top, so I didn't think much of it. When I finally decided to check yesterday, I found the doll that I had forgotten about. I felt that strong pull again. Her energy wasn't like my great-grandma's, but it wasn't negative. It felt like she wanted to talk to me and get my attention. To make a long story a little shorter, I used EVP to communicate, but she didn't like that. So then I used a Ouija board, which got me a little further. Finally, automatic writing got me the furthest. 
I learned the most from the writing session, which I kept a record of on my computer. I got her name and age, as well as the year of death. Her name is Catherine, but she goes by Kathy. I felt sleepy, and I took a nap with her at the foot of my bed. When I woke up, she was in my arms. I also had a strange dream about her while I napped. So I sat around for a bit, and every time I left the room, she would move a little bit from where she was before. Mostly it was just her arms or eyes, which do blink. I brought it up to a medium friend of mine, the one who had helped me with the ghost family. She explained some things to me, and when I asked Kathy to give me a sign, the fire alarm went off, and my desk lamp's metal cover looked burned. My stepmom blamed it on the candle on my nightstand, but it wasn't lit at the time. While my sister and I talked in the hall, I peeked my head back in a few times, and she kept on moving. We decided to bring her into my sister's room. I told her how Kathy wanted her hair unmatted and wanted me to sew her an orange and lemon dress. My sister unmatted her hair and I'm getting the thread in the fabric later today. We got distracted once more and I made cookies, but every time that we would check on Kathy, she would move again. When I went to bed last night, I just kept her in my arms because I knew she would end up there anyway no matter where I put her. No weird dreams that I remember last night. For now, anyway. I have had dolls my entire life. Baby dolls, porcelain dolls, Barbie dolls. I like them just fine. My dad fears them, and as kids, my sister and I would joke about it with him, since my great-grandmother's house is filled with all kinds of dolls and porcelain statues. But in recent years, especially right now, something feels off. My sister recently moved in with us due to her being unhappy living with my biological mother. She is in high school and naturally grew out of wanting her American Girl doll. I would say that I am now the proud owner of two. Except, here's the thing. The home that my sister was in was charged with so much negative intense energy. I know she didn't mean to bring any negative spirits into our home, and I don't blame her for this. I love my sister very much, and it was kind of her to give me her Josephina doll along with the little things and clothing that came with her. It is a beautiful, well taken care of doll, but I can feel something is very wrong with this doll. Even as I am sitting here telling this story, I feel like something is watching me, something very bad and unwelcome in my parents' home. I am fearing the worst, but I'm not crying for help, nor do I need it, because I feel like I should try to assess the situation myself before I decide to involve others with this dark energy that seems to radiate off the doll. Right now, it is very strong. I am afraid to go near the shelf she is sitting on at the moment. When I first got her, I changed her outfit and felt this very sad energy. The doll even looks sad, like it witnessed something truly awful and heartbreaking. Now it feels evil and insidious, I never have gotten this feeling from any other doll I've ever received as a gift in my entire life. I am an adult and really shouldn't be acting like a scared child, but this is terrifying. I feel uneasy and an overwhelming sense of dread, but I do not feel like I need to relocate at the moment since I feel like I'm strong enough to fight whatever this thing may be. I need to protect my family and I will do it, but I have no option but to do this for myself. I hate running from things like this, so I won't do it this time. At the same time, I don't know or possess the ability to cleanse the doll. I don't trust online sources for these types of situations. Many things will mislead you. I don't like the idea of putting the doll away because I don't want my sister to feel sad. But at the same time, I don't want to tell her the reason so that she doesn't think I'm crazy. My stepmom is spiritual, but even she would think that I was just overreacting and acting like a scared child. 
My dad would probably agree with me, but that's just because he's afraid of dolls in general. He's not really into the spiritual side of it, nor does he give it much thought like I do. It's probably for the best, too. I don't know. Maybe my stepmom would believe me, but say that I'm overreacting for fear of manifesting in the fear even more. She's wise like that, but she's also turning a blind eye and that solves nothing. I think I know who gave it this bad energy too. I won't refer to them because they're just that bad and they give off the worst energy. I respect people in general, but this person in my life as well as my sisters is a truly evil being and I can't forgive them. The doll has a story and not a happy one either. And that's just the beginning of things. I keep seeing shadows of a man out of the corner of my eye, regardless of the time of day or night. I went downstairs to get some water when I saw it very clearly this time. The resemblance it took was from this exact toxic person that I mentioned. The same shadow, the same figure, shape, and height. I almost dropped my cup. I'm contemplating on telling a close friend of mine, but I also refuse to burden them with something as silly sounding as this. I hope these occurrences stop and I can put it out of my mind. I'm wearing a rose quartz bracelet that has other stones that I unfortunately don't remember the names of, but it does protect me to an extent. I know it might sound silly, but the bracelet was made by very good people, and their energy shines through this bracelet. I hope it helps me fend off whatever this is, and that I can tell it to leave me alone before I have to act upon it and drive it away forcefully myself. I'm not afraid to do anything that I need to do to protect my parents and sister. I know some people will say, it's just a doll, it's harmless, but I thought that too, but I think I was very mistaken. I hope that nothing like this ever happens to any of you. It's a very painful and draining thing to go through. I was really young when this happened. I don't even think I'd started going to school yet. I don't remember much about that stage of my life but I still think about this experience to this day. It was near Christmas and there was a doll that my younger sister and I looked forward to playing with every year. It was an angel where if you pressed a button she would sing Silent Night. The thing is though, once I was done playing with it, I had to return it downstairs. My parents eventually realized that we had forgotten to bring it down so I was sent upstairs alone to retrieve it. As I went up to my room to get it, I heard the doll sing Silent Night. The doll had a history of going off on its own, so I thought nothing of it. I went up and opened the door. My room was completely dark at the time, but when the light from the hallway came on, it shined on the pitch black figure of a little girl who was playing with the doll. The girl immediately turned her eyes on me, and I stared back at her, shocked. My vision blurred, and my ears were ringing, and the next thing I knew, I had to pick myself up from the ground. Nobody seemed to notice that I hadn't come back downstairs. Confused and unable to comprehend what had happened, I would just go downstairs with the doll, seeing as the girl had left. I returned the doll and carried on with my day because I had no idea what had happened. It wasn't until I looked back on it when I was older that I realized just how terrifying that was. This is my story about a haunted doll named Claire. She's been featured in the book Haunted Objects, Stories of Ghosts on Your Shelves, on a couple of paranormal podcasts, and the TV show Haunted Towns that aired on Destination America back in 2017. 
You can still catch reruns of the show on Travel Channel every now and then. She was in the season finale, featuring McDonough, Georgia. Here's my story. As an eight-year-old child, I was given an old porcelain doll by a very dear family friend, Miss Marion. She was all the time coming across things and giving them to me. This doll was the last thing she gave me. I was never really into dolls at all growing up, but I took the doll and placed her in my room in a small, child-sized rocking chair. The chair sat next to my closet and dresser, right beside my nightlight. The doll was very pretty. She was dressed in a peach and cream colored dress with an apron and petticoats. She had little black Mary Jane shoes that, when removed, showed her delicately painted toenails. Her body was soft. Only her head, forearms, hands, and legs from the knee down were porcelain. Her lips were pink, and her dark brown hair hung in slightly frizzed and now loose curls. Her eyes were brown, her cheeks were a rosy peach color, all like mine. Miss Marion made a point of saying that the doll reminded her of me, which is why she gave her to me. From the moment that that doll, which I named Claire, came into my house, things began to happen. I was always uneasy with Claire. I never wanted to touch her, and when I played in my room, it was as if she watched me. It wasn't anything to panic about, but I do remember feeling like if I did something wrong, she might actually tell on me. How ridiculous does that sound? My first real occurrence that I remember was when I was reading in my room, ghost stories actually, when a musical carousel horse that sat on my dresser began to play. Not just a couple of notes like old mechanical music boxes will do from time to time, but like somebody just wound it up fully. I sat stunned and stared at the little horse as it moved up and down in time with the music. Then it just stopped. It didn't wind down, it just stopped. I was a pretty brave kid. I didn't run and I didn't tell my mom. I used to see a shadow man in the hallway or in my parents' bedroom door all growing up. And if she didn't believe me about that, she wouldn't believe me about something as mundane as a music box playing on its own so I just let it go. The next thing that happened was the voice. For several nights, and on into these years, I was awoken by what sounded like a woman, inches from my face, shouting my name. Jill, wake up. I would jump up and sit up to find my room empty. Those happenings died down after a few months. She then started to plague my little brother with the same thing. And now that he and I are grown and gone, she's moved on to my dad. The little things started to get to me. I'd put something in a certain place, only to find it later on on the floor or on my dresser, right next to Claire. All of my missing items eventually turned up around her. Once, a ring ended up in the pocket of her apron. Books would fall off my shelves and a perfume smell would sometimes fill my room. The doll itself didn't smell at all, but the air around her would. My catalyst to finally getting Claire out of my room was the night I woke up after hearing thumping around in my closet. I opened my eyes, sat up in bed, and of course my eyes were drawn to the nightlight where Claire sat. I realized that it wasn't coming from in the closet, but near it. As I watched, the source of the thumping became clear. The rocking chair that Claire occupied was rocking on its own. I had thick shag carpet, so there was no way this thing was just rocking by chance. If that wasn't enough, Claire's feet, which were both turned to the side facing opposite each other, slowly straightened themselves to both be pointing directly up. 20 years later, this part still freaks me out. Then she turned her head, which was quite impossible to do since it was attached, fixed to her cloth body. She looked toward me and every music box in my room, 
four of them, to be exact, started to play all at once. I was frozen with fear. I didn't feel endangered so much as I just felt scared of what was happening. I screamed for my mom and dad. The music stopped, but Claire maintained her gaze in my direction. And this is why I hate dolls. Even after that, I couldn't get rid of Claire totally. I ended up stuffing her in a box in the back of a storage closet. She's still there as far as I know. So is the woman who now screams my dad's name in the middle of the night. While I think she explains some of the oddities that happen in my parents' house, I don't think she's the tie to all of it, especially the shadow man. My friend Tim Weisberg is a paranormal radio and podcast host of the show Spooky South Coast, and also is an author. He asked me to lend him Claire once. He heard my story back in 2011. I obliged and Claire went to stay with him for a few months. He wrote about his experiences with Claire while she stayed with him in the book Haunted Objects that I mentioned earlier. Temperature changes in the room that she stayed in, along with hearing voices, were two of his noted encounters. Claire also stayed briefly at the Lizzie Borden Bed and Breakfast in 2012. The guys from the Haunted Towns show encountered some things in my parents' house while Claire was with them. So, I know this is really weird, but I have always been obsessed with the idea of having a haunted item. So I went on eBay, and I did a very thorough search of trusted sellers and stores where I might buy haunted items. I eventually settled on my doll Evelyn, because the seller stated that the vessel was inhabited by the spirit of Evelyn, who died at age 17, and had hopes of going to college and being a teacher. I felt a connection to her there, because I am currently a senior at university and I'm about to start working as an English teacher. I hope to read to Evelyn often and ask her advice for my lesson plans. I even fantasize about giving her a place in the classroom to sit so she can still achieve her dreams. Update. So the first day and night with Evelyn and I only have a couple of out of the ordinary things to report. First off, my cat won't stop rubbing against the doll or sniffing it. And secondly, I fell asleep last night with my TV on, watching South Park on Hulu, which means that my DVD player was also on. I woke up at 1am to both of those things being shut off. Now I know that there's probably a logical explanation for that, but honestly, I'm kind of hoping it's just her. Update night two. Nothing happened last night that I know of, except that I woke up at 2am for no reason but that's becoming typical for me anyway. Today, as I was getting ready for class, I turned on a paranormal story time on YouTube. Right after, my door that had been shut opened by itself about a quarter of the way. My cat and I both shot our heads to the door when that happened to look. And I know y'all will probably say I'm stupid for this, but I used the Ghost Radar app, and it said that there was an entity right in the direction of where my door is. I'll let you know if there are any further updates. When I was younger, between the ages of 7 to 10, I lived in a small house in Missouri. We lived in a small town. Nothing was abnormal about the house. I mean, there were the normal house settling noises which would cause me to have nightmares frequently, but nothing else. Until this incident, the only weird thing that had ever happened was our keys had gone missing. When you walked in the door, there was a giant metal wood stove that we would put our keys on. They went missing for weeks. We destroyed the house looking for them. And one day, they just reappeared, and nobody knew where they came from. 
Anyway, there was a doll back when I was younger called an Amazing Grace doll. She had holes in her ears so that she could hear you, and she would turn her head to wherever the noise had come from and would say, Mama. Well, I loved this doll. I explicitly remember cleaning my room and propping Grace against the wall so she was sitting up. I laid down on my bed to read, and I heard the clicking she would make when her head turned. So I looked up and stared at her and got the normal mama that she would say after she heard something. So I tossed my book down and picked her up to make sure that she was turned off. She was. So I flipped her switch and then flipped it back to off, thinking that this was just a normal malfunction. I sit her back in her spot and plop down to continue reading. It's completely quiet. As soon as I start reading, I hear the sound of her head moving again and she says, Mama. So I went and took out all of her batteries. I was over it at this point, so I just kind of tossed her on the ground and got back into my spot. That's when she started clicking quicker. Her head was moving back and forth, back and forth, and she just kept saying, Mama, Mama. I took off. I ran to get my dad, and he saw it and decided that we would burn the little doll. We did, and nothing happened again to my recollection, but my nightmares got worse. This was when I was still religious, so I would put all my stuffed animals around me in a circle to protect me. I had a turquoise dream catcher, and I would pray every night for the nightmares to go away. They never did, until we moved. They weren't every day, but definitely several times a week. Regardless, I was very glad to get out of that house and away from that doll. This happened when I was in the fourth grade, during Christmas time, around 2014. I live in Salem, Oregon, which is relevant to the story. In downtown, there's this antique store called the Unicorn. We went there to get my older brother World War II stuff for Christmas, because he likes that kind of thing. It's a really big store for an antique shop, so like normal kids, my brother and I went off to explore. Around the front of the shop, past a couple of bookcases, was this kids' section. It was mostly full, with old board games and those tin toys, like those red geese with blue hats. What I did find was this old doll with a sticker on its face, just all dirty and broken. It said, Cursed Doll, on this piece of paper, with a warning sign at the bottom. I don't really remember what the warning sign said. Being ten years old, I just looked at it and called Bull, and then flicked the glass and told the doll that it needed Jesus. Later that night, I went to sleep and had a dream of a green face in a dark background that kept trying to eat me. I woke up all gross and sweaty, but I realized that the bathroom light was on. My room is connected to the bathroom, so it's not outside my room in the hallway like in most people's houses. So when I woke up, I could clearly see the light reflecting off my wall. I could hear the light switch being turned on and off, but the light was still on. Eventually the light turned off, but the switch kept on flicking. Then the banging on my wall happened, and it lasted for a good two minutes. It just kept getting louder and louder. And then all I remember is not being able to breathe and passing out. When I woke up the next morning, I asked my brother why he kept banging on my wall. He said that he was at a friend's house last night, so he couldn't have banged on the wall. That scared the crap out of me. I told my dad what happened, and he believes that I pissed off whatever possessed that doll or made it cursed. I don't really mess with that stuff anymore, but cool story, I guess.
My uncle was such a sweet guy that for my 18th birthday, he gifted me with a creepy but adorable porcelain clown sitting on a swing. It had two red dots on the cheeks, a red nose, a frilly costume, and white gloves. It had a pointed hat and brown curly hair. What he didn't know was that I had an extreme fear of clowns, and I still do. I accepted it anyway, because it was such a sweet gift. I hung it up on my curtain rod, kind of proud that he had even thought of me at all, because it was rare that he gave me presents. The first week was fine, but after that, weird things began to happen. I started to grow creeped out by this doll to the point where I wouldn't even get dressed in my own room. There were a few times where it would swing on its own. I never opened my window, so I know that it wasn't the wind, and it wouldn't have been able to swing without some sort of force. Several times I would walk out of the room and come back in to find that the head had twisted to look outside my door. For a long time, I thought it was my family members playing a joke on me because they knew that I didn't like clowns, so I just grinned and put up with it. I also locked my door from the inside with one of those bolt locks, just in case. I did this for a couple of months. One morning, it was taken too far, and it was the last straw for me. I woke up and hit something with my hand. I turned my head to come face to face with the clown doll. I looked at the curtain rod, but it definitely was not there. The only way it could have been brought down was if you lifted the rod and took the doll off by the swing ring. I know for a fact that my family didn't do it, because my bedroom door was still bolted shut. I had had enough, and I took the doll and threw it in the big bin, and then put it on the verge for the bin man to come that day. I told my uncle that I had accidentally broken it when I was putting it away to paint my room. I actually regret doing that. I kind of wish I had kept it. I was creeped out by stuff like that when I was younger, but now I love haunted stuff and creepy things. I kind of wish I had it hanging in my house. We have this toy that has a dozen different phrases. I'm home alone, and it says, I can see you, not once, but twice, in about 10 minutes or so. I don't know all the phrases that it's programmed to say, so I can't say that that's not one of them, but I do know that nothing was touching it, so there was zero reason for it to go off. It's pretty new, so I also doubt that it's failing batteries. But even if that was the case, why hasn't it been making other sounds? Also, I can see you is about the creepiest phrase I can imagine, especially when it happens twice in about 10 minutes without anything being near it to set it off. I have no idea what to do with this thing. Ever since I was five years old, I've had an extreme fear of dolls. I am terrified of them. Now, I know that there are a lot of people who are, but when I reached the age of about 16, my mother finally told me where my fear may have come from. It's from a personal experience. To this day, I can never fully answer whether I believe in the paranormal or not. But my personal experience with a doll, given to me by an aunt who practiced black magic, haunts me until this day. When my mom told me this tale, I had minor flashbacks of the feeling that I had with this specific doll. From the first day I was born, I never slept properly. Never did, never have, and probably never will. I didn't cry or anything when I was awake early. I would just quietly play with my hands and wait for my mom to come get me. I did this from when I was an infant until I was a toddler. 
Around age five, we had an aunt from my biological father's side visit us. Now, keep in mind that I have nothing to do with my biological father, and this aunt may have wished my mother harm. Fijians from that generation are typically very superstitious, and many of them believe in black magic. The things I began to do made us believe that there was something very wrong with this porcelain doll that she had given me as a gift. My mom began to notice that I would spend a lot of time with the doll. My younger brother, who would have been around one to two years old at that time, spent a lot of time with my mom. I was a very jealous child when he was first born, so at first, she wasn't too surprised that I spent my time away from them. One morning, she came to my bedroom and was surprised that I wasn't there. Like I said before, no matter what time I was awake at, I never got up without her. We had a basement that my brother and I were strictly forbidden from opening and going into, because the stairs were spaced quite far apart, and being small, we could easily have fallen through or down onto the concrete. She had a lock put up on the high door, just in case. Besides that, the basement was freaky as hell, and I never even wanted to go in there alone. Ever. This particular morning, along with noticing that I was not in my usual place waiting for her, she noticed that this freakish doll wasn't there either. Before she called out my name, she heard me sniveling downstairs. As she climbed the stairs down toward me, she saw that doll sitting on the couch. She heard my crying get louder. As she got closer, she saw that I was trying to open the basement door lock while crying. Sharissa, what the heck are you doing? Didn't I tell you to never go down there without me? I started screaming and crying and ran to bury my face in her dress with relief. Such relief that she was there to stop me. I kept telling her, Mommy, the doll made me, the doll made me, through my tears. I have no idea what this doll's name is anymore, but I apparently was saying the name of the doll instead of the doll. My mom, who is not a believer, was thoroughly creeped out because she said that my tears and hysterical crying were not that of a child trying to find an excuse for getting caught doing something bad, but actual relief of being saved. She packed me up and we were off to my grandma's house, without the doll. We got rid of that doll stat. I know that this is a hard story to believe for anybody. I probably would have just played it off as me being a child and trying to blame the doll for getting caught. But I know that I never dared to get up without my mom because I was scared to get up by myself and I liked the attention of her coming to get me out of bed every morning. I also have very creepy memories of some things about that doll that I'm still too scared to even think about let alone write down. My dad died when I was 11. Every summer we went to a little town which has a porcelain doll museum. I loved going there, hanging out with my dad, and I have several dolls myself, but the one that I loved the most resembled an Indian girl with two braids. I kept it on a shelf that was facing my bed, pushed into the corner of it. I had it for like three to four years. I didn't touch it, not even once. I just admired it. As I mentioned, my dad died in December. Fast forward half a year later, it's June, summer holidays, and I'm laying on my bed with my laptop, chatting with my friend at midnight. Both my door and window were open, but it was quiet outside. No wind, nothing. And the doll suddenly fell to the floor. I was startled by the noise, but confused, since it didn't shatter. The shelf was nearly two meters high, I think. So I turned off the lights, covered myself in a blanket, and went to sleep, hoping that I could. The next morning, the doll was still on the ground, 
face down, and I started to think, how could it fall? It was protected from wind, even though there was none, and there was a 40 centimeter empty space in front of it. I got up, shaking, and slowly approached it. I sat on the floor and picked it up. The doll was intact, except for one thing. The left braid was cut in half. Not torn, cut. I quickly put it away, and I never touched it again, nor have I even looked at it. I still don't really know what happened. I tried to think that it was my dad to comfort myself, but as I grew older, that doesn't seem logical. Why would my dad, who loved me the most, try to hurt my favorite doll that he gave me? I've always had a life filled with paranormal events, or so my religious mother tells me. Much of those I don't remember personally, but I don't doubt her. That and, well, the stories she tells me aren't evil paranormal, just casualties and me seeing my grandpa and uncle around when they had long been dead. But it was a nice encounter, according to her. The only thing I personally remember, and I still have the image of it stamped into my memory, is this one. So to this day, I have full baskets of plushies, dolls, and signature action figures from way back when my younger brother and I were obsessed with collecting and playing with them. I also used to have a gray dog. I don't remember the breed, but he was around the house a lot and his name was Hobbs. Our goal was to have our cast of characters. Funny enough, we made up our characters and completely dismissed the physical appearance of the toy, often referring to dinosaurs as Sonic characters, for example. The room was always messy, because we would spend literal hours just moving the toys around and doing voices for them. We moved all around the room in doing so, and time flew by. We never cleaned our room that same day. One day after a play session, we were told to clean up after the mess we had done the other day, and so we did. I crouched to see below the bed, and midway through, something moved. I swear on my life, I saw this thing sliver around, like if it was my dog, Hobbs, crawling out from under the bed. Instinctively, I greeted him and waited for him to come out, as he normally would, but he didn't. I quickly ducked further to see what was going on, and I found that what had moved was a plushy toy. I couldn't speak for a moment, and I just glared at my brother across the room, hoping that he had somehow seen it. He heard me say the name of our dog and was equally surprised that the dog was in the room as we would often close the door. Being the older brother, I didn't want to scream and run out of the room in horror, because I knew that that would really set the alarm off for my brother. He was really sensitive to the paranormal, and he never coped with it well. So I just told him to get out with me, and we played some Wii afterward. I didn't pick up this gray plush until the night time. This is a little bit blurry, though. I think he may have picked it up because I don't remember confronting what I saw myself. I still vividly remember how it moved, simply slithering forward by thumbing itself side to side, just like a dog would. It was the villain from the first Kung Fu Panda movie, so his back, the side I saw, was spotted and gray and looked exactly like my dog's paws. I swear he moved, and I even went to confess it to my brother once we were way, way older, past the point of minding that we no longer had an option for a plushie to play with. He believes me, but simply because I'm honest. I feel that he doesn't really measure what I saw. Remember how I talked about my mother speaking to me about how I saw dead relatives? It turns out that she had a brother that died at age two due to heart complications. She told me this many years after we had stopped playing with dolls. 
To keep it simple, what happened was that another mess was made in my room, but my mother wanted me to pick up things as fast as possible because guests were coming, and for some reason they wanted to come and check me in my room. At this time I was two years old, so my brother hadn't been born yet. It was just me playing. She said that I did so, so she left the room, and when she came back, she saw me with a much worse mess than before. She got mad and asked why on earth I would just undo what I'd been doing for an hour. I had told her that Uncle Raphael had arrived to play with me, that same uncle that died at the age that I was, that my mother hadn't even mentioned to me yet. She still hasn't come up with an idea of how I could just know his name out of thin air, so she truly believes that I saw a kind, gentle infant spirit who knew who I was and just wanted to play. The phrasing of it kind of scares the crap out of me now, especially after I connected it with the events of that plushy moving. I do feel like it was probably him again, because it was the last time I ever saw my toys moving. Nothing ever came of it, because, like I said, he was a kind ghost. I didn't have nightmares or troubles picking up plushies or playing with them or sleeping in the same room where it was. The plushie is still lying around, somewhere in my brother's room, in his closet. But he's never told me or my mom about having any trouble sleeping in there. Had it been a malicious spirit, I think things would have been different. I'm pretty sure that this was just my uncle. And each day that passes, I wonder if he's really still with us. Being more cautious, now that I can spot and react accordingly to the paranormal. When I was younger, my church took a bunch of us kids to Toys R Us. They gave us a budget and we could buy whatever we wanted for Christmas. When we went, we all ran around with our parents and chose the toys that we wanted. I got a Barbie set with clothes and a car. I also got a Polly Pocket closet and a few of the dolls. I got a few board games also, and finally they said we had five minutes left. I was near the actual dolls, so I rushed, looking for one that had brown hair, like mine. I finally found one with just two minutes to spare. She had brown hair and bangs, and her hair was half up. She had on a pink shirt, a denim jacket with the same color jeans, and she had a little pink phone in her hand with painted buttons. There was also a button in the palm of her other hand that allowed her to talk, but there was no feature for her to move. It was just a basic doll. That was it. I reached for it and grabbed it, but my sister was also getting toys. She liked it too, so we fought for it. Our mom told us to share it, since it was the last one left, and we agreed. When we got home, we wrapped everything but the doll so we could open it and start playing. My sister and I ripped the box open and we played with the doll all day. When it was bedtime, we put her up on our bookshelf and went to sleep. I remember what happened because I woke up pretty late and automatically looked up at my bookshelf. The doll turned its head to look at me and moved its arm. I couldn't sleep all night watching it, so the next day I told my sister about it. She laughed at me. Nighttime came around again, and the doll had moved again. It moved its arms and head, and was not on the bookshelf. My sister freaked out and couldn't sleep, and I freaked out and hid under the covers. The next morning we told our stepdad, and he laughed. He said, Oh, watch out, it's a Chucky situation. We brought the doll to him and told him to look at it. He jokingly started moving its arms and legs and then gave it back to us. We took it, and as soon as we did, it moved, so we threw it off the balcony. He went back down to get it, but then the doll moved in his arms, and he threw it over the balcony too. 
I have no idea what was going on with that doll, but we never picked it up again. I know the doll moved on its own, but it was brand new and had never been owned by anyone else at all. I don't know how it could have been haunted. To this day, I have no idea why that happened. I'm still trying to figure out what I saw, or why I saw it. This is another paranormal account, like so many others of mine that took place when I was younger. The place that this event happened had many other unexplainable things take place in it. This is just one of the creepiest. I was probably ten years old, and I was coloring by myself in my room. I heard a noise or something directly behind me, and when I turned around, there sat a ventriloquist doll. When I looked at him, he opened his mouth and eyes wide. I was completely frozen. When I finally could move, I ran into the living room where my mom and stepdad were. I don't think I said anything, but just sat on the couch, scared to go back into my bedroom. I never saw that particular item again. We had never owned a ventriloquist doll, and it never reappeared. But I did see other strange things, including my best friend, who I saw a spirit of in one room, when she was actually in another room at the same time. I have no idea why I saw this thing, or what it meant, but to this day, I'm terrified of those dolls. This happened during my childhood in Matamoros, Tamaulipas. I lived with my family in a quiet neighborhood where everything went smoothly. I had a happy childhood. Due to the economic situation in the 1970s, many people were forced to migrate to other parts of the country or even to the United States in search of opportunities. For this reason, many houses were abandoned during the moves it was common for our former neighbors to leave forgotten things behind. So much was the migration in the area that for both my friends and I, one of our favorite games was urban exploration. We would go into the vacant houses with the desire to search through the garbage to see what kind of objects had been left behind. Of course, our main objective was toys. As we explored the adjoining houses, we had to expand to the point that we already had to ride a bicycle to find more abandoned houses. On one occasion, I don't remember the date, we were not five blocks from our houses when we saw an uninhabited house. It already had the for rent sign and several large bags with forgotten objects had been left in the garage. We started to rummage through the bags, but among some crap, one of my friends found the head of a doll, one of those that open and close the eyes. The head was that of a baby, it had no hair, and had a happy expression, but when you were staring at it, you felt this inexplicable discomfort. It was very striking, as if someone wanted to tear it to pieces with an ice pick. Between jokes and games, we decided to take it with us, and we put it on a tree that was at the entrance of some soccer fields we used to go to. Since that day, we felt a very ugly vibe, in addition to being able to feel a heavy glance and stare. But not everything ends here, because for some strange reason, we were very attracted to it, so much that we even quarreled. I fought with my friend because I wanted to take it to my house and not leave it there but the greed had not only erupted in me, but in all of my friends, each of us wanting to take it. Such was the extent of our disputes that there were days when we didn't speak. I felt a certain responsibility since I was the one who had started everything. So after reconsidering, I went to look for my friends to apologize to them and everything returned to normal. On one occasion, we were playing marbles 
when Mario, my best friend, exclaimed, scared. The little head rolled its eyes. But since we already knew that it could open and close them, we did not give it importance. But Mario insisted again. Then we saw that the toy did not just open and close its eyes, but moved them from side to side and even blinked. Of course, we ran away in terror, and we never stepped onto that soccer field again. After a few days, we got together again and decided what we were going to do with that thing. We had to get rid of it, but nobody had the courage to touch it. So we decided to go with an adult friend. Two streets from where we lived, there was the house of a man named Valentin. He was very kind and used to play soccer with us. We knew his children, who were younger than us, because we had been invited to his birthday parties previously. We went to look for him. We knew at what time we could find him, and we told him everything. Obviously, he did not believe us. We took him to the soccer field to show him the head. He took it, carefree, and watched it closely for a few minutes. Then he said, I'm taking it home. My daughter has some of her headless dolls. It will help me fix one. So, he took the head, put it in a grocery bag, and took it home. Days passed without incident, and the tranquility returned in our circle of friends. In fact, we decided it might be safe to return to the soccer field. However, 15 days had passed since we last saw Valentin, and we had never heard from him since. So, we went to go look for him at his house. We got to his house, and we were playing for half an hour, but nobody opened it. We could hear that the TV was on, and we could see lights on inside the house. Even his truck was parked in the garage, but he would not come out to greet us. This seemed very strange to us. The subsequent days that we went to look for him, the same thing happened, and we still did not hear from Valentin or his family. We discussed the situation with our parents and neighbors, but they didn't care. In fact, my mother told me that perhaps they had to emigrate like all the others. Concerned about this situation, and without help from the adults, we decided to investigate on our own. We jumped over the fence and went inside his house. When we entered, we found the lights on in some rooms. The television was also on, and in fact, the dinner plates were still on the table and the food was still there. It honestly seemed as if all the family had just vanished, since all their belongings were there, their clothes, children's toys. Even his wallet was up on the television next to his car keys. We left everything as it was and left the house with great fear, sensing that something bad had happened to them. We tried to see how to file a disappearance complaint with the police, but this was impossible since we were minors, and when we were finally able to convince our parents to support us, the complaint could not be taken since we weren't related to them. Thus, the days became weeks months, and we didn't stop searching. On one occasion, I was returning from school. I saw that there were people in Valentin's house. Thinking it was him, my heart filled with joy, and I ran to meet him. But when I reached the threshold of the door, I saw that they were different people. These people were family members who came after not hearing from them. The man said that he was Valentin's brother-in-law, after introducing myself to him, he asked me questions to find out if I knew anything about Valentin's whereabouts. I replied no. I accompanied him to ask the neighbors if they knew anything, and finally a neighbor could give a reason. An old woman who lived in the house across the street told Valentin's brother-in-law that a few months ago, after nine o'clock at night, she heard a piercing scream that woke her up and as the window of her room faces the street, she leaned out to see what had happened, but didn't see anything strange. Minutes later, she saw that Valentin rushed out and started the truck. Immediately after, he ran back to the house, and after that, she didn't know. The woman said that the car's engine was on all night, and around one in the morning, she heard the engine turn off. When the lady went out to carry out her daily activities in the morning, she saw the truck was still there, and when she heard the television on, she thought everything was fine. 
but ever since then she's never heard from Valentine or his family. With the passage of time, Valentine's house also became an uninhabited house. For respect, we never went back in. However, other people did. First, the truck disappeared, then the appliances. Furniture was stolen, until it was completely empty. Over the years, the property was auctioned off, and new tenants came to live. My friends and I grew up, and each one made his own life. But to this day, I've never stopped wondering what happened to Valentine and his family, and if that doll's head had something to do with their disappearance. When I was younger, about five years old, I had a baby doll. It was one of those weird mixes of cloth and plastic with a battery-powered voice box. One day, this thing just started laughing constantly. It would not shut up. We took the batteries out, but it continued. We threw it outside and forgot about it for about a year when we finally found it. We found it again, and the damn thing could still laugh. At that point, it had been without a battery pack and laying outside for over a year. There's no reason that it should have laughed. One day, my mom put it in the trunk of her car to try to seal it off, and a few years later, she got into a bad accident that crushed the front and back end of her car. I know this isn't a typical story, but I still wind up thinking about it from time to time, just because of how creepy it was. Also, my mom's okay. The crash happened a few years ago. Still, I always think back on that doll and wonder how the hell it was laughing without any power source. My memory of my early childhood is quite good. I wouldn't say that I'm sensitive to the paranormal at all. I'm just a regular old person. When I was about four years old, I owned a baby doll. This doll didn't look creepy or anything. The doll's entire body was made of hard plastic. The shoulder and hip joints, maybe the neck too, could bend, but none of the other joints could such as the hands and feet, which were molded plastic shapes. The doll wore a long-sleeved white onesie that had tiny purple triangles on it. Bald head, I think. I have no idea where I got this doll, or what brand it is, or anything. Just that I lived in BC, Canada at the time. This was around 2001. My parents can't remember the doll, which I think is kind of odd. So basically, the doll's hands would change. I can specifically remember my uncle placing the doll on the couch, with its arms out, and both hands completely open. Sometime after that, the hands would be in fists, or one hand would be opened and the other one would be closed. At the time, of course, I had no clue that this was weird whatsoever. I just tried to pry the plastic hands open when they were closed, swearing that they were open the last time I had checked, but to no avail. It's physically impossible for the hands to have changed, but they did. It wasn't a fancy or expensive doll, either. I don't know if this was paranormal at all, but I'm pretty damn certain of what I saw. I have no idea where that doll is now. I gave most of my toys away when I was six, when we had to move to another country. But sometimes I look back on that and wonder, what was up with that doll? My daughter has a toy doll. You squeeze its stomach and it giggles or says something like, Mama or Papa. Well, 
It used to, anyway. She's been bringing it into the pool, the bath, her water table, etc. The electronic box inside stopped working about two weeks ago. Until the other night. The doll was laying on the bedroom floor, most definitely not being squeezed, and it made one of its voice box noises. It did several times that night. The first time it did, I shot right up and asked my husband where the doll was, if it was under the blankets and maybe I'd rolled on it. But it wasn't. It was on the floor, not being touched. After giving myself a talk off the ledge, I fell asleep. It did the same thing a couple of more times. We laughed about it in the morning and my husband said that maybe it just dried out and started working again. So I grabbed it and squeezed it to see if that was the case. Nope. No matter how I squeezed, the voice box inside wouldn't make a peep. I don't really know what's going on with that doll, but I have no explanation for how the voice box started working without being touched when it's dead. Ten years ago, in the little town outside of Toulouse, France, right after dark, we were waiting for a restaurant to open. Our big group of a family, all Americans, took a walk up the hill to look at the town graveyard from the road. Walking back, we could see the whole town below us, the road ahead lined with stone walls in front of houses. About a hundred yards ahead, illuminated by the streetlight, I see a huge black dog-shaped thing leave our sidewalk, lope into the middle of the street, rise up on its hind legs, and quickly scale and disappear over an eight-foot stone wall. There were cars and bushes and gates to use for visual scale, and this thing was tall, like seven to eight feet. Picture the werewolf from the film Prisoner of Azkaban? Yep, spot on. My family was chattering away about whatever, but I said, did you guys see that? And my son goes, Oh yeah, that was a freaking werewolf. We walked by the spot a minute later and everybody was laughing at us, but screw that. So for the past few months, I've noticed that when I go outside at night with my dogs, I feel something weird at times. Within the past year, we moved from northern Utah to southern Utah. We got two acres of property and a few historical buildings for a really, really good buy. We love this house. It was built in the 1920s with shiplap and is a very strong, beautiful house. In the back are four buildings, and our backyard is kind of sectioned off into four areas, with there being a gravel road that goes all the way around back, and a small path that goes up the middle, all the way to the back of the property. In our town, there's hardly any trees or forests at all, so that's why I'm questioning this, because why would dogmen or any cryptid live here for that matter? There is a state park by us, though, and three to four lakes, plus a very rocky place pretty similar to the Grand Canyon. Rivers also run all throughout the city, and there are multiple fishing areas. One day I'm outside with my golden doodle and I'm sitting on the steps of my back porch while she's going pee for the night. She's not acting weird, but I'm getting a very weird feeling that I'm being watched, even through the super tall fence that we have. Suddenly, something clicked that I was in danger. And I remember saying, nope, 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 not dying today, before I ran inside without even knowing what it was that scared me so bad. I didn't see or hear anything, except for a few weird noises, but I just assumed that was the neighbor lady's cats coming by. She had a lot of cats, and they really liked to hang out in our yard and the field next to us. A month or so ago, I was sitting outside at night with my golden doodle again, and this time I was sat in a chair, staring at the stars, pretty opposite of the area I was in before. 
Suddenly, I see something larger than the neighbor lady's truck in her backyard run from somewhere by her house, past her truck, and to the sheds. I couldn't see it too well in the dark, but we do live on a main street, and the street lights are super bright, so I most definitely saw at least a tall, black thing. Not too long after that, a whole bunch of people came out of the neighbor lady's house with either phones or flashlights. I couldn't tell. They were shining them all over the yard, as though they were looking for something. Today, my grandma came in with chunks of hair that had meat on it. The meat had huge slashes in it, and the hair was very coarse. Almost like something on a Halloween costume, but more so. Some was black, and some was a mix of white and brown. She said that she found it by the apple trees and raspberry bushes that we'd recently planted in the backyard. We went out today to plant tomatoes, onions, carrots, and other things of the same sort in that area, and we found more hair with meat in it. I've noticed the hair around the yard before, but I just assumed it was cotton since we have that in our yard and spring had just begun. I don't know what it could be, but it's super, super weird. I need help figuring out what's going on in my neighborhood. I live in a very secluded woodsy part of a small southern town. It's really peaceful during the day, but it gets a little weird at night. There are a few houses on my road, but for the most part, it's only trees. There are a few reoccurring events that are all pretty spooky, but the main one is what my friends and I call the Dogman, for lack of a better name. I've only seen it twice in my life. I've lived in this part of the town for three years. The dog man has a body shaped like that of a scrawny human. Its bones are visible. It has fur, but only in patches all over its body, sort of like a dog with mange. Though it has the bodily proportions of a person, it has the head of a dog and can run extremely fast. Also, it's freaking huge and it's quadrupedal. To preface, my room is at the front of the house. Our front yard is the size of a field. I have the biggest window in the house in my bedroom and it faces the front yard. I do not have blinds over my window and my bed is in front of it. The first time I saw the dog man, it was late at night and I was sitting in bed. I saw it running through my yard. Shortly after, my cat, who was an indoor outdoor cat at the time, came inside growling. The cat was found dead across the creek near my yard this July. He had no visible injuries and was very young and healthy, and we still have no idea how he died. The second time I saw it was earlier tonight. My friend and I were sitting on my porch. We noticed a very large moving mass on the base of the mountain, which we live right in front of. We decided to get a closer look. My friend stayed behind to watch as my grandfather and I drove down the road to the base of the mountain. I didn't want to drive out there alone. As we got near, we stopped in front of the mass. It was a tree. At first we were going to laugh, but then something sprinted out from behind it and into the woods, right in front of us, and there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that it was the same dogman. If you have any ideas to what the hell this is or how I can go about finding more information, I'd love to hear it because this is really freaking us out. This was in northern Wisconsin, not Michigan like most of these stories, but I still think we saw a dogman. One weekend, my ex and I went up to his mom's house in the woods. She raised chickens and had a husky dog who was caged every night to keep her safe, as there were black bear in the area, coyotes, and a rumored mountain lion. Anyway, they had a motion-activated yard light on their garage, which would activate a security alarm in the house. The second night we were there, the alarm went off. 
Now the motion detector is set to only go off if the motion is four feet or higher. My boyfriend hops out of the bed and shuts off the alarm. We both go out to the enclosed porch, him with his handgun in tow, and look around. About that time, the chickens start all but screeching, and you can just hear them going berserk in their coop. My ex is thinking that someone's trying to steal a chicken, so he goes to unlock the door. But then, this huge wolf-like creature gets on two legs and comes out of the coop with a chicken in its jaws. It drops to all fours when it sees my boyfriend. At this point, my boyfriend runs back into the house and grabs me. Werewolf, is all he says. He locks the door and his mom comes down the stairs. What's the fuss all about? My boyfriend gives her a description of what we saw. She laughed it off and told him he'd been scared by a big wolf. I don't know about you, but I've never seen a wolf unlock a chicken coop, steal a chicken, and walk out on two legs while closing the door behind it. I don't know if it was a dog man, but I know it wasn't a wolf. I had an experience with what I'm pretty sure was a dog man. Here's a little bit of background on me and that day. I work in real estate, more specifically commercial real estate. So my work takes me all over the place, from urban industrial areas to very off the beaten path secluded areas, farmlands, development lands, etc. On this day in particular, in October of 2012, my last assignment of the day was to go out and survey an old farmstead near Cayuga in Haldimand County, about 30 miles south of Hamilton, Ontario. The place had been vacant since the 90s. I arrived in the late afternoon, I'd say around 5.30ish. The place was the last one on a dead-end country road and couldn't be seen from the road. I went up the long driveway and proceeded to do my look over of the place. There were three structures the house, a garage, and a large tool shed. I walked around the front of the house, which was completely boarded up, with no means of seeing inside. I proceeded around the far side toward the other buildings. The shed was basically fallen completely down, but the garage was mostly still up. I noticed around the side door a lot of huge scratches, and the door was like half broken down, but still held shut by a padlock on one side and the middle and upper hinge were still there. The bottom part was forced inward, and the door and clapboards around it were covered with these scratches. They weren't like scratches a dog would leave. These were huge and parallel, but spread apart, almost like fingernail scratches, and very deep, obviously put there with a great deal of pressure. That's when I looked down and saw huge paw prints, but not regular round paw prints, almost elongated a little bit. The area around this partially broken down door was covered with these paw prints. If I had to venture a guess at how wide they were, I would say at least five inches. I was wearing heeled dress boots, and when I put my foot over the paw print, I could see the print on either side of my foot, and I wear a size 10 so I don't have tiny feet by any means. I began to get very uneasy, and that's when I recalled noticing that all the sounds of the forest were gone. It was dead silent, and that's when I noticed the stench, like wet dog, urine, and feces all mixed together. I mean, the whole area just smelled rotten, like a swamp, like rot and decay. But this smell was strong and very putrid, I got very uneasy, like all of a sudden I knew I wasn't alone. I decided I'd seen enough and quickly headed back to my car. That's when I heard something in the bushes. It sounded big, and it was going through the trees very quickly and hard. I got back to my car, got in, and locked the doors. When I started my car and turned the lights on, that's when I caught eye shine in the trees ahead of me but the eye shine was not at the level that a dog's head should have been at. It was more like four to five feet up, maybe even a little bit higher. 
I couldn't make out a shape as it was getting on toward dusk, and so there were a lot of shadows in the trees, but I thought I saw a large figure in the trees. I started to freak out a little bit and decided it was definitely time to go. So I backed around right into the wet marshy spot, and my car got a little bit stuck. I was more interested in watching this thing than where I was going, which was a mistake. My attention quickly went back to the car as I tried to free myself from the mud, and when I looked back to where this thing had been, it was gone. In the spot where it had been, I could now see farther into the trees, so something definitely had been there. I just couldn't see the exact shape, just a large shadowy figure. After several seconds of rocking my car back and forth, I managed to get it out of the stuck spot and I left very quickly. I don't think I've ever been so scared in my life. Like I said, I didn't clearly see what it was. I just had this intense feeling of evil, like something bad was there. I went back to that spot about a year and a half after this incident and the place is entirely gone. Someone bought the property and tore it down and cut down a lot of the trees. But to the best of my knowledge, nothing has ever been developed there. It's still just vacant land. I've not really told anyone about this, as I don't want to be ridiculed or made fun of. A co-worker said it was probably a bear, but I know for a fact that there are no bears this far south in Ontario, unless you're in a zoo. I had long forgotten about this until I recently saw a YouTube video about somebody's encounter with a very similar being to what I described. I handled the sale of some farmland on the nearby Six Nations Indian Reservation, and the client was one of the few remaining pure-blooded natives. I'd put him easily in his 80s, if not older. I asked him about odd happenings in the area, like strange animals. And I sort of told him my experience, but not in detail, just that I was on the property. He responded with a question. You've seen it, haven't you? He went on to say that there are many things that are unknown to this world, but wouldn't comment further about my experiences. He only said that there's a good reason that that particular place has been empty and unused for so long. I had the odd nightmare of that day for about a year afterwards, and I'm still very hesitant to do surveys in areas like that. If anybody knows what I saw, if it was a dog man or something else, I'd be happy to find out. I was watched for 13 years. I don't necessarily think that it was a dogman, and I actually hadn't heard of it existing until now. I was looking for more logical theories as to what it could have been, but I figured that people interested in the subject might find my story interesting, and who knows, maybe that is what I saw. 1996, age 5. My mom always read me a bedtime story when she put me to bed and I always fell asleep. This particular night, I didn't fall asleep, and she stayed with me for a while longer until she fell asleep herself, and I was still awake. I was kind of bored and just looking around the room. I looked up at the window positioned behind my bed, and even though the blinds were closed, I was able to see through the cracks in the turned down blinds. I immediately saw two reddish eyes looking in, I thought they were eyes because I kept looking for a while, and they were moving around a little. They weren't completely stationary, and then they appeared to blink. I immediately turned over and woke up my mom. She said it was just a dream and to go back to sleep, but to this day I swear I had never slept, and I was fully awake. My bedroom window is above our balcony, but you would have to be really tall, or on a ladder, to see into my window from it. I don't have any siblings and my dad was asleep when this happened. Not long after that, I did have a nightmare about what I saw. I dreamed that it was a wolf-like animal, and my dad was fighting it in the hallway to our bedrooms. I woke up and immediately knew that that was a dream, but to this day, I still don't think what I initially saw was. I developed a deep fear of the dark because of this. 2007, age 16. From 1996 to 2007, I had never seen any occurrences like what I saw that first night. 
but I did switch to turning my blinds upwards so that I couldn't see outside during the night. For some reason, even before the nightmare, I had decided that it was a wolf-like animal, but I'm not really sure why. I still had a deep fear of the dark. Since it happened, I would intermittently have a feeling like something was watching me, or I wasn't alone. Sometimes it felt like an unfriendly presence, and other times it felt comforting, like something was protecting me. I once went a year without getting the feeling, but it hit me when I was driving home from a friend's house in the middle of the day. The drive from my friend's house home was about 20 minutes of rocky barrens with patches of forest. An unfriendly presence hit me so hard that I pulled over, checked the car, and got out of the car. I climbed up a small cliff next to the roadside to look out over the barrens. There was nothing there. I got back in the car and kept driving. I visited this friend a lot and I started to find that feeling would hit me at the exact same spot in those barrens, day or night, but only in the night around my parents' house. This same friend slept over one night. We went out on my deck so that she could have a cigarette and I got the feeling of an unfriendly presence. At this point in life, I was screaming at myself that I was being irrational, that there was nothing there, that I never saw a wolf-like creature, I just thought I did. As I was thinking this, I realized my friend was staring out into the small patch of forest behind my house and squinting. I asked her what was wrong, and she said that she could swear that she saw something watching us and moving around, something like a dog, but a lot bigger. At this point, I was shitting myself, and I coaxed her inside. I never told her about the story, so she never would have known about my speculations. 2009, age 18. Still haven't seen any convincing evidence since I was five. Only my friend's observations, which aligned with what I think I saw as a kid. I still felt like something was intermittently watching me, both at home, on the drive to that same friend's house, and even around where she lived. I started dating someone that lived not too far from her, so we all hung out a lot. At this point, I'm still scared of the dark. Sometimes I could walk down a trail by myself and would be completely fine. Other times I was crippled with fear and ran or had somebody leave me. One time camping, I felt the presence so badly that I had to get my boyfriend to lead me to our tent while I shut my eyes and covered my ears. I didn't sleep at all that night. Every noise scared the crap out of me and it didn't help that other people were around. I remember driving home the next day, and I did feel like something was watching me. But this was one of those times that it felt comforting. More comforting than it had ever felt before. 2010, age 19. I was driving over to see the same boyfriend. I realized that I hadn't felt that feeling like something was watching me in a very long time. Probably since I'd had that last comforting feeling, I drove through the barrens almost every day now, without that feeling popping up. It was gone, just like that, and I moved away from my hometown soon after. Present day, age 29. No more sightings, no more feelings like something's watching me. My crippling fear of the dark went away, and even though the dark still makes me uneasy, I prefer to go for runs at night now. I lived back home for a while but mainly lived in the city and have since moved out of the province entirely. To this day, it's never returned and appears to have just stopped abruptly, but it's probably the thing that stuck with me the most over the years since I was a kid. I guess I may never know what it was. I was around 9 to 10 at the time of this story. My parents divorced at a very young point in my life. My father took custody and I visited my mother on weekends. My mother was in an apartment at the time. It was very small so my mother and I slept in the same bed. The bed is in the far corner parallel to a hallway that leads to the bathroom and the exit. Also to the right of the bed off the hallway there's a kitchen area. I went to sleep like usual with my mom one night, until I was awoken at around 11.35 p.m. I remember seeing the time on the Xfinity box thing. I was in a cold sweat, 
I always had a weird feeling from that hallway all the time. So I sat up and looked toward the hallway, and I couldn't believe what I saw. There was a figure that was very wide, hunched over, with giant horns. It was facing toward us, pacing back and forth slowly. I started freaking out and laid back down, and started poking my mom, telling her what happened. I can ask her about it to this day, and she still remembers. I hadn't watched anything scary, and I wasn't sick. There was really no explanation for what I saw, but I believe that I had a demonic encounter. My wife and I moved into a 110-year-old house about six months ago. We've always been fans of the paranormal, and on my days off from work, we generally binge-watch YouTube channels like Shane Dawson, Top 15s, Chills, Lazy Masquerade, etc. We find it fun to be scared. But it's rare that you come across something truly paranormal. So, we try to seek it out. However, the next part we weren't necessarily seeking out, which makes it pretty odd. We came across a video which talked about Dybbuk boxes. We did our own research and found that though this is supposed to be an ancient tradition, we could only find references to it starting a few years ago, almost like a marketing gimmick. For those who are unfamiliar, it's a box or a wine cabinet from the Jewish tradition, which traps malevolent spirits or entities. Mostly, we just found videos of people opening them on YouTube, boxes that they'd bought from eBay or from some other mysterious seller. We got the idea to make some side cash from this and decided to sell our own Dybbuk boxes. We knew that it was mostly bullshit and people were buying it for the experience. Not because they truly believed in it, but because they wanted to open up something spooky for their YouTube followers for likes. We went in understanding this, sort of a mutual social contract. We got started by buying old boxes from estate sales, and we wanted to make sure that it was as authentic as possible. Just because we all know it's fake doesn't mean that we should half-ass it. We wanted to create a genuine feel to the box. We bought old funeral candles on eBay, found creepy old dolls at local thrift stores, went the whole nine yards. We live in Dayton, Ohio, down the street from where the Wright brothers are buried at the Woodland Cemetery. It's less than a mile away. We scooped up some old dirt from that cemetery, which is pretty old if you feel like some light reading. Apparently it's supposed to be haunted, like a lot of things in Ohio. We even went with the box to a few other haunted areas, like the Amber Rose and the Ye Old Tavern in Yellow Springs. Finally, after bringing it to our local haunts, we felt that we had done enough to invite whatever we could into the box. Even though we didn't believe in this, we seriously gave it our best effort, since people are paying actual money for these things. So we filled the box with dirt, an old creepy doll, and an old photo of a little girl that we found in a book at an estate sale. We sealed it with wax and wrapped it in twine. And that was that. Up until this point, despite our house being very old, we had no inclination that it was haunted or out of the ordinary in any way, despite our hoping that it was when we moved in. I mean, we bought a 110-year-old house. We wanted something to get our money's worth. The night we wrapped the box was like any other, nothing to report. But the following day, weird stuff started to happen. When I first moved in, my bike was stolen right off my porch. Like, someone had to physically reach over my porch and take my bike in broad daylight. I remember thinking, what the hell? I thought the Midwest was friendly. So, I installed cameras all over my house, inside and out. I also bought a gun, because I have a little girl and I'm not going to mess around. I feel like saying that is important, because the next day, after wrapping the box, the TV started turning on and off without warning. 
usually when we weren't watching it, but simply walking by it. This wasn't someone with a different remote or energy settings on the cable box or TV. We started to finally hear the loud creaking sounds you hear about with old houses. This could have been because of the weather, it had started to change, but it was just such weird timing. We also started to hear knocks on the front door, and we get a lot of packages, so this isn't out of the ordinary. But when we opened the door, no one was there, and the cameras we have reflected that. Even worse, with our new alarm system, it alerts us when a door opens in the house. So, late in the evening one day before we set it, we heard, back door open. So I grab my gun and look at the cameras on my phone. Nothing. Just the back door wide open after I locked it. I cautiously go downstairs to the basement, gun in hand, search it and still come up empty. I rewatched the cameras and the door seemingly just opened by itself, but it's not clear enough to see if the lock turned before it was swung open. I could have forgotten to lock it, I guess, but that's not like me. And sure, the wind may have opened it too, but again, very unlikely. My daughter's toys also seem to turn themselves on downstairs or up in her room, even though she is asleep beside us. I know kids' toys can do that, but coupled with everything else, it's just a little bizarre. The creepiest things, though, are what I can see. I have a yucca plant, and I placed it by the window, where the stairs have a 90 degree angle. I can see the window from my bed. We sleep with the door open, and lately, I've woken up to see the same figure standing by that window, blocking the light. People have suggested that it may be a shadow or a hallucination, but a shadow doesn't get bigger and closer every day, and a hallucination wouldn't be confined to one spot. It's not carbon monoxide poisoning because I have sensors for that with my alarm. I even double check them. This is something that I can very clearly see in the middle of the night. It's boxy like a fridge, and if I blink a few times, it will go away, or if I turn on the lights, but I can almost always count on seeing it. It doesn't feel like I'm just waking up on my own, either. I feel like it's waking me up, like it wants me to see it. Every night or other night, it seems like it gets a little closer as well, and now I'm worried about what might happen if it ever reaches me. I have always been really interested and fascinated with Dogman, Bigfoot, anything paranormal. Thanks to losing my job recently due to current events, I've been spending a lot of time reading and researching this particular topic, never knowing that one of my friends actually saw two of them. So my friend, I'll call her Jess, was over late last night, and we'd been talking about paranormal experiences, and I brought up the subject of Dogman. She had never heard of Dogman, so I put on YouTube, and I showed her Scott Carpenter's videos. And then I remembered the video where an unknown creature was filmed digging in a cemetery. When she saw the creature in that video, she gasped and said, Oh my gosh, I wonder if that's what I saw. I paused it and was like, What? You've seen something like this and you never told me? She said she basically saw two werewolves about five years ago on her property and never brought it up because who would believe that? I asked her to tell me every detail, and I was careful to ask questions that did not lead her in any way. Since I've listened to every single Dogman Encounters episode, I'm familiar with what most witnesses see, and lo and behold, every answer she gave me matched what others have seen and reported. The location was in Leonard, Michigan, a pretty rural area with lots of woods and wildlife. She and her family have a few acres and raise chickens and ducks as a hobby. Her house is on a dirt road and is surrounded by wooded areas. 
This is the conversation we had as accurately as I can tell it. I also had her proofread this so she can say that everything is accurate from her end as well. This was about five years ago, she said, when my dog was a young puppy. My sister and I took her outside to go potty. It was dusk, getting dark, but still plenty of light to see. The pup noticed something and started to slowly walk toward it. We looked to see what she was seeing, and to our shock, there were two huge dogs or wolves on our property, about a hundred feet away from where we were standing on the porch. Instinctively, I took a few steps forward and scooped up my puppy. My sister and I stared at them. They were on all fours, hunched over and eating something. They lifted their heads to look at us, but seemed unbothered, and went back to whatever they were eating. My first thought was that I was curious as to what the heck we were looking at and I wanted to get a closer look. But that thought was replaced by the realization that it wasn't safe, so I slowly walked backwards, and so did my sister. We went back inside. We locked the doors and windows and asked each other what the hell those things were. We watched them from the window. They eventually left in no particular hurry. I've kind of put that experience out of my mind, and I almost forgot about it until just now. I asked her if she felt scared or threatened. She said, not necessarily. Because of their size and how wrong they looked, I felt like they could be dangerous. But they never snarled or showed their teeth or did anything aggressive to scare us. I said, how is your puppy acting? Jess said she was probably too young to realize that they could be dangerous. She just seemed curious. I asked her what they looked like, the color and the size. One was a dark color, maybe black. The other was a lighter color, like a light brown or tan. They were bigger than any dog we knew existed, bigger than a mastiff even, and if they were up on their hind feet, they would definitely be much taller than most people, probably about seven feet or more. I asked what their fur looked like and whether it was long or short. She looked at my pit bull and said, definitely not short fur like him. She looked at my Icelandic sheepdog and said, their fur was longer, like hers, like a wolf or a German shepherd. She said that they had thicker fur around their necks, in a poofy small mane, and that their ears were up and pointy, like a wolf. At this point, I'm totally freaking out at how accurately she's describing what others have seen. I said, okay, so so far you could just be describing really large wolves, but you said they looked wrong, so what about them made you think that they weren't just wolves? Did they ever stand or walk on two legs? She said, no, they were on all fours, but their anatomy wasn't right. While they were hunched over eating, their shoulders were much higher than their rear ends. They didn't look like a normal dog or wolf would if they were bending forward. Like the front arms were way too long, much longer than their rear legs. And how they were eating was weird. They were using their front paws to help tear apart whatever they were eating and they were bringing it to their mouths, almost like they had hands. She said that she couldn't really tell if they had hands or paws, but what kind of dog or wolf uses their paws to bring food to their mouth? The way they moved it was like they had hands. That's what really freaked her out, she said. She said that their hind legs looked like a dog's, but the weirdest thing is that she said they didn't have any tails. That's what really scared her is that when they walked away, she remembered thinking, they don't have tails. Jess said that she didn't really conclude what they were. She was just freaked out and had no explanation. My best guess was some kind of genetically altered wolf or a werewolf, she said. I asked her why she wasn't obsessed with finding answers, how she could just put it out of her mind. And she said she didn't really have any clue, maybe because she couldn't come up with a logical explanation. It was just too weird or scary to think about. We continued talking, me telling her about dogman encounters and how she should really reach out to Vic. I told her how she didn't have to go on a show or anything. He would just talk to her and that I recommended her contacting him. She definitely looked freaked out as all these memories came back to her. She asked me questions about what I knew of them, if they attack and what they do. I told her that if she ever encounters one again, just remain calm and back away slowly, just like she did. 
She brought up firearms, since we're both gun owners, and I said that all the witnesses who had pulled a gun on these things got a negative response. I told her how they seem to know what a gun is, and that Vic recommends never using one on them unless you're absolutely sure they're about to attack you. She said she never had an impulse to draw her weapon, as they didn't seem threatening to her, her sister, or her dog, and that she had thought of knowing that her pistol wouldn't do much anyhow, other than pissing them off. On a side note, later that same week, her boyfriend happened to look out the window on the second story and saw a huge white dog in the field near the house. He says he remembers thinking that it was a massive dog and that he'd never seen it before. Being in a very rural area, they know most of their neighbor's dogs and strays are not common in that area, but he didn't give it too much thought. As we were discussing her sighting, though, he brought it up. I asked if they found any evidence of what had been eating, or any tracks. The next day they did go out to where they'd seen the creature, and they did find one clear, large canine paw print. I asked if they had taken a photo, and she said she thinks they did, but she can't remember whose phone it was on. Whatever they'd been eating was either completely devoured, or they took the remains with them when they left. As she thought more about it, she remembered that her family had in fact had a few of their chickens and ducks go missing around that time, but given that their birds are free range and there are normal predators in the area, it was not overly shocking at the time. She left very late, planning to talk to her sister about it soon and to see what she remembers. I told her not to lead her on for answers and just to see if everything matched her experience. As of today, Jess has started a draft email to send to Vic. I'm really happy that she's taking this seriously. I asked her to look at the art collections on the Dogman Encounters website. She said the Canis Hominis collection was the closest thing to what she saw. She also did a Google search and found one image that closely resembles what she saw as well. However, the creature in the artwork had a tail, while what she saw did not. She did ask her sister about it this morning, and her sister said she didn't have the clearest recollection of them. When Jess brought up dogmen, her sister actually said she had heard of them online, and stopped and said, Dude, maybe that's what we saw. One interesting thing that her sister did remember was that she thought they were eating the carcass of a duck or a chicken, but their conversation was brief. I'd love to talk to her sister sometime and ask her my own questions. Jess is an honest woman, very down-to-earth and genuine. She's never given me a single reason to doubt her. She doesn't use any substances, she's never been one to make up wild claims or make things up for attention. I believe her story wholeheartedly, and for me, there's no doubt in my mind now, the Dogman is in fact real.